Good morning, we're gonna get started here in a moment. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to, to day four of our June meeting. Um, yesterday was a day off, uh, supposedly, although I know a lot of people still worked. Um, we are on schedule, and before we get started, I'm gonna turn to Executive Director Chuck Tracy for any announcements. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, no, nothing, uh, no big announcements today, just uh, we are on schedule. We've got CPS this morning with three agenda items and then two ground fish uh, items for the end of the day. So uh, and just uh, look forward to uh, getting some business done today. So back to you. All right, thanks very much. All right, well, let's get started. We've got a full day ahead of us and then some. So uh, let me turn to Carrie Griffin to get us started on agenda item H1. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everybody. Um, this is agenda item H1, the National Marine Fisheries Service report. Um, we have these once or twice a year. We don't often have one in June, uh, but we added this as, a, uh, as an agenda item um, when the Southwest Center, um, Kristen Cook offered to uh, come and speak on um, Southwest Center's research priorities, ongoing research activities, um, what's uh, on the horizon for them. Um, and uh, you know that th this came up I, in, in, in the context of uh, there's a lot of uh, research recommendations that have been expressed in um, you know uh, assessments and SSC reports and advisory bodies and public comment. So I think that the Southwest Center uh, timing is is good, um, you know, in, in that it may be relevant to the council's. Um, thinking about you know future planning and upcoming assessments and things like that. Um, Frank Lockhart is uh, also, I think, going to give a regulatory update. But it'll be brief, but the main thrust is uh, a presentation from Kristen Cook and Dale Sweetnam. Um, after uh, the regulatory activities and the center update, we'll have reports and comments from management entities and advisory bodies. There are two supplemental reports from the CPSAS and the CPSMT, and then there is public comment as well. Um, and then the action is just council discussion. Um, and there's my overview of the agenda item. Thank you, Carrie. Any questions for Carrie? All right, let's get started. Um, I think first I'll turn to Frank Lockhart for to get to kick off the uh, this uh, the NIMS report. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and uh, as Carrie said, it is a, a little um, a brief uh, message here, but uh, important. And uh, so before we turn to the uh, Southwest Center report, I wanted to let the council know that on June 14th, the National Marine Fisheries Service approved Amendment 18 to the CPS FMP, which implements the council's recommended rebuilding plan for the northern subpopulation of Pacific Sardine. The Federal Register notice announcing this was published last week on June 24th. And that is it, short and sweet. All right, thanks, Frank. Any questions for Frank? Thank you, Frank. So now we will go to the uh, Southwest Center presentation. Uh, welcome, Kristen and Dale. All right, Chairman, uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Great. 
Thank you, Chair and members of the council. My name is Kristen Cook. I'm the director of the Southwest Fishery Science Center. And as was indicated, we had offered to come back uh, since the April meeting and give a presentation to the council a little bit on research priorities and other updates. So that's what we're doing this morning. Um, I just remind the council that as Carrie alluded to, the with the presentation of the April uh, sardine Pacific sardine update stock assessment, there were a number of questions that came up during the SSC's review and then later uh, discussed by the management team. And there were a number of research priorities that came out of that discussion. So we did offer to come back and talk about those. Dale is actually, Dale Sweetnam will present on those. So I'm not gonna say much other than to say that um, CPS is among my highest priorities in the center. We are juggling a number of things, um, but, but CPS is definitely up there. The research priorities that we're gonna talk about today from the April meeting, recall are really focused on Pacific Sardine. There are a number of other um, stocks within the CPS complex, so it's 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 but one, but it's an important one. Um, but Dale's going to cover the research priorities, how we view those, both in the short term and the longer term, as priorities, as well as other updates regarding other stocks within CPS and our survey update. So we had been in the practice of the um, the two center directors giving kind of a joint update on surveys, but we've uh, changed that for this meeting. And Kevin uh, will be giving a briefing for the Northwest Center and um, our briefing today under CPS will we'll give our, uh, our survey update. I also just wanted to mention that um, if, if it had not been mentioned previously that um, uh, NIMS's announcement last week of a couple of announcements, uh, the, the appointment of Janet Coit as our new assistant administrator. I'm sure that news has made the rounds. Um, Janet has been the director of the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management for over 10 years, where she worked closely with fishermen in, in Rhode Island and has a number of success stories there. So I'm sure that news has, has made it around the council, but I just wanted to note it and also that the senior executives of NIMS we were able to meet with her last week for a short period of time. And I understand she's gonna be doing the rounds to all of the regional offices and science centers and, and receiving um, uh, presentations from all of us to get her up to speed on what we're all doing. So I'm looking forward to that. And then also uh, I'm sure that most people are aware that Dr. Rick Spinrad was uh, also um, confirmed as the Undersecretary of Oceans and Atmosphere, uh, the NOAA administrator. So that um, makes the first permanent NOAA administrator that we've had in some time. So we're excited about that news as well. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dale and uh, he will present a few slides to you and then we're happy to take questions after that. Thank you, Kristen. Can you hear me? <laughs> Yeah, Dale, love and clear. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, next slide, Sandra. <clears throat> um, the presentation outline is divided into four main parts. Uh, survey updates, as Krista mentioned, the CPS assessment schedule, priority improvements for CPS assessments, and some new CPS research projects that are have already started during uh, COVID. Uh, next slide. Uh, as far as survey updates, we did have a spring CPS cruise that ran through uh, from March 20th to April 13th with a total of 25 days at sea uh, aboard the Reuben Lasker. The survey uh, ran from San Diego uh, in the south to San Francisco in the north. Um, we also had a, an industry vessel, the Long Beach Carnage, sampling the near shore in the Southern California Bight area and around the corner. Um, the highlights are that the survey collected large numbers of northern anchovy and pyrosomes and a smattering of sardines. Next slide. Um, the biomass results have not been completed yet, but you can see through the CPS backscatter uh, that it was, it was widespread throughout most of the survey area with anchovy eggs appearing in the offshore areas of the Southern California Bight and adult anchovies also appearing in, in offshore shore areas and some near shore areas uh, near um, Southern California and then along uh, the coast all the way up to Monterey. 
Uh, next slide. The spring cow coffee survey uh, was also completed uh, on a shortened schedule uh, due to some uh, uh, problems with uh, Shimada, but they were able to get out for 10 days and complete the, the major grid, except for a few stations where um, they had severe weather uh, impacting um, the, some of the offshore stations with the, the red X's. Uh, but they did complete 48 out of the, or 44 out of the 48 planned um, uh, stations. Uh, the images show um, Cal Coffee scientists Brian Overcash and Amy Hayes deploying um, ocean buoys for the Mar Mount Carmel High School Radio Club, uh, which were uh, current buoys that they had uh, created and, and we deployed them for them uh, offshore. Uh, next slide. Um, upcoming surveys include the summer CPS survey it's going to be running from July 2nd, or it may go after 4th of July right now, to October 15th, which is 86 days at sea, uh, running almost three and a half months um, on the Reuben Lasker. We are still awaiting the final permits from Mexico, but everything is moving swiftly. Uh, we are drawing on different parts of the Southwest Fisheries Science Center and the West Coast Regional Office, as well as having some volunteers and scientists from Mexico pending their visa approval uh, to staff the survey. Uh, we're also having uh, nearshore sampling by industry vessels off Washington, Oregon, Northern California, and Southern California. And we also were able to acquire um, the use of five sail drones that will supplement the acoustic transects. Um, so very large survey planned for this summer. We also have the summer Cal coffee survey running from July 16th to the 31st on uh, the RV's Sally ride. And then the fall Cal coffee survey, October 31st through November 15th on the Sally ride as well. Uh, next slide, please. As you can see that, um, Summer survey is very extensive and will hopefully be able to go in into Mexican waters this year for the first time uh, since I believe the 50s when Cal Coffee did sample all the way down to Cabo San Lucas. Um, but this is uh, 86 days at sea, four legs, three and a half months. Um, the fishing vessel Lisa Marie uh, is gonna be sampling the near shore. Uh, in Washington, Oregon, and Northern California, and the Long Beach Carnage off Central California and Southern California. So we'll have uh, nearshore sampling in all the uh, U.S., uh, all the way from uh, Washington to San Diego. Um, so it'll be a very nice addition to uh, having that information on the nearshore to the, the survey area from the Alaska. And then, as I said before, five sail drones um, doing most of the offshore work as well and filling in grid lines between um, what the Alaska is doing. And Lake 4 is hopefully going south to Punta Eugenia, uh, just south of uh, Guerrero Negro. Um, and at that point, it will be um, joining up with the Mexican research vessel, uh, Frazier, who will continue on and sample from Punta Eugenia down to Cabo San Lucas and into uh, the Gulf of California and do the whole Gulf. So we will hopefully have um, the first time that all three sardine subpopulations will be sampled uh, in a sort of a continuous manner. Um, and it'll sample all the transboundary stocks such as anchovy uh, and the mackerels. Um, and we'll be able to get a much larger and better idea of their distribution, which has been always been a question mark in, in the assessments. Uh, next slide. Um, the current CPS assessment schedule is that the Pacific mackerel assessment, a catch only projection, is being done uh, at this meeting. Uh, it's next up on the agenda or yeah, next up. 
Um, and then the next benchmark for Pacific mackerel was June 2023. Um, the central subpopulation of northern anchovy, we have a new benchmark assessment in the works, and we've already started meeting with um, uh, fisheries agencies, um, state agencies um, to work on uh, data accumulation and getting everything ready to go. The star panel will be December 7th um, through the 10th at hopefully in person in the La Jolla office. Uh, and the presentation to the council has yet to be determined, but either March or April 2022. Uh, the northern subpopulation of sardine, uh, the update assessment, next update assessment is scheduled for April 2022. And the next benchmark is scheduled for April 2023. Next slide. As Kristen mentioned before, um, at the April Council meeting, the CPS management team presented a, a, their list of the near term and long term categories uh, recommendations uh, for improvements for the sardine benchmark. Uh, the center has reviewed these recommendations and believes that uh, the near term improvements of stock structure and addressing some of the uh, ATM survey improvement recommendations can be completed prior to the benchmark assessment in 2023. The other long term recommendations will be addressed as, uh, as we can get uh, through on the workload we're planning to do. Um, but all topics remain on our to do list for the longer term. Next slide. In terms of stock structure, the center routinely checks on the ability of the current habitat model to predict sardine distribution. Um, these maps show the, where the sardine have been collected both in the spring and summer from 2006 to 2014. Um, the, it's hard to see, but there's a dashed line which uh, represents the perimeter of the uh, habitat model of optimal and good habitat, uh, and most of the um, sardine distributions, as you can see, fall within those um, that perimeter of, of the habitat model. Next slide. In more recent years, from well, this is from 2006 all the way up to July 20, 2019. Um, the red is the positive sardine catches, and the gray area represents the. Um, habitat models uh, idea of uh, optimal and good habitat. And most of those positive catches fall within the, the, um, the good habitat. Um, and you can get an idea of that, how well the, the model is doing based on those. Uh, next slide. Uh, the center will also update uh, this exists, existing habitat model using the new years of data from 2012 onward as one of the recommendations uh, from the star panel um, using the satellite derived sea surface temperature and sardine egg distributions from Cal, Cal coffee and ATM surveys. Um, just to note that um, we've had fewer sardine eggs encountered in the new years of data. So predictive ability during low sardine abundance may be limited. And this updated habitat model will be reviewed and incorporated into the 2023 benchmark assessment. Next slide. In terms of uh, genetics work on the stock delineation of the subpopulations of sardine, uh, we're in the process of genome development and range-wide uh, SNP uh, study. Our SNPs are single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. Um, which will be used to delineate differences between the northern and southern sub subpopulations. Um, the benchmark model will also investigate ways to capture um, or de decrease uncertainty about the catch numbers due to the uncertainty in the stock structure delineation. So hopefully this will lead to a better uh, delineation of the northern stock and the southern stock. Next slide. In terms of uh, the ATM survey, uh, previous star panels and uh, CIE reviews suggested uh, a list of items for the ATM survey 
to uh, identify and uh, address. Uh, as you can see, the uh, nearshore extrapolations and the nearshore surveys, as I had identified, that we are covering the entire uh, West Coast with nearshore surveys from industry vessels this year. And the, an automated and com comprehensive reporting on data collection analyses and estimates uh, have been completed. Uh, those in progress include um, studying the, the fish close to the sea surface, the XX90, uh, which looks at the, the sea surface, can look at the sea surface. Um, a, in our discussion with the AS and the MT on Thursday, uh, Juan Zelensky was able to identify that uh, because of the extensive amounts of data that's collected in this, there's still uh, um, a long process in processing all that data and, and they're working on getting that um, to a much better resolution and, and hopefully have results soon. Um, identifying school statistics, number sizes and spacings is still in progress and exploring the effects of changes in dominant species on the ecosystem and sampling have, have been identified as, as another item to, to look into. And um, we started studying um, trawl seal activity and hopefully we'll have some more research in the future on that in terms of uh, trawl performance. Uh, next slide. Um, the uh, ATM reports which come out from each one of the surveys is divided into uh, two technical reports. The first is the uh, automated visualization and survey report which presents the technical aspects of the survey. For, for example, where the survey occurred, what biological and physical measurements were taken. Um, this data includes data streams from the ship, including location speed, calibration data, underway CTDs, um, acoustic data, um, scientific computer system that combines oceanographic sensors, meteorological sensors, navigation sensors, and trolling sensors, and includes the COOFS data, the continuous underway fish egg sampler. And that's all presented in the first technical report. Next slide. The second ATM report presents the automated analysis, the QA, QSA, and the biomass reports for each survey and for each um, CPS species. This report presents um, how the species uh, specific backscatter is automatically post stratified and then reviewed and then reported. Uh, and these are the reports that present the biomass estimates, excuse me, for CPS. Next slide. Um, and they present the information that we normally present to you, uh, like this um, graphic of the summer tw 2019 California Current Ecosystem Survey, giving you um, all the backscatter, uh, CPS backscatter collected along the grid lines, um, the eggs collected from the coof sampling, and then um, the catch um, from the tr trawls broken down from the trawls and then identified in uh, into species. So extensive work. And it also incorporates the data from the Lasker, the sail drones, the and industry vessels, the Long Beach Carnage and, and Elisa Murray. So extensive amount of information presented. Uh, next next slide. So uh, in in uh, Wrapping up the, for ATM surveys, efforts to improve the surveys continue to take time and resources and effort to inv investigate and implement. The survey only goes up one to two times a year, so progress on some of these efforts are incremental. Um, and due in part to diminishing NOAA ship time, NIMS is exploring integration of the Northwest Fisheries Science Center and Southwest Fisheries Science Center West Coast surveys of Hake and coastal pelagic species uh, into a combined survey. Uh, and this also takes time, effort, and, and resources. Uh, next slide. Uh, in terms of the longer term, uh, a Kalkoffee SST covariate is currently used uh, for the sardine harvest control rule. 
Uh, while the uh, paper, 2019 paper by Zelensky and Diemer, the reevaluation of environmental dependence on of sardine recruitment published uh, in fisheries research suggested using the PDO, PDO as an alternative. There is uh, no uh, actual equation provided for implementation in the harvest control rule. Um, so we're still looking for, uh, and we have to review what, what the best um, environment correlate is, um, or if using an environment correlate is, is actually the best um, way to go. Uh, NIMS is commuted, committed to using the best scientific information available. The Southwest Center is con continuing to do research to improve our understanding of the relationship between Pacific sardine productivity and environmental conditions. The Science Center also will continue to look into other in indices of abundance uh, and continue to work on the long-term improvements to the ATM surveys. Next slide. In terms of new research that's already started, um, there is a, a grant that uh, people at the Southwest Center got last year. It's called In Impact of Climate and Ecosystem Change on the California Current Forage Complex and the Fishing Communities and Predators It Sustains. This is a three-year project funded by the NOAA Climate Program Office of uh, uh, Coastal and Ocean Climate Applications, or COCA, as it's often called. And this grant is a collaboration between the Southwest Center, the Northwest Fisheries Science Center, Pacific Island Center, uh, UC Santa Cruz, and uh, the Commonwealth Research uh, Organization in Australia. And three postdocs have already been hired and, and are actually working on, on the, the uh, grant already. Uh, next slide. Um, this project, uh, follows on the Future Seas Project, which investigated downscaled climate projections in California current and impacts on regional fisheries, including sardine. And the project's aims are to assess the effects of long-term climate change on the forage fish assemblage in the California current and on the predators and fishing communi communities it sustains. Um, it's intended to develop a climate-informed ecosystem management strategy evaluation to assess performance of current and alternative CPS management strategy, strategies under a changing climate, um, shifting forage species composition and varying predator populations. Next slide. Um, in terms of leverage downscaled, downscaled climate projections produced during the future seas, um, the control run reflected average conditions in nitrates um, and the sea surface temperature from 1990 to 2010. Uh, the other panels in this um, pre presentation here show the difference between the mean conditions in 1980 to 2010 versus um, the conditions projected to occur in 2070 to 2100. Um, so these are long-term uh, scale changes. Um, and these uh, show uh, each are global climate change models that were downscaled using um, the UC Santa Cruz region, regional ocean model or the ROMS, ROMS model. Uh, next slide. Uh, these maps show the predictions of adult sardine occurring uh, from the Batesian additive regression trees uh, for sardine spawning season for three contrasting years, uh, 2003, April 2011, and April 2015, um, showing how warm conditions alter the um, distribution and abundance of uh, sardines throughout the whole process. Um, and this information will be used in the new uh, large-scale model. Next slide. Um, these future projections of species distributions and ocean conditions will feed into a multi-species population dynamics model and the end-to-end -end Atlantis ecosystem model uh, that Isaac Kaplan had developed. Um, um, and it, it will... Um, will be used for 
um, to model key forage species, including sardine, anchovy, market squid, mackerels, and herring. Uh, next slide. So in, in uh, summary, that this project will investigate the impacts of climate change and CPS management on connected species and, and fisheries, uh, assessing the impacts of climate change on CPS fishery participants and their por portfolio, work on uh, multi-species and ecosystem models uh, in terms of single species models are not the focus, so it's a community-based uh, modeling system. And the team will reach out to climate uh, and communities initiative core team, ecosystem working group, and other industry and council persons, uh, and the CPS advisory bodies uh, to get input. Next slide. Um, it needs to be uh, identified that this project is not intended to be a conventional single species CPS management strategy evaluation designed to test robustness of CPS management uh, to the assumptions and uncertainties in the, the CPS stock assessments. It is a strategic look at how CPS fisheries and connected species and fisheries will fare under climate change. And due to the nature of the funding source, the NOAA Climate Office, there are longer time scales involved in the projections. Um, so um, looking at 2070 to 2100 um, are the focus uh, assessing the impacts of CPS management strategies and climate driven changes in the forage assembly and on other ecosystem components and fishing communities. That's a, a long one. Uh, next slide. I think Kristen's gonna jump in here and wrap it up for me. Thanks, Dale. Um, just at the at the end here, I just wanted to mention a little bit about the survey this summer, uh, which, as Dale said, is really unique and in, in that we are able to uh, take the ship farther south into Mexican waters, or, or we hope to, pending uh, permit approvals and and the like. Um, and I just wanted to add here at the end that we have a. We have a long history in NIMS and in, in the Council of better understanding our, our fisheries through these large scale fishery independent surveys. And those ideally encompass the entire distribution of a stock, which for CPS has led to coordination in the past with Canada on multiple occasions and pursuit of coordination with Mexico for, for a long time. Um, the transboundary nature of those stocks has um, similarly led to really years of interactions um, among scientists, uh, such as the um, the Trinational Sardine Forum that we have held annually um, in one of the three countries, um, but involves uh, scientists from all three countries to share data, methods, and training. Um, and this year's opportunity to formally collaborate with Mexico and survey in their waters using the same ship and methods that we use in U.S. waters follows on years of building those relationships with our counterparts to the south. And it allows us for the first time to, um, in, in many years, to uh, collect calibrated data across the majority of the range of all three of those sardine stocks, which will help us to understand better the total shared sardine resource that we that we have on the west coast um, for cps so that is really the goal of the survey this year um, in getting into mexican waters and as of now our um, plans to repeat the mexican portion of that survey in 2022 are are not defined yet so we have an opportunity this year to get into mexico it may not present itself next year uh, or subsequent years, um, but even one year of, of data uh, will be useful. So with that, uh, I think we're ready to uh, take any questions from the council. Thank you, Kristen, and thank you, Dale. Great presentation. Um, any questions on the presentation? Uh, Corey Niles. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Good morning, um, and thanks, Dale and Kristen. And yeah, that's thank you, Kristen. That's 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 
interesting and, and good news to hear about the survey going down into Mexico. Um, and and thank, a lot of good information, a lot of good good work going on to the slides. I and so I don't mean to pick on this one thing here, but on, on I think it's slide 18. There's a there's a reference to um, diminishing NOAA ship time, you know, and you spoke to the importance of these surveys. And could you could you elaborate and remind us what what's going on and why is why would why is ship time thing for you all? Yeah, I can I can take a stab at that. Um, the ship time situation in in NOAA, so if, as the slide says, we've had diminishing sea days in across the NOAA fleet for the last two to three years. Um, and the Southwest Center, I, I'm not exactly sure what the impact of that has been on the Northwest Center surveys exactly, the ones that are that are completed by the NOAA fleet. So not the charter surveys, but the, the ones that are done on NOAA ships. Um, the Southwest has, we've had sort of varying, um, depends on the year that you look at, whether we've had to deal with uh, decreasing ship days or not. Um, but there are a number of factors that go into in any given year, how many sea days will be available to the fleet um, across all of NOAA and then fisheries gets a portion or a percentage of those days at sea. Um, and then we have to do a prioritization within, within NIFS uh, for those sea days across the fleet and which NOAA fishery surveys will be completed that year. We sometimes have to calibrate um, and depending on how many sea days we get, we have to then distribute those across the surveys that the Southwest Center has to, has to do. Um, we've, we've contended with, with some of those decreases. There are also factors such as there are only so many uh, sheep, ships in the fleet. Those ships sometimes have to go through things like major repair cycles and things like that, major repair periods, excuse me, um, where they have to undergo um, uh, more than routine maintenance, sort of a mid-career, mid sort of, if you will, or mid-ship life um, uh, uh, repairs and those kinds of um, uh, repair periods and other maintenance type things can cut in further cut into sea days. So on the on the west coast, um, you're going to see some of that. It depends on the you know obviously the the age of the ships, um, but we're going to see some of those coming up. And so we're in an effort to try to uh, deal with some of those. Um, repair periods and impacts on the fleet in general. <clears throat> we have been asked to look at our West Coast surveys um, to see whether or not uh, efficiencies can be gained there. And if the council may remember uh, years ago, we did do a similar um, um, uh, integration, if you will, of the Sardine and Hake survey. Uh, we've tried this before. Um, we had some su success doing that. We ended up going back to our single stock or, or CPS um, and, and Hake surveys, respectively. Um, however, we're, we are being asked to look at that again and see if there aren't ways that we can um, gain some efficiencies between the two. It doesn't necessarily mean that we will go down to, say, one ship for both surveys. Um, we may be able to um, look at ways of using two ships more efficiently to capture the, the two um, the two sets of stocks that we need to do there. Um, so that's kind of what that means. We're in the preliminary stages of that. Uh, we are have two teams um, stood up that 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 conduct both the CPS surveys and the Hake surveys in the Northwest. Those teams are talking to each other about are there some very sort of low hanging fruit things that we can do this year and in, uh, in 2021 on our respective surveys. And then those teams will keep talking um, into 2022 to see whether there are um, further efficiencies that can be gained. Um, we're also looking at things like, you know, we have Hake on years and Hake off years. So we're cognizant of what uh, any kind of uh, integration might look like there um, and, and very, 
be careful to um, make decisions that don't disrupt um, either either surveys too much, um, but but can we gain some efficiencies between those two surveys on the West Coast? Corey, did that answer your question? <clears throat> yeah, th thank you, Kristen. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, any uh, further questions? Uh, Brianna Brady. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Dale and Kristen, for an excellent presentation. I really appreciate your time and all the energy you had to put into providing this information to the council. And I just wanted to follow up on the near shore of um, the white ship. I understand that you've made some adjustments and have been able to get the big ship closer to shore um, even more so than in past years. And that um, you've also been working really closely with the industry to cover even further near shore. And I think that's a really great positive on various fronts. Um, and just to note that Fish and Wildlife and CWPA will continue to plan to do the aerial survey to, to match that um, inner inner near shore. And I'm just wondering if um, with the industry doing that near shore survey and getting closer, if you have an understanding at this point of just how much more of the inshore might be being missed. That's a, uh, this is Dale Sweetnam. Um, thank you, Brianna. Uh, this, that was a good question. Um, I'm not sure, we'll, we'll have to see. The attempt is to have industry sample every five kilometers where the uh, white ship grid is either 20 or in um, adaptive sampling areas, 10, 10 nautical miles uh, different between, um, between grid lines. Um, so having industry sample uh, two times in the adaptive sampling and, and four times within um, the normal grid line area, um, it um, is hopefully getting a, a lot more information on, on school size and, and school distribution within those areas. Um, um, hopefully we're getting a, a lot better information, a lot more useful information um, and we'll have a lot better uh, estimates of uh, abundance in, in the near shore, which um, industry is always um, that we were missing. So hopefully we'll be able to get uh, a lot better estimates and make industry a, a lot more comfortable with those uh, near shore estimates of, of what the, uh, the fish that are actually catching in the fishery. So. Um, I think we're, we're getting there. I'm, I'm not sure if we have a definitive answer on what more needs to be done, but um, once the, like this survey is completed, the last two years of sampling, um, uh, 2019 and, and this year will uh, lead us to a lot better understanding of, I think of what's, what's in the near shore. As, as well as having that uh, aerial survey as well, so. Um, you just sort of a, a lot more definitive look at the near shore than we've had ever in the past. So it's, it's a good, good thing. Brianna. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and thanks Dale for all the details. Um, I guess what I'm asking is how shallow the industry boats can sample. If you have an idea of how close they're getting. Um, I'm actually uh, not sure. I haven't been on the vessel doing the research, but I think they attempt to get as uh, close as they can, um, you know, without hazarding the, the vessel. Um, uh, I know in the near shore, there's a lot of uh, lobster nets in the Southern California bite um, uh, buoys and, and such. And um, so, but I think when they're running the acoustic grid i think they're they attempt to get in as close as possible and then the purse saning when they can do the purse saning will be much more closer to what they would normally um you know lay out in their uh regular fishing operations so um i think that's um that um you know i 
some talk is getting in close as close as they can to the waves, um, you know, and, and um, you know, not uh, that shallow, but but actually pretty close. So I don't think there's a lot of near shore area that's actually being missed uh, unless, you know, we have uh, a lot of stuff just actually in the waves, waves themselves. Thanks, Dan. Sure. Any further questions on the Southwest Science Center presentation? Thank you, Kristen, and thank you, Dale. Sure, thank you, guys. All right, we, we have some uh, reports here. We'll first go to the CPS management team report. Lorna, Borgo. Good morning, uh, Chair Grillnick and council members. This is uh, Lorna Wargo with the CPS management team and I will be reading our report on the National Marine Fisheries Service report. The Coastal Project Species Management Team and the Coastal Project Species Advisory Subpanel received a presentation from Ms. Kristen Cook and Mr. Dale Sweetenham from the Southwest Fishery Science Center on June 24. The presentation covered research activities and provided an opportunity for both CPS advisory bodies to ask questions and engage with the center leadership and staff. The CPSMT appreciated the presentation and discussion and looks forward to having similar meetings in the future. The CPSMT thanks all the leadership and staff from the Southwest Fishery Science Center for their time and effort to meet with us. The CPSMT was pleased to hear that the spring survey, surveys were able to be done and to see the preliminary results. The plans for the upcoming summer survey with its extensive collaboration with industry partners are encouraging and the CPSMT hopes that the plan work and collaboration with colleagues in Mexico comes to fruition. The CPSMT also encouraged, was also encouraged by the center's plan to address both the near-term and longer-term stock assessment and research needs that were raised for Pacific Sardine at the April 2021 Council meeting under agenda item E4A Supplemental CPSMT Report 1 and also identified by the SSC under agenda item E4A Supplemental SSC Report 1. We look forward to hearing progress reports on the center's efforts to address these research needs. The CPSMT is also encouraged by the additional investigations underway regarding how climate change may affect CPS. However, the potential loss of ship time available for CPS surveys that may cause them to be combined with Pacific Cake surveys raises concerns. The CPS surveys have become an integral part of effectively managing CPS fisheries. Combining these surveys is less than ideal because it requires compromises and survey protocols for both surveys, but is clearly preferable to not having any coastwide survey for CPS. And that concludes the management team statement. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lorna. Are there questions on the team report? Corey Niles. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair, and, and thanks, Lorna. Um, yeah, and it's it's good to, and not to steal the, the thunder from the AS, but uh, to, good to hear that you're you you're both both bodies are having good conversations with the Science Center. And I know, um, and we just saw the presentation of all the work that's being done, and over the past however many years around the council it's it, we, there's there are more questions than than the science center has a capacity to answer um so i know we had a a, a good conversation this morning in our in our delegation meeting but could you just maybe talk a little bit more on uh, on that well i know on the, on the first paragraph of yours and how you how you all see the team sees these discussions on research and assessments you know and the need to to you know, we have more work than we can do and how do we talk about priorities? Did, did, did you all have any thoughts on going forward on how, on how we, how, how these discussions on, on research and assessment priorities um, could be most, uh, you know, could be had here at the council? 
that that's an unfair question. Apologies, but yeah, just looking for some some thoughts on how we how we continue these these discussions on our, our research and assessment needs and priorities. Yes, thank you, um, Corey. Um, I think what um, so one having the presentation um, like this from the center was um, really helpful, and I. I know the team and the advisory subpanel, we really appreciated, again, the time of Chris and Cook and Dale um, and the others that participated. Um, I think that maybe a, a bigger challenge and, and what we talked about or touched base on during our delegation this morning is having an ability to look at across all the CPS research um, needs whether it's sardine, anchovy, mackerel. Um, so I see this as a good step in that um, it does start to begin, you know, look at that. Um, so I think that's something maybe the council you know, could consider um, in looking at across CPS um, holistically. I think we've tended to look um, more just at species by species, some of the challenges that exist. Um, and acknowledge, you know, there's always more research than resources, um, but perhaps that's maybe something to consider going forward. Well, thank you. Were there questions of the team? Thank you, Lorna. Thank you. Uh, we'll next have the CPSAS report. Uh, Diane Pleschner Steele, welcome. Good morning, Chair Grillnick and Council members. Diane Pleschner Steele, happy to read the advisory subpanel report on the National Marine Fishery Service report. The Council or the Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel was honored to receive a preview of the Southwest Fishery Science Center presentation to the council from Ms. Kristen Cook and Mr. Dale Sweetnam, Dr. Juan Zwolinski, a member of the Southwest Center's acoustic team, and Dr. John Hyde, program lead of genetics, physiology, and aquaculture, also attended the virtual meeting and responded to questions from CPSAS members. The CPSAS extends our grateful thanks to Ms. Cook, Mr. Sweetnam, Dr. Zwolinski, and Dr. Hyde for their time and candid report on the status of the Southwest Center's ca capacity and priorities related to CPS surveys, stock assessments, and research and data needs. The CPSAS members greatly appreciate the Center's help and collaboration with industry, contracting with fishermen in the Pacific Northwest and California to conduct acoustic surveys near shore, which will improve fu future stock assessments. We were gratified to learn that the Southwest Center is responding to fishermen's concerns and recommendations to improve the accurate survey accuracy and prioritizing issues such as sardine stock structure and the anchovy stock assessment. We're also pleased that this communication with advisory bodies will be continued on a regular basis. Industry members in both the Northwest and California extend our offer of assistance to strengthen this collaboration. And that concludes our statement. Happy to answer questions. Thank you, Diane. Are there questions for Diane? Thank you, Diane. Thank you. Uh, that uh, concludes uh, the reports that we have and takes us to uh, public comment. We have, I believe, two, two uh, requests for public comment, and I'm trying to bring them up right now, because I have limited real estate on my screen here. Uh, Mr. Chair, I apologize for not uh, being as organized as I should. Oh, it looks like I might, might be organized enough, so here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm struggling here myself. Two sign ups are right, have Diane and Jeff. Okay. Are there two? There we go. Diane and Jeff. So, Diane, uh, welcome back 
to the microphone uh, for your public comment. Thank you, Chair Grillnick and council members. I, uh, I just want to reiterate the thanks that we have expressed both the management team and the advisory sub panel for the, the center's real efforts to take, take, take into consideration the concerns and the comments that the fishermen have been making and to work really hard, you know, closely with us so that we can improve stock assessments. And again, I'll just reiterate on behalf of CWPA, uh, we're ready, willing, and able to do whatever is necessary to uh, improve stock assessments. And so uh, I just want to say thanks again. I, I wasn't sure I was going to have the opportunity to read the sub panel statement. So that's, I signed up, but uh, I just want to reiterate thanks to the center. I think they're hearing us. They're doing the very best they can given the the constraints that they're working under. And I guess the one concern I would uh, echo, which was brought up also by the management team is, uh, you know, reducing ship time and combining surveys with Hake when um, we're relying, totally relying on acoustic trawl surveys now for stock assessments and, and biomass estimates. It, it seems to me that that is a clear indicator that we need to be looking at, at multiple indices instead of just the one. So um, I'll just say thanks again. And uh, we, uh, again, appreciate appreciate the, the center's uh, hearing of our concerns and working with us to improve, improve stock assessments. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Diane. Uh, any questions of Diane? Thank you, Diane. Uh, Jeff Shester, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is Jeff Shester representing Oceana. I uh, just wanted to um, uh, also echo the, the thank you and appreciation to the center. Uh, we are very encouraged to see both the progress on the near shore that Diane just mentioned, as well as the, um, the efforts to do really, uh, as, as Dr. Cook said, the first uh, coastwide survey all the way down into Mexican waters for this coastal pelagic species stocks. This has been a, a long going, long um, standing research need and we are very happy to see that. Uh, we also support the work to delineate the landings of sardines to uh, hopefully Fully allow for separate management of the southern subpopulation. As you know, we've been uh, requesting that stock be added to the fishery management plan for quite some time. And we see this as consistent with the previous uh, consensus statement reached by the advisory subpanel back in September regarding the uh, path forward for dealing with the two different stocks. Uh, with respect to research priorities, um, the uh, as, as we noted in our letter on this item, uh, our, we, we have a major concern with the sardine uh, maximum sustainable yield exploitation rate or the EMSY. Um, at the last uh, April meeting, uh, the, both the CPSMT and the SSC recognized that the Cal Coffee Index uh, was flawed. Uh, this was also published by a previous Southwest Fishery Science Center uh, scientist, and we are concerned that right now it is falsely predicting a high recruitment for a stock that is in a in a currently in a status of, of historically low recruitment, as indicated by the 2020 assessment. Uh, in addition, the rebuilding analysis indicated that under current productivity levels, the stock won't recover under status quo management uh, using the that current EMSY. Um, and so we, we, what we'd like to see is an inclusion of a, a new calculation of the EMSY based on the current stock environmental and recruitment conditions. Uh, perhaps this could be included in the terms of reference for the upcoming assessment. Uh, we, we are aware that Dr. Hill was able to do this for anchovy in the 2016 MSST report. Uh, and the, the Science Center has said that this can be inferred from surveys or assessments. It does not have to be a, a, a lengthy exercise. We don't envision the need for workshops. We don't think that there needs to be a whole extensive effort to, um, to look at a whole set of environmental indicators like the 2013 parameters workshop did, but really uh, kind of take a more simple approach um, and, and, and basically come up with an, an updated estimate. As you'll note in the anchovy framework, the main purpose of stock 
assessments uh, in, in, in the anchovy framework is to uh, develop updated estimates of EMSY, and we don't see any reason why this could not also be done for sardines and the next stock assessment. And so we'd ask you to include that in your priorities and the terms of reference to for the next stock assessment for sardines. Um, and then lastly, uh, as you've seen in recent stock assessments, both for mackerel and for sardines, uh, the Science Center staff and, and the STAT team has been uh, pushing for uh, the direct use of ATM surveys in management uh, as opposed to the use of model-based uh, estimates for informing routine management measures, uh, particularly harvest specifications. Um, uh, we learned a few years ago that in South Africa, they, they have a new catch limit in place within two weeks after the completion of each survey. Uh, obviously, that would take some work to get there um, for, for, for the United States, but I think there's no reason that we shouldn't uh, include that as a goal and try to work towards that uh, and, and, and work with the center to um, help expedite the, the production of those direct survey results and better align uh, the council management schedule to uh, better be able to use those directly since the delay in use of the ATM surveys is, um, is, is a major source of uncertainty. And uh, as was stated in some of the recent stock assessments by the Southwest Center, uh, the merits of a survey-based approach uh, outweigh the, uh, the, the merits of using uh, model-based or, or assessment-based um, survey estimates. So uh, just wanted to uh, add that in and, and uh, appreciate the Southwest Science Center working uh, more closely with the council process and, uh, and hope that those research priorities, uh, in addition to those uh, by industry, can also be uh, priorities for the council and the center. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jeff. Are there any questions of Jeff? Thank you, Jeff. That will conclude public comment. It takes us to our council action here, which is discussion on this report. I'll look for uh, any hands. Uh, Corey Niles followed by Louis Zim. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Sorry. It's a little slow on the mute button there this morning. Um, it just, yeah, I just want to, again, uh, say thank you to the Science Center and, and our, our management team and, and advisor subpanels for having these discussions. And I'll, you know, just echoing my questioning with Lorna on the team, I'm, I am, I think we've brought up a number of times the past year, couple of years about, um, you know, and, and as, as Jeff was summarizing there as well about just the, the, the many questions we have for the scientists about about our CPS stocks and, and how we as a council, um, you know, have time and, and input and all that on, on how we recommend um, priorities for that research. So just just want to get that out there for um, we're continuing to see the, to the, the need. I understand we'll have some agenda items this, this fall where we can or scheduled possibly for this fall where we can start to have those. But yeah, in these NIMS reports, getting all this good information from the Science Center, I'm just wondering how in, in the future we might we might maybe take advantage of the time and, and the information to, to have talks about about what our, our priorities for, for work on the assessments and, and research would be. Again, just and thank you um, again for, for the time and information. Thanks, Corey. Louis M. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I echo uh, Corey's comments that he just made, but I also want to highlight uh, the uh, proposed uh, uh, cooperation between Mexico and the United States and uh, bringing uh, Mexican scientists and observers and uh, their wonderful ship, the Fraser, into this uh, uh, to the survey this year, um, I was in. I was involved uh, w when I was a ship captain of the research vessels in in similar surveys, and uh, they're very productive. And it also leads to uh, uh, understanding between the two nations. And I think it's a great thing. And and looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Louie. Uh, Maggie Summer. 
Thank you, Chair Veronik. Um, I also want to uh, relay many thanks I heard in our Oregon delegation this morning for uh, the very informative report from the science centers. And I, um, am, I, I would like, if possible, to ask uh, Drs. Cook or Sweetnam, uh, following on the public comment we just heard, uh, suggesting that there could potentially be some updating of EMSY in the next sardine assessment. Uh, it sounds like a, a suggestion for something simpler than the uh, larger reevaluation of it than uh, was, was contemplated in the long-term planning list in your presentation. Um, if you have any any thoughts on the potential uh, feasibility and and value of doing uh, maybe a uh, you know an update in the next assessment as suggested. <clears throat> Was that a question for the center? It, it was if they're still available. Yeah. So well, thank, you. thank you for the question. This is Dale Sweetner here. Uh, the attempt <clears throat> is to, to get at the EMSY question, uh, but we're first trying to um, get at the stock structure question. Um, hopefully that once we get there and get through the management implications of that stock structure, we can work on the EMSY question. Um, the stat team determined it was uh, um, not as a important a question to tackle right away than the stock structure question. So, um, and we're completely booked through the end of the year on getting the anchovy uh, assessment completed and, and reviewed. So um, the attempt to get back to EMSY will probably be in 2022 sometime. Um, and hopefully we'll have a response before the sardine uh, benchmark assessment in 2023. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, further council discussion. All right, thanks everyone. I'm just gonna share one thought. This is something that I raised at the CCC meeting. Um, we're asking a lot of the science centers um, and they're working with limited resources. Um, you know, funding has been flat, but things tend to cost more. We also have this national uh, uh, goal of, of increasing a domestic seafood production. And this applies to CPS, ground fish and any other uh, FMP we manage, uh, yet without the the uh, current and uh, complete and frequent assessments, it's difficult for us to accomplish that national goal. So I'm just sort of expressing frustration here uh, for the council and I, I assume for the science center that uh, we don't have the resources we need to get the assessments that we need in order to meet that national goal. Um, so I guess I'm just venting here and <clears throat> maybe one day uh, the administration and Congress will, will fix that. But until then we, we make do with what we've got. All right, that will conclude uh, agenda item H1 and will take us to agenda item H2, the Pacific Mackerel assessment and management measures, and I'll turn to Kerry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is agenda item H2, Pacific Mackerel Assessment and Management Measures. At this meeting, the council is set to adopt management measures and harvest specifications for the uh, Pacific Mackerel stock, um, and you'll set two subsequent or sequential years. Um, and um, they will be based on the projection estimate that is in your advanced briefing book materials. And I'll circle back to that in a minute. Um, the, um, the assessment team um, 
from the Southwest Center produced this estimate, which is per the um, the um, management and assessment schedule that's described in uh, COP9. Um, and uh, every four years, we the center does a full benchmark assessment, and then in the intervening two years, uh, they do um, projection estimates. Um, in your briefing book materials, back to that uh, uh, catch only projection estimate, uh, table three um, had some updated information on the sigma values. And so the table three that's in the in the uh, advanced copy of the assessment has been replaced now by, um, by um, uh, a supplemental report um, that is listed as attachment two, I do believe in your materials. So they didn't have a big effect, especially on the um, harvest re uh, recommendations made in the various uh, advisory bodies in the SSC. But for the record, we wanna make sure that the uh, correct table is in the supplemental um, report from the Southwest Center. Um, or not a report, the uh, attachment. You also have uh, supplemental reports from the SSC and the CPSMT, the CPSAS, and then there is public comment as well. Um, your um, actions are to adopt the macro assessment, select P star value, um, ABC, ACL, and ACT if appropriate, um, and then also adopt incidental catch allowances. Um, after this overview, we will, uh, uh, we're not going to have a presentation on the assess or the projection estimate itself. So we'll go straight to the um, SSC and then the other advisory bodies. And uh, then there's public comment. And then again, the council action is to adopt final harvest specifications and management measures for the 2021-22 fishery and the 2022-23 fishery. Uh, that concludes my overview. I'll take any questions, uh, or if not, we can go to the SSC report, I do believe. All right, thanks very much, Carrie. Any questions for Carrie? All right, then we will get started with the SSC report. Welcome, Galen Johnson. Good morning, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning to the council. Um, this is Galen Johnson of the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission, and I'll be reading the Scientific and Statistical Committee report on Pacific Mackerel Assessment and Management Measures. Dr. Kevin Hill of the Southwest Fisheries Science Center presented the results of the catch-only update to the Pacific Mackerel Stock Assessment. Pacific Mackerel is currently managed with a benchmark assessment every four years with a catch projection conducted two years later and used for the last two years of the four-year cycle. The catch-only projection followed the terms of reference for catch-only projections. The catch-only projection was based on the benchmark assessment conducted in 2019, which provided the basis for overfishing limits, acceptable biological catches, and annual catch limits for the 2019 to 20 and 2020 to 2021 fishing seasons. No changes to the assessment were made except to update the catch series for 2017 through December 2020 and project catches through June 2022. Recruitment for the base model was taken from the stock recruitment relationship. The baseline model projected one plus biomass was 57,832 metric tons July 2021 and 45,925 metric tons July 2022 under the assumption that the total harvest guideline will be attained in the 2021 to 2022 fishing year. Sensitivity was explored to alternative catch series and assumptions about recruitment strength. The Scientific and Statistical Committee endorses the catch-only projection as the best scientific information available for management of Pacific mackerel. The SSC further endorses the overfishing limits of 12,145 metric tons for 2021 to 2022 and 9,644 metric tons for 2022 to 2023. The 2022 to 2023 overfishing limit could be recalculated if the ABC for 2021 to 22 is less than the harvest guideline for that year. This assessment is assigned to category three because of high uncertainty regarding the scale of the biomass, great sensitivity to assumptions, and the fact that almost all the biomass derives from year classes that are currently poorly sampled or taken directly from the stock recruitment relationship. The final ABCs depend on the council's risk tolerance as reflected in the choice of P-STAR. 
Conducting benchmark assessments for a short-lived species every fourth year means that major changes in recruitment or stock biomass could occur, but not be reflected in management advice. Past stock assessment team, stock assessment review panels, and SSC advice has been that management be based on the results of the acoustic trial method survey, but this requires conducting a management strategy evaluation, which is yet to occur for Pacific mackerel. An update assessment every year is ideal until the acoustic trial method survey estimate can be used directly for management purposes for Pacific mackerel. However, logistics and demands on staff time may make this infeasible for Pacific mackerel. Update assessments every second year may balance workload demands and the desire to base management decisions on the most recent data. The SSC therefore recommends that Pacific mackerel assessments be conducted in a four-year cycle with benchmark and update assessments rather than catch-only projections every second year. And that concludes our statement. Thank you very much, Galen. Are there questions of Galen? Thank you very much, Galen. Uh, we'll next hear from the uh, management team, uh, Alan Sarich. Yes, good morning, Mr. Chair. I'll be reading from Supplemental CPSMT Report 1. The Coast Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team, the Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel, and the Scientific and Statistical Committee jointly received a presentation via webinar on June 23rd from Dr. Kevin Hill on the catch only projection of Pacific mackerel, including the addendum for use in management. The CPSMT commends the stock assessment team and supports the approval of the catch only projection as put forward by the STAT based on the 2019 ALT-19 assessment model and endorsed by the SSC. The catch-only projection provides harvest guidelines for managing the Pacific mackerel resource for fishing years 2021 to 22 and 2022 to 23. The next benchmark assessment and review will take place during the spring 2023 for management in two consecutive fishing years 2023 to 24 and 2024 to 25. The CPSMT recommends the overfishing limit acceptable biological catch and HG as presented in tables one and two below. These values are based on a tier three assessment as specified by the SSC in report one. The council has previously adopted a P-STAR value of 0 0.45, which the CPSMT believes is still appropriate. The MT also recommends an incidental set aside of 1,000 metric tons each fishing year with associated annual catch targets, 1,000 metric tons less than the HG. These values are indicated below. Should the council select a P-STAR value other than 0.45, the harvest specifications would follow from appropriate values presented in Table 3. The management team further recommends that for each separate fishing year, should the directed fishery realize the ACT, the National Marine Fishery Service should close the directed fishery and shift to an incidental-only fishing reef for the remainder of the fishing season with a 45% incidental landing allowance when Pacific mackerel are landed with other CPS with the exception that up to three metric tons of Pacific mackerel per landing could be landed in non-CPS fisheries. Okay. Table one includes the 2021 to 22 harvest specifications. The biomass and OFL were presented by the SSC, so we'll go straight to the ABC of 0 0.45 uh, P-star value would be 9,446. The ACL would be equal to the ABC an HG of 8,323, an ACT of 7,323, and an incidental take of 1,000. Table two for the 2022 to 23 specifications is an ABC with a 0 0.45 P-star value of 7,501, an ACL equal to the ABC, an HG of 5,822, an ACT of 4,822, and the incidental at 1,000. And then consideration of update assessments versus catch-only projections. The CPSMT is aware of the SSC suggestion of conducting update assessments as opposed to catch-only projections for Pacific mackerel going forward. Conducting an update assessment during the interim year's assessment schedule would provide more data for the management of Pacific mackerel relative to the catch-only projections. The management team recognizes, however, that the value of this may be limited given that given the catch history in U.S. fisheries for this stock. Additionally, there would be workload considerations for the Southwest Fishery Science Center as it relates to CPS for such a change. As an administrative issue, the management team notes that currently COP 9, Schedule 3, 
calls for an update assessment at two years, two year interval between full assessments for Pacific mackerel rather than a catch only projection. This does not, however, reflect the council action from June 2013 and the corresponding assessment schedule for Pacific mackerel since that time. The management team recommends editing the COP to make it consistent. And that concludes our team report. Thank you, Alan. Are there questions for Alan on the team report? Louis Zim. Thank you once again, uh, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Alan, for your report. Um, I've always uh, gained a lot from participating in uh, with your group as much as I could. Um, and I'm going to the reason. Then I'm going to ask you a question that I'm sure I could dig up in in all the figures. But uh, how often has the uh, fishery reached the ACT or the HG in the last, uh, say, five years? Thank you, Mr. Zim. The answer is zero uh, for the last twenty years, I believe. Thank you very much. Any uh, further questions for the team? Thank you, Alan. Uh, we'll next hear from the CPS AS and Mr. David Crabb. Welcome, David. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, council members. Uh, for the record, my name is David Crabb, and I'll be reading from the CPS advisory panel report one. Um, the Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel joined the Scientific and Statistical Committee webinar and heard a presentation by Dr. Kevin Hill on the catch only assessment for management in 2021-22 and 2022-23, followed by SSC discussion. The CPSAS thanks Dr. Hill for his presentation and work and the SSC for their comments. The CPS AS fishery representatives continue to express concerns regarding the Pacific mackerel assessment. See June 19 agenda item F3 supplemental CPS AS report one. The catch only Pacific mackerel assessment based on the 2019 benchmark assessment assessed age one plus biomass with a new model alt 19, which was based mainly on the acoustic trawl survey. Fishermen continue to question AT survey methods and assumptions. Increased collaboration with industry, both in expanding surveys and acknowledging fishermen observations of CPS stock presence, abundance on the fishing grounds and focusing surveys accordingly would improve the accuracy of future stock assessments. Although mackerel fishery catches have been low for several years in California, Pacific mackerel are known for sharp fluctuations in abundance. This catch only stock assessment is the basis for two years of harvest limits until the next full assessment is scheduled. This condition could preclude substantial harvest opportunity if, mac if Pacific mackerel abundance spikes in the interim. Veteran fishermen observe that when anchovy are abundant, mackerel will follow. There's no question that anchovy are at record abundance. Fishermen are now observing Pacific mackerel around the Northern Channel Islands in Southern California but due to reduced effort because fishermen are focusing on other fisheries and the tendency for mackerel to school with sardine, fishermen report not targeting mackerel. Pacific mackerel is a key alternative CPS fishery in California, particularly in Southern California. To address this concern, we recommend that the Pacific Fishery Mackerel or Management Council Mackerel Council allow sufficient flexibility to schedule stock assessments, updates, and revised harvest limits as needed between scheduled benchmark assessments. The SSC suggested conducting updated assessments rather than catch only projections on at least a biannual frequency. The CPSAS supports that recommendation. The terms of reference for update assessments also need more flexibility built into the process to enable the stock assessment team SSC and council to consider conducting benchmark assessments as needed. Based on the information presented, the CPSAS recommends the following management measures. Based on a tier three sigma value as recommended by the SSC, we also recommend that the council approve a P star of 0.45 following the longstanding precedent set for Pacific mackerel. These are consistent with the coastal pelagic species team recommendations. Um, and below is the uh, CPS MT proposed 2122 Pacific mackerel harvest specifications. 
Uh, the CPSAS also recommends in-season check-ins at the March 2022 and March 2023 council meetings, if needed, to consider potentially moving incidental allowances to the directed fishery or other alternative approaches to management. If the mackerel fishery attains or comes close to attaining the, the annual catch target. Thank you for your consideration um, of our recommendations. And that concludes the statement. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, on behalf of the Pacific Fishery Mackerel Council, uh, <laughs> are there any questions of David? Thanks, David. It's good to have you here. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I'll be around. Great. All right, so that concludes uh, the reports that I have, takes us to public comment. And last I looked, we had two comments, uh, Diane Pleschner-Steele and Jeff Shester. So we will take them in that order. Welcome, Diane. Thank you, uh, Chair Grilnick and, and council members. Uh, Diane Pleschner Steele, and I'm speaking on behalf of the California Wet Fish Producers Association in California. Um, as noted in the advisory subpanel statement, fishermen remain very concerned with uh, the acoustic trawl biomass estimates that are used directly for management of mackerel. And as, as our subpanel statement noted, concerns were highlighted in the CPSAS report in June 2019. Um, the catch-only projection was based on model ALT-19, which was based on the 2018 acoustic survey, uh, and that survey did not use sonar and apparently missed very large schools reported by albacore fishermen in the Northwest because those, school, those fish were breezing on the surface. Also, there wasn't enough time in the STAR panel meeting to resolve a conflict in model ALT between fishery age data particularly the age zeros collected in California fishery landings, but also sometimes in acoustic surveys, with the time invariant age key used to assign age to fish captured in the AT surveys. So the stat downweighted the increase in the recruitment of age zero fish that was observed in 2018 by half to better fit model alt to the AT survey data. So basically, model alt consequently dropped the HD from over 20,000 tons to only 11,000 tons, so cut it by, by more than half. The June 2021 Supplemental SSC report for mackerel noted that baseline model alt estimated biomasses for 2021 and 2022 assumed that the total harvest guideline would be attained in 2021. And uh, that's a pretty sketchy assumption. And this, you know, the advisory subpanel statement explains why mackerel landings have been low in recent years. The SSC report also acknowledged that major changes in recruitment or biomass can occur between benchmark assessments. While past SAD and SSC advice has been that management be based on the results of the AT method survey only, the SSC points out that this requires conducting an, an MSE management strategy evaluation which has not yet happened for mackerel. The SSC recommends conducting update assessments rather than catch only projections every second year with benchmark assessments every four years. And we support that recommendation as well. We ask the council to recognize why there are problems with the current AT surveys as used as the only index of abundance for any CPS when this includes mackerel. In our discussion with Southwest Center leaders last year, or last, last week, sorry, they noted that they've begun collecting sonar data as fishermen have recommended, but because of the large backlog in analyzing the data, th those data have not been used yet. They also say they've started trawling at a faster rate, 4.5 knots instead of the three knots that, uh, that their survey plan had said. And that's, uh, a, you know, that's a great improvement, and we appreciate that the center is listening to fishermen, and we hope that the continuing communications will improve both at AT methodology and CPS stock assessment. Um, however, the skipper of the Frosty, who used to, uh, who was contracted to run some of the old NOAA surveys in the past, had told uh, 
many of us that to, in order to catch both sardine and mackerel, you really need to be trawling uh, at five, five knots or, or more. So maybe at 4.5 knots, they're still missing those fish. They can swim very fast and they are very e easily to avoid the net. The main point I'm trying to make here is that acoustic surveys should not be used as absolute abundance estimates. The 2018 AT methods review was very clear about that point. Uh, we continue to recommend that CPS stock assessments consider multiple indices, not just acoustic trawl surveys. I, hang on a sec, I'm going to go to my second page here. In 2019, the CPSAS report stated that the data collection programs need to be substantially expanded. For example, the P-Mackerel assessment could uh, also consider bycatch from the whiting fishery. And the next star panel review should provide time to address the conflict in model alt between the fishery age data, particularly the age zeros, and with the time invariant age key used to assign fishery age captured uh, in the trawl surveys, acoustic trawl surveys. We Sorry. <laughs> we support uh, the CPSAS recommendation to allow for more flexibility to schedule stock assessment updates as needed. Uh, perhaps the TOR could be revised to provide uh, provision for mop-up assessments as is allowed for, uh, for, for ground fish. Um, another fl flexible approach would be to consider rolling over any unused harvest guideline from one year to the next in non-benchmark years. That pro uh, prospect was considered for some ground fish a while back, and something like that approach could work for, for Pacific mackerel also. One thing is clear, considering past history, the mackerel resource is known for sharp spikes in abundance. Old-time fishermen, as the advisor, sub, advisory sub-panel pointed out, uh, old-time fishermen report that when anchovy are abundant, mackerel will follow. And we're, we're looking for them and we're starting to see them. As fishermen are now seeing an increase in mackerel around the northern islands, and we ask the council to consider how you might build more flexibility into the management process. In the meantime, the fishery needs to live with the current management measures and we support the recommendations as stated in both the management team and CPSAS statements. And thank you very much for your consideration. I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Diane. Let me see if there are any questions of <clears throat> Diane. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. And I guess tag teaming Diane is Jeff Shuster. Go ahead, Jeff. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, the, I guess the, um, the Diane and Jeff show continues. Um, uh, this is Jeff Shuster speaking on behalf of Oceana. Um, first of all, I think we'd like to, to start by um, thanking the, the scientists for their work on the catch-only projection. Um, we, uh, we do agree uh, with the, the general consensus of the management team, SSC, and advisory subpanel uh, regarding the concerns with the catch-only projection. Um, there's a, a huge amount of uncertainty. I think as uh, Dr. Hunt uh, said, that basically most of the biomass now is uh, that, that is in the, the catch-only projection is, quote, invented biomass based on the stock recruit relationship rather than actual observed biomass. Um, this is a, a major concern uh, in particular, and, and I guess we're, we're somewhat befuddled by the fact that the 2019 acoustic trawl survey estimate uh, was not included in the catch-only projection uh, or included at all in the briefing book materials on this item. Uh, the 2019 ATM estimate is the most recent uh, actual observed uh, survey uh, estimate, and that estimate of 26,577 metric tons uh, was about three times below uh, or roughly a third of what the um, uh, catch-only projection estimated for 2019 based on that stock recruit relationship. In other words, there, the assessment projected that there would be a major uh, increase in mackerel abundance from 2018 to 19 based on a, a predicted high recruitment event 
however, the ATM estimate showed that that actually did not play out in reality. Um, this is further, I think, exacerbated by uh, what we've uh, seen from the catch levels in 2020, uh, showing that the catch levels of, of approximately 600 metric tons uh, from CDFW landings data of, of Pacific mackerel, uh, which are, are far lower than they had been in, in recent years. Um, and, and this is further indicative of a low biomass. Um, so we, we, we are concerned that the, the best available information, the ATM survey uh, from 2019, that's the most recent, is not being considered or included at all. Uh, whatsoever in the uh, proposed catch limits for uh, for the upcoming two years. Um, as such, we we suggest that the council uh, uh, actually adopt the the ATM estimate as the basis for management in lieu of the catch only projections. Given the concerns, we note that the SSC did not have a serious discussion about this. They did raise concerns that the 2019 estimate was not included in the assessment, but essentially were unable to do anything or act on that due to the terms of reference. Um, so uh, with a with a tier three sigma, uh, we we suggest that there should be a P star of no greater than 0.4. We think that 0.45 is overly aggressive for this stock, uh, given um, that uh, again, the, uh, as as uh, Mr. Zim pointed out, the. the Fishery has not reached its uh, its harvest guideline for for much, for some time now. Um, we suggest a no greater than 0.4 uh, at a P star of 0.4 in tier three. This would be a, an overfishing limit of 5,581 tons, uh, acceptable biological catch of 3,363. Uh, tons and a harvest guideline of 1,759 metric tons. Uh, and that harvest guideline, again, would be uh, roughly three times greater than the catch in the last year. Um, we also note, and there's a number of excerpts in our letter on this item, that the 2019 assessment, uh, as I mentioned, the last agenda item, uh, recommended the use of the ATM survey estimates directly for use in routine management, not model-based estimates. Uh, this is to reduce delay, which is the primary cause of uncertainty, and also concluded that the ATM estimate is the best available science for management of this stock. Uh, if there is some sort of MSE necessary in order to do that, uh, we suggest that that, uh, that be a priority for the management of Pacific mackerel. Uh, in addition, we note that the, the, both the cutoff and the uh, MSY exploitation rate have not really been evaluated uh, in quite some time now, and we believe these are, are overdue. Um, and ultimately, uh, we, we again are concerned that the 2019 estimate is not provided in this agenda item. We hope that the council can ask some pointed questions about why that was not the case and what that means in terms of, in terms of this. Uh, in the meantime, we do support the move towards uh, eliminating catch-only projections and instead using update assessments. At least that could have uh, allowed for the inclusion of the 2019 estimate in this uh, in this management process. Uh, so I think given all these concerns, we, we hope that the council takes a very risk-averse approach uh, this in the upcoming years, given the high levels of uncertainty and the uh, the actual on-the-water evidence showing far lower numbers than what is in your catch-only projection. And if the council does move forward uh, without using the ATM uh, survey from 2019, um, we we do uh, we, we we can hopefully uh, be able to use the uh, point of concern framework if the 2021 survey that's happening this summer does indeed continue to show low biomass uh, to reflect that that major difference in what the uh, what the ATM survey and the on the water estimates are telling us versus what this uh, catch only model with high uncertainty is showing us now. So um, with that, I, I would be happy to take any questions and appreciate the opportunity to comment. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Are there questions of Jeff? Corey Niles. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Jeff. And yeah, maybe you and Diane should uh, consider doing a podcast or something together. <laughs> I like that title, Diane and Jeff Show. But in, in seriousness here, you know, I hear you, and uh, I don't know if you heard my question to Lorna um, under the NIMS report, but it's, uh, I think what she said is kind of just is bouncing around in my mind about um, 
you know, we have a lot of re and as 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 our chair said under that agenda item too, there's a lot of our 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 questions out outpace what, what the science center is able to to help us with um given the resources they have. But just kind of curious on on I hear I, what you're saying here about mackerel echoes a lot of what we've been saying about anchovy in terms of wanting to be able to um th these populations change quickly and we, and we want to be able to to track those so just wondering how what what your if you had if as you're willing if you had thoughts about the relative priority um about doing more uh you know doing doing macro assessments more frequently or like you're taking the atm survey into account more frequently you know compared to anchovy uh, compared to sardine, um, yeah, and, and sorry to ask here unclearly, but what would your relatively, what would your priority be for, for doing macro versus anchovy? Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Niles for the question. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I've, uh, along with other colleagues, uh, considered that quite a bit and had many discussions about that. Um, we do see uh, the recent thinking that's gone into the anchovy framework as uh, a significant advancement in, um, in, in how to deal with these uh, stocks that perhaps may not be as high priority as specific sardines. Um, and, and I think that um, it, what we've seen, at least in recent landings, is there is somewhat of a mismatch in that uh, mackerel is continues to be managed as, quote, an actively managed species uh, with regular specifications, uh, yet the anchovy landings have actually exceeded mackerel landings in the last several years um, and, and, and also have a high ecological importance. Both, both species certainly do, but... Um, I think there has been a lot of attention on, on anchovy and, and rightly so to try to get that back into the, um, the, uh, the, the realm of using most recent available estimates. So I think the, what I would suggest is that there, you know, I, I, I could see a, a framework for mackerel uh, echoing very much what, um, what is, is being considered now for anchovy, where you have uh, full assessments uh, maybe every eight years uh, and, uh, and, and really focus the um, biennial management on use of short-term biomass estimates from, directly from ATM surveys, which is what uh, appears to be proposed for the framework, the anchovy framework, which we'll be, be discussing in the next agenda item. So um, certainly um, anchovy and mackerel, anchovy should, should at least be as, as high of priority as, as mackerel, um, and I, I, I think there is a lot of room and with some creative thinking to kind of manage those in a consistent way uh, based on this new framework in a, in a biennial cycle um, and, and reduce the need for frequent uh, assessments, again, uh, with, based on the recommendation from the, the science centers of moving toward uh, ATM direct uh, survey ap approach in management uh, rather than uh, these, these large work intensive and, and labor intensive assessments. So uh, I think in, the, in that context, for example, uh, moving to an update assessment for mackerel um, would actually be more work than, than simply using the ATM survey estimates directly and, 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 and the survey estimates would be much more responsive. So hopefully that answers, uh, answers your question and, and what, what you're getting at, but certainly agree uh, in terms of the need to prioritize and, and fit the management to the, the management needs. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. That was that was along the lines of what I was hoping to hear you elaborate on. So thank you. Any uh, further questions for Jeff Shuster? Uh, I'm not hearing any. Um, so that will conclude public comment and take us to council action. Let me uh, see if um, there's a desire for a break now or whether we should do that after we complete council action. I'll look for a show of hands asking for a break right now. All right, so we'll take a break. It's 9.43. We'll come back at 9.55 and take up uh, action on H2 and then go to H3. So we'll be back at 9.55.
When I got out of high school, I jumped on dad's rig and it just gets in your blood. And I didn't have a problem getting up and going to work every morning. I enjoyed being on the water. And when I found that the fishing regulations were so complicated, I was angry. It is really frustrating to not have a say in what is happening to you. It's not just will the fish live or die, it's will the fishermen live or die. Well, why is this happening, or why is this, or why is that, or they just want to shut it down and... Am I going to be able to survive? It's hard. I first heard about MRAP from two fishermen. Got a hold of me and said, hey, I've got this great opportunity for you. It's a program that, that's by and for fishermen. I was very skeptical going into that meeting and uh, very enlightened coming out. MRAP gives you the recipe. Where does the data come from? How do people use the data, the laws, and the steps that one goes through to translate into a regulation? I was afraid of the rulemaking process, but I think they listened to what everyone there had to say, including myself. MREP was really helpful in how I can be an active participant in the management of my fishery. When I got out of high school, I jumped on dad's rig and it just gets in your blood. I didn't have a problem getting up and going to work every morning. I enjoyed being on the water. And when I found that the fishing regulations were so complicated, I was angry. It is really frustrating to not have a say in what is happening to you. It's not just will the fish live or die, it's will the fishermen live or die. Well, why is this happening, or why is this, or why is that, or they just want to shut it down, and... Am I going to be able to survive? It's hard. I first heard about MRAP from two fishermen. Got a hold of me and said, hey, I've got this great opportunity for you. It's a program that, that's by and for fishermen. I was very skeptical going into that meeting, and uh, very enlightened coming out. MRAP gives you the recipe. Where does the data come from? How do people use the data, the laws, and the steps that one goes through to translate into a regulation? I was afraid of the rulemaking process, but I think they listened to what everyone there had to say, including myself. MREP was really helpful in how I can be an active participant in the management of my fishery.
All right, welcome back. We are uh, to the action portion of agenda item H2. And we will uh, bring up our council action here on the screen in a moment. There it is, adopt the assessment, uh, select the metrics, and uh, adopt uh, incidental catch allowances. So let's first see if there's any discussion on this agenda item. And once we've had an opportunity for any discussion, we'll uh, see if someone has a motion and then move forward from there. Brianna Brady. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just wanted to express my uh, appreciation to the stat, Kevin Hill and Juan, for completing the catch-only projection. Um, I'm supportive of what the CPS management team has laid out in their report for the next two-year cycle for Pacific mackerel management at this point. Thanks. Thank you, Brianna. Any further discussion? Corey Niles. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. And um, uh, a question maybe for um, for National Marine Fisheries Service, the Science Center. Um, I think, I think, yeah, like Brianna, I think um, is supportive of, of what we're hearing from our advisors here, but thinking about the future and the difference between update assessments and catch only projections and if memory serves um the uh, catch projection was kind of was recommended i think as a way of of saving workload in terms of uh pressures uh, on the science center so I, I, um if 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 they're available and had thoughts um on 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 how that has worked, the catch projection versus 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 doing update assessments, and if they had any any thought at this point. To me, I think I'm keep hearing a a, a bigger need to have a, a place for the council and, and the science center and public everyone to weigh in on on assessment priorities, and how we spend these, um, how we recommend assessment uh, resources are spent. Um, but just yeah, thinking of taking opportunity now to hear if, if there were thoughts from from the science center on on that that the difference between an update and catch projections on this for this stock in particular. All right, we'll look for a hand from the science center to respond to your question. Or maybe someone from NIMPS, someone else from NIMPS. Um, this is Frank. So I'm just wondering, is the direct question, what are the differences between a catch-only assessment versus doing an update assessment? Is that the question you're, you want an answer for? Corey? You got to find that mute button, Corey. <laughs> Thank you. I was talking there to myself, um, having problems with the mute button this meeting. Thank you, Frank. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, and yeah, if if there, if if no response is is it, this could be a question for the for the the future, but you know, I, not what what the difference is in terms of what is done, you know, which one involves what work each involves, but. Just on the if there were reactions that the science center had to the, to the reports we've heard on the um, what is the difference in terms of their workload um, and, and yeah I mean, a question for for the longer term but it was just if there were responses now I'd, I'd be interested in hearing them um, I believe the council's intent again in recommending a catch projection was to save save that time um, and what we're hearing from SSC from the public from the team that maybe the updates would would be a better way of going um but again i think the council's intent was to save save some work 
save some time and just general reactions to that as Frank was what I was looking for. But again, they're, they're, I think I'm seeing a need for, for these topics to come up in the near future at another meeting. So don't want to put anyone on the spot, but was just curious if there were reactions to that. Mr. Chair, this is Kristen. I can respond. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Corey. Um, and just at a high level, I don't have a specific response to that, but just in listening to the conversations this morning, I think I, I really do appreciate the, the teams and the council's um, efforts to try to look for ways to um, decrease the workload on the Science Center staff, but yet get the council what they need in the form of <clears throat> trying to come up with um, different ways to um, uh, sort of titrate the uh, the updates versus um, full benchmarks uh, uh, versus, versus catch-only projections. I don't have a good answer for what the right recipe is among the CPS stocks in terms of uh, timelines for each and what the appropriate um, level of assessment should be for, for each of the stocks within the CPS complex. Um, but that's certainly something that I think, you know, I can take back to the division and we can have a, a conversation on, on that vis-a-vis -vis our um, sort of stated timelines for stock assessments um, going forward and see whether or not um, adjustments need to be made or can be made. Um, and we're happy to come back to the council with that. Um, but I do think we have a, a stated calendar of, um, of uh, stock assessments planned for the future um, and any adjustments to that, that, that uh, based on some of the conversations that have gone on, we can bring back to the council at a, a later date. Thank you, appreciate it. All right, thank you for that, Kristen. Um, so looking for any further discussion or if someone has a motion uh, that will spur uh, some further focused discussion. Brianna Brady. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a motion. All right. Please go ahead. Um, Sandra, can you please display the first motion? Thank you. I move that the council approve the Pacific Mackerel catch only stock assessment for US management in 2021 and 2022 and 2022 to 2023. Adopt tables one and two in supplemental CPSMT report one. If the ACT is met, adopt a 45% incidental landing allowance when Pacific Mackerel are landed with other CPS, with an exception that up to three metric tons of Pacific mackerel per landing could be landed in non-CPS fisheries. Thank you, Brianna. Is the language on the screen accurate and complete? Yes, thank you. I'll look for a second. It looks like Bob Dooley has the second. Please speak to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We heard from the SSC that they approved the mackerel catch only stock assessment as the best available scientific information for setting management measures for the next two seasons. Um, as far as using a P star 0.45 that was recommended by the CPS management team and is consistent with previous council action. And in terms of the management measures, providing a 45% incidental catch allowance is consistent with what the industry needs on the water for the CPS advisory sub panel and the incidental allowance would not prevent them from fishing other CPS stocks. The three metric tons is to allow non-CPS CPS fisheries to take small amounts of mackerel if the need were to arise if the act is, the ACT is reached. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Brianna. Are there questions for Brianna or uh, is there any discussion on this motion? Corey Niles. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and just briefly, I thank you, Brianna, for the motion. Speaking in support here, I just also want to say, um, you know, as, as my question might have, as was getting to, I do, I do hear what what Oceana and Jeff are, are, are um, speaking to in terms of of the cut, the some of the downsides of doing catch project only projections, and then in in the SSC and team and AS others wanting perhaps something different. But for for here, yeah, this for this year and this motion supportive of this. Um, but again, I think we have some conversations to be had here in, in, in the fall, maybe about, about how we do CPS assessments generally. But yeah, thank you, Brianna. I, I just wanted to speak in support. Thank you, Corey. Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just had a question for the maker of the motion on item number three. Um, I don't have the information up in front of me here to allow me to, under, to understand what the, based on past catches uh, and given the uh, values that are, are being adopted, um, kind of what the relative chance of meeting the ACT uh, is based on the past performance and landings that we've seen of Pacific macro in the fishery. Brianna. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Phil, for the question. Uh, recently, in the near term, the chances are fairly low. If you look further back in history, the chances could be higher. So I think it's finding a good balance. Okay, thanks, Brianna. Uh, any further discussion on Brianna's motion? Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks, Brianna, for the motion. <clears throat> I'm just curious, does this, uh, I, I notice in the CPSAS report that there's a recommendation for the in-season check-ins. Does that something later, or how does that fit into this? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, uh, Bob, for the question. Um, this motion does not include that. Uh, the CPSAS recommendation suggested March, which is typically not a meeting that CPS appears on. Um, but I, I don't know why that would need to be in a motion. I think things could be raised if, if there really is a need later. Thank you for that. Thanks, Bob, for the question. Any further questions of Brianna or discussion on the motion? I'm not seeing any further hands. I will call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Brianna. Brianna, do you have a further motion? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, well, I guess just to follow up on the discussion points that Corey made about um, what are the next steps for mackerel, and given that SSC statement where they recommend um, an update assessment rather than a catch projection. And then also trying to find the balance of, you know, finding time to do an MSC to move mackerel to a, a whole different type of approach for management. Um, I'm wondering if in the near term, the council would be supportive of changing the catch only projection to an actual update assessment. And if so, do we need to have a motion for that or if it's just general guidance that the council can provide if everyone were to be nodding their heads yes around the table? Yeah, I don't think we need a motion on that um, as long as there is a consensus around the table. Um, and because we're not physically in the same room and we can't see nodding heads, I, I guess I would ask 
uh, if anyone uh, disagrees with that, uh, for them to raise their hand. And I'm not seeing any hands, so I think that is the consensus of the council. Thank you, Brianna. Frank Lockhart. I waited, so I wasn't, I didn't want to be disagreeing, but um, uh, I think, um, yeah, I think Kristen, in answering Corey's question, talked about having some discussions with her staff about this. And so, uh, given that that's going to happen, I think that, um, you know, we can come back at, at some future date and, and talk about this in more detail. So, that was it. All right. Thanks for that, Frank. Let me ask uh, the council if there's any further action or discussion on this agenda item, H2. Carrie, how are we doing? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Well, I think you've completed your business uh, under this agenda item. So if there's no other guidance or discussion, um, I think we got it settled. You set um, uh, harvest specs and management measures for the next two um, Pacific mackerel fishing, fishing years and have given some guidance uh, or expressed a desire to have an update assessment rather than these catch only projection estimates. And it sounds like the center and NIMS will uh, huddle and um, at some point, um, you know, circle back to the council on that because it does obviously affect their, uh, you know, staffing and resources. But anyway, uh, you have finished your business for this. All right, thanks very much, Kerry. And with that, I will hand the virtual gavel to Vice Chair Pettinger for H. <coughs> Thank you, Chair Gorelnik, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, with that, we'll uh, go right back to Kerry to start us off with uh, H3. Kerry? Okay, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, this is agenda item H3 the management framework for the central subpopulation of Northern Anchovy. Um, I will give uh, a, a kind of a cursory overview and history. And um, as I'm sure you all know, there's a, a more detailed description of, you know, past meetings and um, sort of the, the um, you know, the activities that have, or actions that have led up to this agenda item. Um, but uh, just to give some of that background, um, at the April 2019 meeting, there was a white paper uh, uh, in the brief book materials on management and assessment of the central subpopulation of anchovy. Um, there's been interest for uh, quite a while in getting uh, an assessment and possibly consideration of new uh, harvest specifications um, for you know several years. Um, and the, you know, due to various reasons, staffing and, and data limitations, um, and just lack of uh, you know a clear uh, ability to do a data poor uh, assessment, that hasn't happened. However, as we also have um, heard, uh, there is a full benchmark assessment for this population of uh, or subpopulation um, scheduled for this fall, and um, so we'll be hearing about that later on in the meeting. Um, there was uh, also a report, a joint report in the November 2019 council meeting materials that was between the management team and the uh, SSC or members of the SSC and members of the management team. Um, and then the CPSMT was supposed to report back to the council at the April 2020 meeting, but the April 2020 meeting um, uh, was severely truncated because that was the uh, first cancellation or canceled or not canceled, but um, you know, virtual meeting during the pandemic. Uh, and so this was sidelined a little bit. Um, and so there's been a little bit of a delay, but uh, here we are back revisiting it. Um, as a reminder, uh, central subpopulation of Northern Anchovy, it's, it's classified as a monitored stock. Um, you know, there is a, a, a consideration scheduled for um, getting rid of management categories. That's uh, coming up next in November, but at least for right now, we're, we're managing um, in the same way we have been. So it's monitored and then there, so that means there's no hardwired uh, assessments or um, you know, management measures except um, you know, or regularly scheduled. Um, so this agenda item 
the purpose is to consider this framework. Uh, it applies triggers and mechanisms for determining when the CSNA stock should be assessed, whether uh, harvest management measures or reference pay, uh, points should be revised, et cetera. Um, the team has worked um, hard on this over the last several months and has um, had a lot of consult consultation with uh, the advisory panel and with the SSC um, to uh, do some modeling on um, you know on these ver on these parameters uh, there's a, um, a range of different um, values that could be selected and you see that the uh, the CPSMT has made some recommendations on which um, you know values um, as far as you know the frequency of um, uh, stock assessments and the frequency of or the triggers for um, you know some intervention uh, in between stock assessments happen. Um, so the the action here is uh, to consider the proposed management framework and flowchart and provide guidance uh, as necessary. Um, in your briefing book materials, you have um, the CPSMT reports one, um, which is the main report. It was in the advanced briefing book materials. And uh, report two is an errata statement um, clarifying a couple of the um, values related to the flow chart, which you'll hear more about in a moment. Um, and then there's a SSC report, supplemental report, and a CPSAS supplemental report. And then there's a fair bit of public comment on this one also. Um, Anticipating that, we have um, estimated this as, I think, three hours. We'll see uh, what kind of progress we can make through there. Um, and the agenda order, after my overview, is we'll go to the reports and comments of management entities and advisory bodies, starting with the CPSMT this time. And we'll go to public comment. And then again, the action is, um, is to review the proposed management framework and flowchart and provide guidance. Um, and see if there's anything I missed. I, th I think that uh, concludes my summary and overview. I can uh, take any questions now, or we could move on to the management team report. Uh, thank you, Kerry. Uh, questions for Kerry on his overview? Okay, seeing none, thanks, Kerry. With that, we'll go to the uh, CPS uh, management team, and uh, I believe uh, Greg Kruskowski is going to be giving a presentation, and. Uh, I believe he has Lorna Wargo waiting in the wings. So, um, Greg? I think Greg needs to be promoted to a panelist. That looks to be correct. And then he should be able to unmute himself. I still see him in the attendee list. Yeah, so um, Patricia or someone, uh, if you could promote Greg to a panelist, and he could do his report. I know somebody wields that power. I don't. Somebody does. Hey guys, this is Chris Kleinschmidt. Uh, Greg has been given a panelist invite because he's joining via web browser. And so he should be dialing in via telephone, which he was on earlier, but he dropped off right before this started. So uh -huh. we're, we're communicating with him via email. So just uh, stand by please. But it has nothing to do with promotion. It's just getting his phone connected. Thanks Chris for the, uh the update there. Hello. Chris Hello. Kruczkowski here. I just uh, had a little bit of a uh, technical difficulties in uh, getting off the meeting, but hopefully you guys can hear me now. 
We can, Greg. If uh, you're a little bit on the more the quieter side, so if you could uh, be a little louder, we should be good. How's that? Any better? You sound great. Okay. Um, I um, cannot. Uh, uh, I'm doing presentation for the coastal uh, species uh, management team. And uh, uh, and this is uh, on this uh, management framework for the central subpopulation of uh, northern anchovy. Next slide, please. So the basics, uh, we've got, here's an outline of the presentation. We've got a little bit of background information. Um, then I will go over what has become known as the flow chart, which is a prescriptive management framework um, that provides, uh, uh, we've got, uh, I'll go over some of the revisions that we've made to it since it was first presented back in uh, November of uh, 2019. Um, some of, and also the parameter uh, recommendations that the uh, management team has and uh, simplification of the uh, process that um, resulted from some of those parameter recommendations. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about uh, potential ways to implement it should the ch uh, council choose to move forward, as well as um, some other approaches for um, uh, potentially managing this stock and the fishery for it. Next slide, please. So in our uh, the CPSMT report one, there are three uh, documents that are highlighted. And this goes back as far as 2016. And although there are only three documents highlighted, um, there's, as the council's well aware, there's a lot of work that goes into getting something that goes to a report on the council floor. And, uh, you know, there was a workshop um, that, uh, um, and a report from that workshop that was presented in uh, September of 2016. Um, in November of 2016, the SSC um, gave a report on Northern Anchovy Assessments and Management Measures. And then there was a joint um, SSC and CPSMT report uh, on the uh, um, OFL process for the central subpopulation of northern anchovy that was uh, presented in April of uh, 2017. Next slide, please. And ultimately, this sort of moved forward to a uh, joint workshop um, with a number of the CPS uh, um, subcommittee members from the SSC, the, uh, some of the members from the management team, as well as some of the members from the advisory subpanel that was held in October down at the Southwest Fishery Science Center, October of 2019, that is. And then it was presented um, at uh, the uh, November meeting in, uh, of 2019. And the flowchart was a portion of that workshop, but it was actually a big portion of it. And it received uh, quite wide support from um, members of the public, from the uh, advisory bodies, um, but the management team also noted that there were some minor revisions that were needed to the uh, flow chart. There was uh, some uh, a section of it that was not clear on um, when the ABC would revert back to the default value or if it would stay at the uh, um, lower value if uh, a um, trigger had been hit and the ABC was lowered. And we also needed to provide specific parameter recommendations. I mean, there were thousands and thousands of model runs that were done by Dr. Andre Punt. And um, that actually just came out at that November meeting. And so the management team nor, uh, had just gotten a, uh, its first glance at it um, at that time. And so we weren't ready to provide specific parameter recommendations at that time. Next slide, please. So this is a picture of the original flowchart. 
And although it looks pretty darn complicated, um, and in some ways it sort of is, as many people have said that, it really was basically a three-step sort of process um, with uh, a top line that has a, a Y value, a middle line that has a Z value for updating the OFL, and then a uh, X value for you know um, looking at the short-term biomass. But the, the areas that are highlighted in yellow here were kind of where the unclear uh, that, that needed needed a little bit of clarification. So. Let's go to the uh, next slide, please. And this is the revised flow chart. And what you can see here is that that entire Z line has been eliminated. And the reason for that is that um, what the parameters that were set and uh, we selected um, a recommendation for eight years for doing assessments. And that is when the assessment would uh, occur. That um, is, uh, gives the Science Center time to plan for it. It also allows for um, the Science Center to prioritize other CPS-related work that uh, goes on in the interim. And the uh, assessment would then, um, it would update the EMSY and it would also update what's called the long-term biomass, and that would come out of the assessment. And our recommendation is that that be um, the arithmetic mean of the 10-year average that comes out of that uh, assessment. Um, and, of course, that would then set the, uh, um, the, the, the new OFL and the new default ABC, and those would be the default values for the you know, remaining eight years. But we do want to check in on the short-term biomass, and that comes in from the surveys. And every two years, X equals two, that's when we would check in on that short-term biomass. And we recommend that the short-term biomass be defined as a three-year arithmetic mean, sort of a rolling average, three-year average, um, of the survey biomass. And part of the reason for that is that the, um, uh, what, you, what we typically use is what is a mean value that comes out of those surveys. But if you look at the mean values, there is a wide confidence interval uh, between uh, on, on those uh, mean values. And so although you might have, uh, if you look at the last two, the, the, the mean values are, uh, are separated by, you know, a bit, but the overlap in the 95% confidence intervals, many statisticians would tell you that they are essentially the same number. So that's part of the reason for that. Also, two um, uh, points, you can always draw a line through, but really with three, um, you get a better idea of what the trend is. So every two years, you would check on that uh, short-term biomass. If it has dropped significantly and, um, and the uh, ABC that would result from that short-term biomass is um, more than 40% less than the or equal to 40 percent less than the uh, default ABC, then you would lower the ABC for the next two years to that lower value. And that is uh, essentially how that flowchart works. Now, there is another value down at the very bottom there that's in sort of in grayed out text that uh, has this X3 um, value. And that's really a way to check in to see how industry is doing and if they're catching all of that ABC or not. And if it's more than 90%, then something's probably changed with the fishery. Um, and it's a good idea to possibly check to see maybe there's more demand, maybe there's uh, different markets, um, uh, more efficiency in the fishery. 
but that's a good time to check and evaluate whether or not you need to do another assessment the following year. And you can evaluate that need by checking in and uh, with the uh, advisory subpanel and find out what's going on with the fishery. But you can also look at some of the ecosystem indicators that come to the council every March on things like uh, uh, forage and uh, how the uh, uh, ecosystem is doing in terms of uh, productivity and um, and how the birds are doing, how the marine mammals are doing, and all of that sort of stuff that is in that integrated ecosystem assessment. Next slide, please. So again, this is the CPSMT parameter recommendations. The Y and the Z are both equal to eight years, and that's the interval for the full assessments. Uh, for and and that's regardless of the uh, uh, the uh, any triggers that are hit in the meantime. Every two years, that's the interval for examining the short-term biomass from the uh, survey. The um, ABC buffer um, the the CPS management team um, did not see any reason to change that uh, ABC buffer. That 0.25, that's essentially a 75% reduction from the OFL. And that was one of the biggest things that helps prevent um, overfishing uh, based on the analysis that, that Dr. Punt did. The X2, um, that is greater than 40% uh, reduction from the default ABC. That's the threshold for uh, reducing the ABC in, re in response to a, uh, a low short-term biomass. That X3 trigger, again, that's uh, greater than or equal to 90%. That's the threshold for ABC attainment to trigger that evaluation for the need uh, for a new assessment in the off years, okay? And then again, we're, we recommend defining the uh, long-term biomass as 10-year average uh, that comes out of the stock assessment and the short-term biomass a three-year um, average um, coming out of the uh, survey results. Next slide, please. So here's the basics of the process. I mean, although the, comp the, the chart looks kind of complicated, it's really pretty darn simple. Every eight years, you conduct a model-based assessment. You determine the OFL uh, and the, uh, you know, based on the average long-term biomass over the last 10 years that come out of the assessment, you set your default ABC through the formula, and those are the default management values for the next eight years. Every two years, you determine if the short-term biomass from the survey triggers an ABC reduction from that default ABC or not. And you also then examine uh, catch attainment um, in the, uh, uh, and is it greater than 90%? And if, you know, the answer is yes, then you evaluate whether or not you need um, a, a new assessment um, the, the next year if that catch attainment is up. But the uh, uh, short-term ABC is, uh, if you hit that trigger, it's down for two years. The next time you evaluate it, if it's not below that trigger, it goes back to the default ABC and comes back up. Next slide, please. So this is what it looks like graphically. And this is a hypothetical example. And it's based on, uh, and it shows you ABC values on the Y axis there. And it shows you the short-term biomass on the X axis. And you can see with this particular um, uh, example, and the hypothetical here is that you've got um, a long-term biomass average of 500,000 metric tons. That gives you an OFL of 119,500 metric tons. That is the value that would be in place for eight years. The default ABC that comes out of that is the uh, blue line that is uh, at the top there, and it's written down as 29,875 metric tons. 
the trigger point is in this particular one for short-term biomass is anything equal to or less than 300,000 metric tons. If it were 300,001 metric ton, it would stay at the default ABC. But if it's at 300,000 metric tons, it would drop down to, you can see that little uh, dotted uh, uh, dashed orangish line that goes over to the ABC there. And it looks like it's just about 18,000 uh, metric tons. But it might fall anywhere on that uh, diagonal blue line that goes down to the origin there or to the zero, zero point, depending on what the um, uh, short-term biomass comes out as. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about potential ways to implement the uh, flowchart. Um, certainly information can go into the safe document. That is prepared annually and it's reviewed annually and it provides the best available science on the stocks and the fisheries. So essentially the information that uh, we would uh, um, have would go into that safe document. I guess one thing that I forgot to mention was that in the interim years between the two-year points when the uh, um, council would look at the short-term biomass, those numbers are very simple arithmetic, and the management team will, would, of course, look at it and be you know, uh, anticipating to see how things are going. Um, and that information could also go into the safe document there. The other thing for implementation is modifying COP uh, 9, Schedule 3. That's the Council Operating Procedure that provides information about stock assessments, and uh, Schedule 3 deals with CPS. So you would add the assessment schedule for the uh, central subpopulation of northern anchovy at every eight years, and also you could add that short-term biomass review um, for, the, for any potential ABC changes on the two-year basis. Of course, um, it could also go into uh, an FMP amendment, and all, and those are not by any means, uh, all mutually exclusive, but those are um, potential ways to implement. Next slide, please. So some additional considerations. Um, one thing that could be considered is changing the uh, fishing year um, to July 1 to June 30th. The current fishing year is the calendar year. And the summer survey results, we contacted uh, folks at the Southwest Fishery Science Center to find out when those would be available for us to look at and evaluate, and they said by February. And um, that would then support uh, this coming up on the council floor every two years um, to look at that ABC trigger in April. And um, so the, the consideration here is should you change the uh, fishing year to start on July 1 to be a little bit closer to when you're getting that information from the last summer? Otherwise, if you wait until January, which is the current fishing year, you will already have a new summer survey. And uh, the following month in February, you'll get the information about that last summer survey. So you have to think about whether or not it's uh, worth changing the uh, fishing year. Next slide, please. So one other thing that the council will need to consider is that you're going to need to have some level of flexibility. There's a variety of things that can happen. Ships break down. You may not get a survey. Um, I've seen the government shut down at times, and that has impacted both the ability for the council to meet, uh, for um, people to do work to get uh, assessments done, or for ships and surveys to go out. Um, there's also the possibility of uh, uh, worldwide pandemics. We're certainly not quite over uh, with this one. And who knows what else can come up. Next slide. Sorry about the phone ringing in the background. Okay, there are some additional ways uh, that 
approaches that we considered as well. Um, you could set assessment schedule to periodically update the long-term OFL if that's the primary consideration uh, that the council wants to look at. And it's similar to the Y row in the flow chart or adopting the Y row in the flow chart. And we recommended that that be done every eight years. Um, the uh, another possibility is if the council is primarily worried about the um, uh, uh, short term biomass dropping um, below a certain level, um, you could do something similar to the X row in the flow chart or adopt the X row sort of uh, thing and set um, you could set it at a single year trigger or at multi year triggers um, threshold levels. And that's we recommended using a, a three-year average there. And then you could do something much uh, that is uh, a bit different than the flow chart and um, more like active management that is done for Pacific Mastral with a full assessment every four years and a catch-only projection assessments uh, done at interim two-year um, periods. And next slide, please. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Greg. Questions for Greg? Yes. Questions for Greg? Corey Niles. Corey? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Greg. And yeah, thank you for summarizing to you and the team for summarizing that in a presentation. I guess something I, I was curious about. And you're, I think you're, one of your last slides there, you mentioned other ways of possibly doing this. And I might have a couple questions here. But yeah, what, and you may have heard me ask this under the last agenda item. But what, what would the difference between mackerel and anchovy be in terms of we were hearing under the last agenda item that at least our current preference is to do an assessment every four years? in that we were talking about update our catch only projection every two years, but for what reason would we want to do Pacific macro more frequently than anchovy? Do you think, can you help me think through that one a little more? Well, Pacific macro has been, um, a, it was decided years ago that that, uh, stock was more, uh, was of higher priority than, um, than the central subpopulation of northern anchovy. If the council feels that that is different, then, you know, it's uh, that could be moved to, um, you know, a different category of management. Um, that was taken up back in 2013, and it was decided not to do it at that time, but to um, move to uh, a longer term between the uh, benchmark assessments and to do update or actually um, catch only projection uh, assessments uh, in that interim um, two year period. So that is currently what is called active management for um, that stock. Um, so that is, you know, sort of the, the bigger difference. It doesn't have that longer term OFL that uh, um, that that uh, central subpopulation of northern anchovy has, and we're essentially retaining that longer term um, OFL um, with the uh, flowchart uh, management the way it's set up. Now, does that help answer your question, Corey? Yeah, thanks, Greg. So I'm not here, and there's not anything necessarily inherent in the in the biology of the two species that would call for uh, it's more past procedure dec decisions made by the council and others. I think anchovy live a little bit uh, uh, shorter period and and uh, may mature a little bit more quickly than uh, Pacific mackerel, but um, they are somewhat you know similar in some ways, but their range is is also considerably different. With Pacific mackerel, the vast majority seem to be uh, down south, um, and uh, um, whereas that is not. Uh, necessarily the case with um, uh, uh, 
central subpopulation of northern anchovy with uh, a lot of them being um, in U.S. waters much of the time. Okay. Corey, your hand's still up. You, yeah, I think I have another question, but I'll see if Phil has his hand up. I will, I'll hold off and see if uh, I may ask another one. Okay. Phil Anderson. Phil? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks, Greg. Um, on slide 10, I believe it is, um, there was the uh, potential pathways to implement the flowchart. And uh, at least in the conversations that I've been a part of, which I admittedly are not very many, um, but the primary focus, I guess, of ways to implement it provide, you know, it has been either either a um, from putting it in, in the COP9 as, as the second bullet suggests or an FMP amendment or maybe some combination of those things, particularly um, that the FMP takes more time and that I think there's probably some arguments as to why um, moving through that potential pathway um, makes sense on a slower, slower approach. But uh, on the safe document bullet, um, I guess I'm trying to think through how, you know, how it would be um, memorialized, if you will, uh, by uh, putting it into the safe document, which is as the sub bullets um, suggest that, you know, prepared and reviewed annually. Um, and so it seems like it uh, may be a less kind of affirmative uh, way uh, to, to implement and make the flow chart um, a part of the process uh, and approach uh, for anchovies. And I just, so I hadn't really thought about the safe document piece, and I just wondered if you could expand on that. Yeah, thank you for the question, um, Phil. Yes, the nail on the head. There was a time when the SAFE document was actually presented to the council on a um, more regular basis um, many years ago. And uh, um, currently it is available and the council, you know, of course, reviews it and looks at it in great detail, I'm sure. Um, but it's uh, it wouldn't be an agenda item per se, as it would be if it were in the uh, uh, that COP. Um, and you know, the the management team would would be left with, oh, hey, we think that this is going to, you know, there, we've seen something that is problematic. I mean, if there's no problems, then just putting it in the safe. Uh, if you don't have a short-term biomass change and it hasn't uh, um, uh, triggered a, a change to the ABC, then that's no problem. Everything's just fine and the information is there and everyone can look at it. But if, on the other hand, you do get that uh, short-term biomass drop and uh, you have to make changes to the ABC, the management team would have to come forward and, and uh, try to get something scheduled on the um, council agenda. And that's why there's advantages to putting it into the COP um, itself there. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, uh, through, the, through the vice chair. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much for that. I was, yeah, I was, thinking about when you said that you're assuming that all the council members are carefully looking at those state documents annually and reviewing them. Um, I, um, I might be an exception to that, but I, I, I have to admit I don't look at them very carefully as a matter of practice. So, um, but again, I think uh, the importance to me is if we're going to to modify our approach here, um, 
understanding that there are some things that we're going to learn as we go. And so there's some flexibility needed in some places uh, that we modify it and put it into our uh, operating procedures and or some combination of that and potentially an FMT amendment would be important because as we know, the council composition changes over time and and uh, so to have things that are clear and written down as to how we're going to operate, I think is uh, very important from a process perspective and just kind of a under general understanding of ensuring people know what we're doing and why and, and the rationale behind it. So again, I very much appreciate all the work that's been done in preparing um, the flow chart and, and the framework. Uh, and in particular, calling out the uh, the change that was made uh, since the the original one or one of the original ones was first formatted and thought through. So, uh, thanks for being here today and and explaining this to us in a very thorough way. Thank you, Thank Phil. you Mr. Anderson. Um, further questions for Greg? Uh, Corey Niles, Corey. Thanks, thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Greg. Yeah, and echoing Phil's uh, gratitude here for for the work and the ideas. And like you you said a couple of times, well, it might look complicated, but it isn't all isn't as complicated as you think. But I guess I'm still having some some uh, still working through it in my my head here. And in terms of you, you also referred to this as a prescriptive approach, which I have to uh, admit that I'm. I'm skeptical of prescriptive approaches in terms of, you know, it, when you decide something ahead of time, how it should happen, then you then you better have pretty have a good idea that you thought through all the possibilities and, and the risks ahead of, you know, to do a better job than you could in the moment, taking into, into consideration all, all the information, all the circumstances, weighing some criteria, and then and then, you know, being smarter than you were when you, than you would have, you know, trying to decide something five years ahead of time. So maybe if you could switch, uh, switch the slide to number nine here, and I'm just gonna talk just because I'm just trying to still figure out how this happens. And the in the scenario I have in mind is the one we were worried about a few years ago when we didn't have in a, a much of we didn't have a routine estimate of the biomass and, and some information, some evidence was that it was crashing. And, uh, and also there was the interest in the fishery from in, in harvesting more at the same time, we just didn't have the science. So in, in one, in some, this is going to be an improvement, of course, in having a, a better, more, more science to have these discussions on. But so looking at this, we're saying we did an assessment and it turned out that the, the we have an OFL, you know, the long-term biomass was 500,000 metric tons. And so, you know, our, our ABC is very precautionary. It's in, in this ABC would be very precautionary in terms of being only a fourth of what that OFL would be. So I guess I just not, not fully understanding why, you know, why we would necessarily want to redo things if the short-term biomass estimate drops to 300,000 metric tons, when that ABC was, is still looks really precautionary compared to that, um, and why we wouldn't look to maybe something more like the, a cutoff type approach, what we have with sardine and even mackerel. Um, anyway, so I'm just I'm trying to think through this, looking at this, and if you had any responses, yeah, why? What would be the purpose of if if we still think biomass with decent certainty is 300,000 metric tons and our ABC is a tenth of that, you know, why would that automatically say we should redo it? You know, if we have, whole, if we want to do mackerel instead, sardine instead, have other priorities and we have new information. So yeah, why the prescriptive approach, um, you know, you know, why 300,000 and sorry, that's a lot. Just trying to say, like, trying to think through this and any reactions you had, Greg would help me help me understand better the thinking here. Thank you for the question, uh, um, Corey. Um, the the concept was that um, you know we wanted uh, you know the priorities were to be able to provide some level of stability for the. Um, 
for the fishery and industry, um, but also to we we do know that um, you know the stock can change and fairly rapidly. And yes, three hundred thousand. That's just the trigger point. And essentially, you're uh, you know with a change in just the ABC, what you're doing is you're um, uh, putting in a change for two years and to see whether or not the stock continues on a downward trend or not. Um, and so it is indeed fairly prescriptive. Uh, it is, uh, that that was um, you know part of the uh, concern. There have been concerns raised. I mean, we've been talking about this since uh, 2016. Um, and yes, there are other uh, other ways of going about it. This is the way that uh, you know uh, this large group of people who um, did a lot of looking at it and thinking about it uh, came up with as uh, being um, a viable way to uh, manage it in, um, in in a responsible way that would be responsive to drops in uh, that short-term biomass over time. And uh, again, if it were to fall somewhere, you know, in the middle uh, there, down below 200,000 uh, metric tons, all of a sudden with that short-term biomass, you'd be dropping the, um, you know, the ABC for the next two years uh, down to about uh, 10,000. And that is indeed a very large buffer from that 10-year average. And, you know, the stock can bounce back, but it might not bounce back. And so I, I guess it's partly to um, make sure that they have the opportunity to bounce back to that longer term uh, average. And I hope that answers your question. Okay. Uh, Bob Dooley, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And thanks, Greg, for the presentation. I have to admit right off the bat that some of this is pretty far over my head, but I just had a basic question, I believe. We've heard a lot of, you know, I read through all the documents and a lot of debate on the uh, ATM survey methodology. It looks like the SSC points out a bunch of that in industry concerns at the bottom of their report, but uh, ATM estimates for the two years uh, check-in, the advisory panel is asking for multiple indices to look at this because there's a lot of doubt in the, in the, you know, the accurateness and the validity of that, of that ATM survey. So I, I guess the question for you, did you consider multiple indices when coming up with a biomass for the two-year check-in? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Dooley. Um, that was, it, it's a very good question. And we did think about uh, when we had that joint uh, workshop or, or, or meeting, um, we thought about, we looked at all of the available indices that we have. That includes the juvenile rockfish survey. I guess they have a different sort of name for that these days. I can't, I'm sorry, I don't remember it off the top of my head. Um, but we felt that the ATM survey, and it was said at the time that the ATM survey with the nearshore correction is the best uh, indication that we have right now of biomass. And there are other things that could be uh, looked at in the future. Um, we also said, said that the the um, egg, uh, uh, the DEPM method was also an acceptable uh, method um, that has been developed and is accepted um, that could be used and give us an indication. The issue, of course, is that if you're going to trigger something, um, it has not been defined, and, and I did not see in that uh, advisory subpanel um, report the method that they suggest that those be integrated with each other or averaged together, and if you weight one more than the other or that sort of stuff. So. That would take a bit more um, looking at and doing um, to be able to do that. And, um, you know, there have been pretty uh, good improvements in the ATM survey over the years. The Southwest Fishery Science Center is doing more and more all the time to make that uh, 
uh, survey better. And, uh, you know, certainly the coefficient of variation has come down considerably, uh, as well as the 95% intervals have, have narrowed over time. If you look at what they have for uh, central subpopulation of anchovy, it goes back to 2016. And it's, it's amazing how much, um, the, how much more precise those uh, have become over time. So I hope that uh, answers your question. Yeah, thank you, Greg. It does. It does answer the question pretty well. I just I'm always concerned that we've heard a continuous concern about from the industry about the uh, um, about the validity of that, and 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 it calls into question. It would seem like we would continue to try to uh, consider all all of the indices to to help make an informed decision with the best science of, available. So. Um, I would hope we, you know, we move to that direction rather than lock something into one one method only. Thanks, Bob. Uh, further questions for Greg? Okay. Seeing none, thank you, Greg. Uh, great uh, presentation. Um, next up is the uh, SSC and uh, Galen Johnson. Galen. Great, thank you. This is Galen Johnson uh, of the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission, and I will be reading the SSC report on the management framework for the central subpopulation of northern anchovy. Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team member Gregory Kutzkowski presented a summary of the CPSMT report on the proposed management framework for the central subpopulation of the northern anchovy. The report includes revisions to the flowchart that details the management framework and describes potential ways to implement the management framework. <laughs> The SSC endorses the framework as an improvement on the status quo. The SSC also notes that there are some caveats and ongoing research needs that deserve further research and consideration. These are addressed below. The SSC discussed the need for further work on a management strategy evaluation as the 2018 acoustic trial methodology review stated that performing an MSC for CSNA was necessary before using the ATM survey to inform management decisions as proposed in this framework. The SSC SSC agreed that although future work on an MSC would be useful to further explore potential biases and uncertainty, species composition, target strength, fish behavior, near shore correction, et cetera, in the surveyed index of abundance, it is not required as the essential elements of an MSC have now been completed for CSNA. The parameters used to inform the 2019 simulations might merit updating based on the results of a full assessment. The question of the time, a question of the timely availability of data relative to the start of the fishing management year was raised. The proposed change of the fishing year start date to July 1st would allow for more rapid responses to survey biomass estimates expected to be available by February for review and potential adoption at the April Council meeting. Changing the fishing year start date under this approach depends on the Southwest Fisheries Science Center workload and the feasibility to have a completed assessment that includes the most recent survey estimate available for adoption at the April Council meeting. This would primarily be an issue in years when a full assessment was required, but unanticipated delays and processing survey data could be an issue in non-assessment years. This would be less of an issue if the survey data were available before the end of the calendar year. An alternative start date between July 1st and January 1st might help to better align the availability of data in order to complete the assessment. Finally, the SSC recommends that a stock assessment is done prior to implementing the approach outlined in the framework to ensure that the EMSY value is based on the most current data. Some other parameters in the framework could change once the new assessment is done, since the information used to parameterize simulations and forming the CPSMT's proposed parameters for the framework is from a very outdated assessment. Also, the SSC recommends that the framework short-term biomass be based on survey biomass estimates directly using the already endorsed ATM surveys and one of the inshore correction approaches described previously. Uncertainties in the ATM survey biomass estimate, including but not limited to nearshore biomass, should remain a priority for further research and refinement. And that concludes our statement. Thank you, Galen. Uh, question for Galen on the uh, SSC report. Uh, Corey Niles. Corey? 
Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Galen. Uh, on that last paragraph of yours, on this this changing parameters, we're, we're looking at this uh, the flow chart here that which has you know different different numbers in it, numbers of years, thresholds of when to when to uh, change ABCs, do an assessment, that kind of thing. So, okay, on what you mean by parameters in that last paragraph? Yeah, and we haven't had an anchovy assessment in in decades. Um, but can you, can you elaborate a little bit more on what might might change? Um, what just explain a bit more what that means in terms of what the new assessment might change, and and how the council might how that might affect what we're we're talking about here with this with this flow chart. Sure, um, I'm actually going to look to Andre Punt, who graciously offered to be here for questions. Thanks, Galen. Um, hopefully people can hear me. Uh, this is Andre Pant uh, from the University of Washington. Um, yeah, so uh, Corey, that's a, that's a great question. Um, the parameters that we would be most concerned about uh, as needing updating uh, are the parameters that form the basis for the management strategy evaluation. Um, and those are things like, in, in simple terms, uh, the, the natural mortality rate. Um, uh, it's certainly been speculated that natural mortality is higher today than it was in 1995 when the last assessment was completed. Uh, we want to look at the growth parameters um, and all of that then feeds into essentially the productivity of the population. Um, I can't remember the exact meeting, it's too many meetings ago, but uh, we did, or I did, an analysis looking at stock and recruitment, um, and that directly uh, affects the productivity of the population and its variability, so how much uh, the population would vary, even if there was no fishing. Um, those feed into the MSC, uh, and the MSC essentially gives you the relative risk uh, between the different options. And, and um, obviously, you've seen one of the options that um, we examined. Uh, I think there were thousands of different combinations of Ys and Zs and Xs and Qs. Um, but in particular, the Q, the risk associated with different Q parameters does depend on the underlying biology and variability. Um, and that's what could change given uh, the results of the the, um, the assessment, which, as as you know, as Galen pointed out, is is very out of date um, compared to uh, many of the other stocks for which we have assessments. I hope that helps. Cool. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, very good. Um, for the questions for the SSE. Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Galen. That takes us to. Um, CPS uh, AS report and uh, David Crabb. David, welcome. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, for the record, my name is David Crabb and I'll be reading from agenda item H3A, Supplemental CPS AS Report 1, um, dated June 2021. Uh, for this agenda item, the Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel reviewed the Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team report on management framework for the central subpopulation of Northern Anchovy and its related documents. We also joined the Scientific and Statistical Committee webinar to hear a presentation from CPSMT member Greg and listen to his SSC discussion regarding the team's rationale for its recommendations. The CPSAS thanks the CPSMT for its extensive work to develop a conceptual management framework and flowchart for CSNA. We appreciate the CPSMT's fourth thought in suggesting a path forward that considers both anchovy conservation and industry stability. The CPSAS supports this approach. We also recognize that all the work modeling, uh, all the work modeling and analysis by the CPSMT and SSC strive to achieve consistency in light of the variable population dynamics of CSNA. The report of the joint meeting of the SSC CPS subcommittee, CPSMT and CPSAS in October 2019 stated, an ideal management scheme would be implemented, implement changes when necessary, but not more frequently than necessary. The frequency of changes should be balanced by the objectives of limiting both conservation risk and disruption to the fishery. CPSMT report one stated that the CPSMT 
kept in mind the modeling assumption that the entire acceptable biological catch was taken by the fishery each year resulted in an overestimation of the conservation related statistics in the modeling results because the fishery has not reached the level of ABC attainment. This was also noted by both Dr. Andre Punt in his November 2019 report and by SS by the SSC report. Um, in which the SSC cautions that the values for the performance statistics in agenda item D4 attachment 2 November 2019 should be interpreted in a relative sense rather than treating them as absolute estimates. In our November 2019 statement, we stated that the CPSAS can support the flow chart developed and analyzed at the October 2019 meeting as helpful information to provide guidance for conducting stock assessments and updates to overfishing limit and ABC. But a majority could not support a rigid application of the framework at that time. Since that time, the CPSMT has developed recommendations for parameters, for parameters to fill in the flow chart based both on statistical considerations and practicality, including workload management. We offered the following comments, concerns, and suggestions. The CPSMT settled on a definition of long-term biomass as 10 years and short-term biomass as three years. The, uh, the biomass long-term would be generated from stock assessments and biomass short-term would be a rolling three-year average computed from CPS acoustic trawl method surveys with a nearshore correction factor or nearshore ATM surveys, which are preferred. The flow chart called for recalculation of the new biomass short-term every two years and a reduction in ABC of biomass short-term fell at least 40% below the existing ABC. The CPSAS appreciates consideration of the need for the fishery stability in setting the long-term biomass. We also agree the CPSMT rationale that a three-year rolling average is appropriate to reduce the noise and extra workload that would occur with annual or even biannual adjustments. A majority can support a three-year rolling average short-term biomass, but only if the short-term assessment considers multiple indicators in addition to ATM surveys, such as cow Cal Coffee DEPM surveys, aerial surveys, not again, um, and potential for those surveys not to run in some years has occurred in 2020. Uh, let me make sure I'm in the right spot here. Okay. Uh, Rockfish juveniles, as well as trends identified in annual integrated ecosystem assessments reports. We recommend consideration of multiple indices, both in light of shortcomings identified in methods reviews of ATM surveys and that potential for those surveys to not run in some years, as occurred in 2020. The California anchovy fishery takes place in a relatively small area as close to the harbor as possible, and only larger anchovies are... Oh, sorry. Um, the California Ancho, uh, let's see, ATM sort of potentially not to run some years and occurred in 2020. The California anchovy fishery takes place in a relatively small area as close to the harbor as possible, and only larger anchovies are marketable. Fishery landings have not approached the ABC since the reduction fishery declined in the early 1980s. If the anchovy population is low or other CPS are available, the probability is that fishermen will not be targeting anchovy. The model shows that there is almost no difference in results among the three choices for why, the frequency for conducting stock assessments. So the CPSMT recommended an eight-year schedule for stock assessments and updates to OFL. The two parameters should be linked because it would be inappropriate to revise an OFL independent of a stock assessment. The CPSAS agrees that eight years is a reasonable period in light of the additional recommendations, including retaining the current Q at 25%, which was originally intended as a precautionary measure to offset infrequent stock assesses and the two year check-in to consider the short-term biomass and change the ABC if necessary. The management team saw no reason to change the current buffer between OFL and ABC. 
Q equals 0.25. This very large buffer is acknowledged to provide for a low risk overfishing based on modeling results, CPSMT report one. The CPSAS notes that this ultra conservative approach complements CPSMT's recommendation and supports supports parameters that provide as much flexibility as possible in developing a management framework for CSNA, such as the eight-year assessment, OFL schedule, and 0.4 as a trigger to adjust ABC in the short term. The CPSMT report suggests it may be worth considering making a change of the fishing year to a July 1, June 30th season, paralleling sardine and Pacific mackerel. The CPSMT further suggests the possibility of a regular council agenda item in April in conjunction with the sardine assessment. The CPSAS could support a change in seasonal start date, but if the council approved that change, we suggest a June council meeting as more appropriate to discuss anchovy as needed. A June council schedule would provide time to consider the use of the IEA report which is presented to the council in March and would allow more time to incorporate additional indices such as the spring Cal coffee DEPM survey and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife Aerial Survey into the assessment of both short-term and long-term abundance. The CPS MT report provided suggestions for how this framework information could be incorporated into the management process. For example, an eight-year framework to conduct assessments and update OFL could simply be included in the stock assessment priorities framework, and the two-year check-in could be incorporated into the SAFE document with recommendations for update, following flowchart parameters made only as needed rather than having a defined, explicit, and rigid biannual management framework. The CPSAS can support a flexible framework that considers both anchovy and uh, anchovy conservation and industry stability. The key word is flexibility. A majority can support the man management team's suggestion to plug in the eight-year anchovy stock assessment, OFL frequency, into the state stock assessment priority framework and have the management team check in on anchovy status on biennial schedule via the SAFE document. The flowchart concept could be incorporated into the SAFE document as a guideline, and the CPSMT could signal a need to address the council to implement changes only when necessary, but not more frequently than necessary. A majority of the CPSAS see no need for another FMP amendment in light of the small size of the anchovy fishery coupled with the current and proposed highly precautionary management policies, nor can we support a rigid framework with biennial biennial regulatory specifications. We could envision in the FMP a statement that the objective as stated in the joint report as an ideal management scheme would implement changes when necessary, but not more frequently than necessary. The frequency of changes should be balanced by objectives of limiting both conservation risk and disruption to the fishery. Agenda item D4, attachment one, November 2019. Along with a simple statement describing that stock assessments and OFL revisions would occur on an eight-year schedule as needed with a check-in on a biennial schedule, biannual, sorry, biannual schedule and revisions to ABC made if warranted. Then reference the COP and SAFE. The flow chart and COP would be included for illustration and reference the SAFE document for details. Recommendations um, expanded from the November 2019 CPSAS report. Continue the stepwise process to gather the information required for the benchmark CSNA assessment in 2021 to further develop and simplify the framework for anchovy management. Support the use of industry vessels as a preferred method to conduct nearshore acoustic and aerial surveys in junction with offshore ATM surveys to provide the nearshore estimate needed for CPS biomass estimates. Utilize multiple indices to assess anchovy population abundance and trends provide sufficient flexibility to achieve the objective, implement changes when necessary, but not more frequently than necessary. In closing, we all, we, in closing, we call attention to the final statement in the CPSMT report, pointing out that modeling analysis provided confirmation that the current management framework is risk, ad, risk averse over time to changes in stock size. Minority Report. The conservation representative recommends the council direct the CPSMT 
to include the OFL flowchart framework for CSNA in the November 2021 CPS FMP amendment scoping agenda item. The Magnuson-Stevens Act requires the inclusion of harvest control rules, how to set how to set and specify allowable catch levels in FMPs and that a regulatory specifications process is needed to implement the harvest control rule, ensure accountability and provide certainty to the public. The council may amend its COP schedule nine to describe a biennial specifications process for CSNA. The conservation representative notes that using the CPSMT's recommendation X2 parameter the ABC will remain constant unless the QEMSY BST value declines 40% from the default ABC value, even with the specifications process in place every two years. There is ample room for flexibility in the proposed anchovy management framework, as well as the integration of new best available information. The entire CPS thanks the council for consideration of these comments and recommendations. And I think I should include a gym membership with all the donuts I need to bring to the next council meeting. With that concludes my statement. Thank you, Dave. And yes, that would be a correct assumption. Um, and we appreciate all the goodies you're going to bring to the next uh, meeting. Um, with that, is there a, um, any hands questions for, uh, for David, Frank Lockhart, Frank. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I have two questions. Um, first, um, thank you for the report, very thorough and, and um, made a lot of good points. Um, so I'm just wondering on the, uh, sorry, let me get to that part of it, um, where um, this is on the second Par the second, well, the first full paragraph on page two that starts the CPSAS appreciates consideration. Um, in the middle there, it talks about that a majority can support a three-year rolling average, but only if the assessment considers multiple indicators. And just wondering um, if there was discussion about how that would all kind of come together the the having it be uh, uh, based on the atm surveys is a very simple and straightforward way it was easy for me to uh, conceive how this would happen and what the trigger point is and i'm just wondering did the as talk about how you would put all of these different surveys together to have a potential trigger point uh thanks mr vice chair thanks uh, frank for the question um you know i don't we did not in the uh, advisory sub panel, we did not get into the specifics of how the Southwest Fishery Science Center would would use the different indices and gather the different survey results and put them together to come up with this biomass estimate. Um, I think that would be probably for another another discussion on on how you might, you know, time things and, and, and be able to use uh, other survey methods that could occur a little earlier in the year, a little later in the year, and still uh, bring them all together to come up with a, uh, a better mild mass effort or estimate. It, it, it kind of um, stems from just the, the concern of the uh, confidence level from industry and in the ATM methodology. I think the SSC actually in their report did a good job of pointing out a lot of those concerns. Um, <clears throat> that included, you know, signal strength and, and fish behavior and nearshore correction. And so there's several issues that were pointed out in the uh, methodology review in 2018 about the uh, ATM survey that I think still stand true um, as concerns for both, uh, you know, the SSC and, and industry. So we were just hoping that there would be a way that additional indices could be brought in to just collaborate those, that number and the, uh, and the variation that could occur. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Vice Chair, if I can ask my other question, please. Okay. This is on the, um, the, um, under the minority report and I'm just, um, in it um, kind of about two thirds of the way down, it says the conservation representative notes that the X2 parameter will remain constant unless it declines 40%. And that seems to be the issue. And I'm just wondering, is the issue that 
it's 40% rather than say 30% or 29% or 23% or whatever, or is the issue that it's only done every two years? Um, you know, this was uh, a report that was put in by our conservation uh, representative. And um, I do know that there was some concern from our conversation from uh, the conservation organization about uh, this being done every two years and, and not being um, necessarily updated uh, annually. So, but for the meaning behind this, uh, for this particular comment, I think I would have to check in with Anna Weinstein to be sure um, what she was most concerned about. It did call for, or it does take a 40% decline for the uh, ABC to be um, adjusted possibly. And so I think that's between those two would be the reason. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Okay, thank you, Frank. Further questions for David? Corey Niles. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks, David. Um, I guess the, uh, the same question I asked to Greg and others about we seem to be saying, or you all seem to be saying on the last agenda item, we should be doing macro assessments every four years, full assessments, but you're comfortable with anchovy every eight years. And I'm just kind of curious, is, is that, do you think that's something the advisory panel is, you know, has, has deliberated on and, and, and sees a difference between the two, the two species? And if so, what, what would, what are the reasons you think that one, we're comfortable with one, doing one every eight years, the other we should be done more frequently. So yeah, any, uh, not answering that, not asking that very clearly, but yeah, any 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 insight you had onto that question would be appreciated. Thanks, David. Sure, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you, Corey, for the question. Um, so the anchovy fishery, I mean, my, my answer is gonna, is gonna be a little bit I guess personal knowledge versus, and also including the uh, the CPSAS discussions. But um, the anchovy fishery has a has been historically a very small local fishery, with very little fishery impact on the resource, um, with very low demand. Um, there hasn't been a, a strong market for anchovies for as long as I can remember, um, probably since the days of uh, reduction, and so. Uh, I think the fishing industry, it is a supplemental fishery for the industry. And I think that they see it as, as um, something that it, it's just not a, it's not a fishery where they think that there's a lot of fishery impact. As far as mackerel is concerned, mackerel is a fishery wet that when they are there in volume and in demand and in, in uh, sellable schools or clean schools of fish, that it, it can handle a larger volume, the sales and market can uh, take quite a bit more mackerel than what the anchovy um, fishery can take currently. So, so I think industry is more interested in that uh, more regular assessment of mackerel um, as that could be a bigger fishery. It has not been, but it, it can be a big fishery um, when the fish become uh, more available in large schools and clean schools. So. That would be my um, thinking behind the need for a, a more regular assessment on mackerel. Thanks, Corey. Thank you. David. Yeah, thank you, David. For the questions for David and the uh, AP. Okay. Seeing none, um, actually, we do, we'd go to public comment, but uh, it's pointed out that um, um, there was a recommendation in. Um, in uh, the management team report nine um, that Greg did not cover in his presentation. Um, so I'd give the opportunity maybe uh, for Lorna to uh, read that uh, uh, report number three into the record so we don't miss that uh, recommendation, if possible. Lorna? Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I will be reading the team's brief supplemental uh, report number three on the central subpopulation of northern anchovy. The Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team provided a report on the management framework for the central subpopulation of northern anchovy, or CNSA, under agenda item H3A, CPSMT report one, 
which described a tool, the flowchart, that addresses the frequency for assessments and changes to harvest specifications. At this meeting, the council is to consider the flowchart and provide guidance on next steps. The flowchart provides a quantitative prescriptive process that incorporates regular stock assessments to update the overfishing limit or OFL, reviews of short-term stock status with defined triggers and formulas for when and how to adjust the acceptable biological catch or ABC, and evaluations of fishery performance relative to the ABC. Additionally, as proposed by the CPSMT, consideration of CSA management through the flowchart would be a regular council agenda item. This is in contrast to current CSNA management in which an agenda item must be added to one of its meetings as there is no standing or routine harvest specification schedule for CSNA. Although the flowchart is more prescriptive than existing management, it generally maintains the current management framework for CNSA by using a long-term OFL. The CPSMT sees it as a useful tool and would be supportive of council adoption of the flowchart. Implementation considerations. If the council chooses to adopt the flowchart, the CPSMT sees value in evaluating how well this conceptual framework works in practice in terms of the parameter values chosen by the CPSMT before, before exploring alternative choices. Based on extensive analysis, the CPSMT recommended parameter values designed to achieve the goals outlined by the council when this process began. For example, fishery stability, prioritizing allocation of resources, taking only necessary management actions, and being responsive to changes in biomass. The parameter values proposed by the CPSMT could potentially be modified in the future, but the CPSMT would not recommend doing so until a need for change has been identified. Should the council choose to move forward with the flowchart, at present the CPSMT thinks that it can be implemented through changes to the council operating procedure as outlined in Agenda H3A, CPSMT Report 1. The CPSMT could work with the council staff to provide the council with a draft revised COP Schedule 3 for adoption at a future meeting. The CPSMT has not identified a reason why the CPSMP would need to be amended, but can continue to work with council and National Marine Fishery Service staff to determine whether modification of the CPSFMP is required. And that uh, concludes our statement. Thank you. Thank you, Lorna. Um, questions for Lorna on the uh, team's report three? Okay. Thanks, Lorna. Okay, with that, uh, that takes us to uh, public comment. Um, we have 10 uh, people signed up. Um, and also we have numerous people from um, uh, Audubon and uh, chapters among around the, uh, the state and uh, national. And so um, well, we try to make public comment efficient and that while we recognize that every individual should have the opportunity to comment, the intent of giving groups, organizations 10 minutes is so they can represent their members' constituents. Therefore, we are providing 10 minutes for one association, association member and also for an officer, if we can determine that, and five minutes for others identifying themselves as association members. As always, we encourage people to state their support for previous comments rather than repeat the information while giving individuals an opportunity to provide their unique perspective as well. With that, of the individuals signed up, we have determined that uh, Scott Thomas, Megan Flatter, Flaherty, and Anna Weinstein will each be given 10 minutes and everyone else five minutes. Of course, uh, Jeff Chester with Oceana is, uh, is, uh, will be 10 minutes also. So with that, um, we're gonna uh, start off here and then uh, try to go to till noon um, or thereabouts and uh, we'll break for lunch. So with that, um, I look to Scott Thomas. Um, Scott, are you there? I don't see him listed. Maybe um, I'll go to Diane Plester Steele and come back to Scott. Diane, are you there? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'm I'm here. Can you hear me? 
Oh, we can. Oh, good. Thank you so much. I uh, this will be relatively short and sweet because you've heard an awful lot of my concerns and uh, comments over the course of the discussion, the longer term discussion. But I uh, first of all would like to to uh, thank and and acknowledge the really hard work that's been done by the CPS management team and uh, the SSC, particularly Andre Punt, for doing the analysis uh, that's lead it, you know, led us to this place. Um, and again, uh, we support the ma majority statement on the CPS advisory subpanel, and I won't repeat much of that. But I guess going back to uh, the very beginning of the beginning um, is the scientific acknowledgement that anchovy abundance is driven primarily by environmental forcing. And uh, the fishery consumes less than 1% of the biomass that's consumed by everything else. Current uh, management is already ultra precautionary, and I guess uh, to point out that retaining Q at point at 25% provides double the protection and the risk against overfishing. Uh, that Q25 was implemented by the original management team to add precaution due to the infrequency of stock assessments, and now we're talking about regular stock assessments and a check-in every two years. So. Um, I'm hopeful that this will give the council the encouragement to go along with the management team recommendations. And I've got to state for the record, it uh, anchovy fishery has never been overfished and nor is overfishing occurring. And the CPSMT report highlighted the effectiveness of existing management as their final statement in report, report one. We, uh, as I mentioned, we support the recommendations by the majority of the CPSAS regarding short and long-term management. We still concern, we voice concern about basing short-term on only acoustic trawl surveys for the reasons that have already been expressed. And we continue to recommend considering multiple indices for both short and long-term, including aerial surveys. Uh, aerial surveys see the surface, acoustic trawl does not. CalCopy DEPM surveys also see things that sometimes the acoustic trawl does not. And then potentially the juvenile rockfish survey and the IEA report. I think all of those, those indices should be, should be considered. And with regard to the question of how do we factor that into a, a short-term biomass estimate, they can be, they can be used as, as cross-checks. And um, I know one of the things when we went through the original long, um, you know, that uh, the risk averse workshop a few years ago, and we heard reports from um, CPS scientists from all over the world. It was one of them, one of them was, was the Cadiz was, uh, I think it was her, her doctor, Dr. Alex Silva. And they did in Cadiz, they did multiple surveys, multiple indices, and they looked at them all. And when they did, when they when they conformed with each other, that was good. And when they didn't, they did they did some sort of a weighted average. And that's something I think that could be considered here. Uh, we agree with the CPS management team and a majority of the CPSAS that uh, the, the new management really doesn't warrant a full uh, FMP amendment and all the work that that entails. I think the framework could be included in COP9 and the short-term check-in as well as the flowchart for guidance and illustration in the SAFE document. We again re-emphasize the importance of this little fishery to our wet fish industry, and we thank the CPS management team for recognizing the need for stability. We conclude by strongly supporting the objective stated in the CPSMT and SSC joint report, and this was pointed out in our CPS advisory subpanel report, and I'm quoting, an ideal management scheme would implement changes when necessary, but not more frequently than necessary. And the frequency of changes should be balanced by the objectives of limiting both conservation risk and disruption to the fishery. And with that, um, that, that concludes my, my statement and, and I would be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Questions for Diane? Okay. See you, Thank you. 
Next up, uh, Megan Laflarty. Um, Megan? Hello, um, Council. This is Megan Flaherty with the San Diego Audubon Society. I um, want to thank you guys so much for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, first of all, I want to put everyone at ease and let you know I won't be taking the full 10 minutes. Uh, I know you guys always have a very full packed agenda, so you can uh, rest assured there. Um, San Diego Audubon, um, obviously, we're very interested in the birds that use the San Diego region. We're very focused on sea and shorebird conservation, and we work a lot with the endangered California leaf tern. I myself am a California leaf tern biologist, and I work on the, on the ground um, recording the nest sites, monitoring the chicks, and I've seen, um, I've had firsthand experiences with what happens with uh, foraging issues and how that impacts our nesting seabirds. Um, because of that connection, we've been working with Audubon California in order to advocate for uh, the improvement of northern anchovy management for several years now. And I do want to thank the council for all of the, the very positive steps from our perspective that have been taken since that work began. We really appreciate the work to um, get rid of the monitored versus active management groups um, and instead adopt the flow chart. And we really want to ask that the council move forward in adopting this flow chart in order to provide a simple and reliable means to adjust um, the, the, the OFL at regular intervals. Northern anchovy, as I'm sure everyone on this council is aware, is a boom and bust species um, where it can change very much so the population size from year to year. Um, and it seems like with the kind of uncharted territory that we're moving into as our oceans continue to feel the impact of ocean acidification and warm blobs and climate change, that we really continue to take a very cautionary approach for these boom and bust populations that play very important roles in marine ecosystems. Um, so that being said, we really appreciate everything that the, the staff has done to create this flow chart and we ask that it moves forward. We're also asking um, that some of the recommendations of the management team be adopted, including reducing the short-term biomass ass assessment to no more than two years, largely because some of that large scale fluctuation that happens from year to year that I just mentioned. Um, and we also um, just want to recommend the annual use of acoustic, uh, of ATM surveys to update management parameters. Um, aside from that, I, I want to thank the council for all, all of your work and, and for allowing the continued input of the public despite the craziness of COVID. Um, I just want to emphasize again that that sometimes the things that the biologists working with these seabirds see on the ground is very different than what the fisheries management team uh, is seeing from, from the fishermen. And I think it's really important that we continue to work together and exchange information so we can make sure that the, the people that rely on, on these fisheries and the animals that are dependent on these forage fish are supported in a way that our ecosystems can truly thrive. Um, thanks again, guys. Thank you, Megan. Questions for Megan? Okay. Seeing none, um, we're down to, uh, I get this right, Sri uh, Kanhadai. Thank you so much for this opportunity. My name is Sri Kandare and I'm a rising junior in high school, but my journey with birds began seven years ago. I was eight when I started volunteering with the San Diego Audubon as a turn watcher, and I have continued to be a part of this program every year since. Watching, watching over Mission Bay's California lease turns has been one of the most impactful experiences of my life. I've loved to see them from their courtship and feeding behavior to their fishing shifts to feed their chicks that would run out from where they would be hiding to watching those chicks fledge and then fly away. But every year I've been seeing fewer and fewer nests, less making it to adulthood. The California least turn population has been declining and with an estimated 3,500 pairs, it is roughly half of what it was at the height of its recovery. Increased pressure from predators and foraging issues have been identified as some of the primary reasons for this decline. These birds depend on northern anchovies for food, as it's a fish small enough to be fed to least tern chicks whole. In fact, several studies from the Point Blue Conservation Science have found that least tern nesting productivity is strongly associated with the amount of northern anchovy that the chicks consume. 
When anchovy is less abundant, the parents are forced to feed their chicks less appealing species of forage fish, which reduces the likelihood that the chicks will survive and fledge. Because of this connection, San Diego Audubon has been advocating for the elimination of the monitored versus active management category since 2013. We are very grateful for the steps that have been taken to make this a reality. So we ask the council to continue to move forward with this process by adopting the revised flowchart. We also support the recommendation of the management team to reduce short-term biomass assessments to no more than two years as a three-year average may delay management action when the population crashes. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you, Sheree. Uh, questions for Sheree? All right. Next up is um, Victor Leipzig, but uh, I don't think he's on the logged in right now. Um, so with that, we'll go to uh, Anna Weinstein. Anna? Mr. Vice Chair, can you hear me? We can. Thank you very much. Um, I am um, speaking today on behalf of um, the National Audubon Society, Audubon California, and the Pew Charitable Trust. Um, so our organizations uh, have been engaged in anchovy management update activities um, since about 2013. So it's very gratifying to see we are today with this proposal in front of you. I'm very happy to have my um, Audubon chapter, which are separate organizations, our uh, chapter colleagues with us today to talk about their, um, their stewardship of California lease terms um, that are so dependent on Northern Anchovy. So we greatly appreciate the MT's report uh, and are encouraged by the broad support uh, that has been noted uh, for the revised OFL flowchart, um, as well as the MT's uh, values for its parameters. Um, so at this meeting, we'd love to see the council get started uh, amending um, operating procedure nine that sets the management schedule according to the framework, including biennial, biennial harvest specifications. And then um, for the November meeting, um, include in uh, the framework in the amendment scoping, um, the scope elements of the framework to include and adopt in the C CPS FMP amendment. And this would have the stated purpose, purpose of eliminating the management categories, uh, which the council has previously directed the, the management team to, um, to, to do or, or to, to analyze and clarify how each stock is managed. So the MSA requires the inclusion of harvest control rules, how to set and specify allowable catch levels and FMPs. So the flexibility that the, the industry um, desires that they is, is quite valid. Um, and fortunately, um, it can be provided by keeping the FMP amendment um, to the components that are necessary um, and for the pieces that um, Mr. Mr. Anderson was referring to earlier. <clears throat> um, in discussion um, uh, in order, you know, with new council members and to ensure the public understands the management framework um, over the years. So um, as I noted in my minority report, there is ample room for flexibility in the proposed management framework, as well as for integration of new best available information, um, for example, to develop uh, improved short-term biomass estimates um, to bring in some of those other indices that the, the industry brought up and the SSC acknowledged would be, would be good to include um, as, as, is, um, uh, as is reasonable or, 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 or uh, justified. So the flexibility in management can be retained um, by putting those pieces into the operating procedure and safe documents that can be updated um, to Mr. Julie's point, there's no danger of locking a biomass estimation approach and keeping the parameters and the operating procedures allow, allows integration while in, ensuring transparency over time. This is important to ensure this new approach meets national standard two requirements and guidelines as well. Um, so thanks everyone for your hard work um, and uh, really ap appreciate your attention um, and um, movement forward um, today on this issue. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Anna. Questions for Anna? And I see Dale Sweden has his hand up. 
Oh, that's a bit. Okay. Seeing no hands. Thank you, Anna. And um, next up is uh, Jeff Chester. Jeff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. This is uh, Jeff Chester representing the conservation organization Oceana. Um, I'd like to just start by uh, the, the you know, reminding folks that the anchovy is the among the most important forage species in the California current ecosystem. Uh, this stock uh, is known to have uh, rapid and, and wide fluctuations and may collapse without warning or predictability. And so from a uh, perspective of uh, climate ready fisheries and ensuring resilience, um, uh, making sure that there's management responsiveness to these declines is paramount. Uh, we really appreciate so much of the hard work that has happened uh, by the management team, uh, the SSC, the advisory sub panel, uh, National Marine Fisheries Service uh, to put together uh, a, a framework that addresses uh, several of the concerns that have been raised over the last few years. Uh, some of these uh, concerns with respect to status quo management in the monitored category uh, uh, relate to accountability, uh, transparency, uh, the, 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 the confusion over uh, procedural uh, issues by uh, you know in terms of members of the public. Um, and, and ultimately the, the FMP has been uh, producing catch limits that do, are not based on best available science and fail to prevent overfishing. And these uh, concerns in terms of the recent specifications um, uh, have, 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 I think there is a, a clear solution in the uh, framework that's been uh, been proposed, uh, but simply just specifying that uh, there'll be a constant catch and as needed that will be reduced uh, really doesn't uh, achieve the, the requirements of the Magnuson Act. Um, so we we are very happy to see broad agreement on and, and general consensus on the approach recommended uh, in, in the framework. Uh, we we see we see it as producing stable, uh, acceptable biological catch uh, catches when the stock is healthy, um, and at the same time a responsiveness to uh, declines uh, by lowering uh, the ABC levels. Um, uh, as, as stated by SSC member uh, uh, Dr. Andre Punt, uh, this approach uh, is unequivocally superior to status quo management. Um, we do agree that uh, some parameters should be further explored, particularly the number of years constituting short-term biomass. Uh, we would support uh, one or two years, but not a three-year average, uh, because a three-year average would not be responsive to declines. Uh, we we do think that uh, trends over three years could be examined, but right now the the framework is triggered not by trends, but but on the actual average number and the 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 absolute biomass uh, estimates. So um, one to two years is what we would like to see there. Uh, we we were appreciative of the SSC support and confirmation that sufficient modeling has been done and uh, nearshore estimation methods have been uh, approved uh, so that the ATM survey can be used directly to inform management. This is a major step forward uh, and congrats to the Southwest Fisheries Science Center and the many involved to get the science up to par. Uh, we do recognize that there are remain concerns and areas for improvement on the ATM survey. Um, and, uh, and, and we, we see a way to uh, implement this approach without having to specifically lock in uh, ATM survey only, but use that as a starting point. Uh, the, the, in addition, we do believe that the, uh, the OFL, in addition to the ABC, uh, should be updated if the population goes below that X2 parameter or falls below 40%. So if there is a, a trigger uh, due to a low biomass that both the OFL and the ABC are updated. Um, we do note that the modeling, and this is in contrary to the management team statement, which we're not sure where this came from, but the modeling that was conducted uh, and presented at, at the November 20, after, after the October workshop and, and, and then presented in November 2019 showed that the current uh, constant catch regime of 25,000 tons uh, is actually not sustainable or precautionary and in fact drives the stock to extinction and even uh, constant catches as low as 5,000 tons uh, in the modeling uh, would ultimately drive the stock to extinction as well. So, uh, the basic reason for this is that while the Q parameter or that 75% reduction is precautionary when the stock is high, when the stock uh, drops uh, lower 
uh, to those decline levels, the, the those constant catch levels are concerning. And so uh, the new framework d- did model uh, much uh, much more uh, conservatively, and and I think had great success in terms of the outputs. Um, and but largely that that depends on the assumption that the framework would be robustly implemented, and that is the, really the critical piece that we we see in terms of moving forward with the framework. Um, so essentially, a seventy five percent buffer. Uh, is is not precautionary when the stock collapses, you know, because the stock can collapse much greater than seventy five percent to to levels where uh, you know a, a, a long term average uh, is 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 no longer appropriate. Um, we also did uh, uh, picking up on Mr. Niles' uh, discussion of the cutoff and the. Uh, we do see that as a key component of forage fish management. It is in place for sardine and mackerel. Uh, cutoffs protect the ecosystem and promote uh, rebuilding when the stock is low and ultimately help achieve optimum yield, uh, particularly for forage species. And it's also consistent with uh, uh, general scientific recommendations and consensus statements on uh, forage fish is the need for these cutoffs. We know that the this framework was really designed to address the OFL and ABC and Uh, And the harvest guideline uh, formula is really where you see cutoffs in sardine and mackerel management. And so we we do see uh, in the future there could be uh, room for consideration of that that would be complementary and compatible uh, with the uh, framework proposed now, um, not in any way in conflict with that. and so in terms of moving forward, uh, we support the idea that at least uh, initially, uh, we know that uh, amending the COP uh, could be a, an important first step. This could um, be the place to set up a new biennial uh, schedule uh, for uh, anchovy. And, and we suggest that uh, specifies that there would be a biennial uh, regulatory specifications process. Uh, we think that that could be combined with a Pacific mackerel schedule. So you'd have the same uh, agenda item dealing with both species uh, and uh, the same schedule in terms of uh, reviews and uh, and deliberations. And that could be a way to really streamline and, and reduce the workload rather than it being a, a new agenda item. Um, the... We, we do, however, believe that the COP is not the place to describe the management framework or to, to set or change management policy, that that really should happen in the FMP. Um, we do think the biennial specs are, are critical because uh, formal rulemaking ensures accountability. Uh, it's consistent with uh, the way other stocks are managed. And in, under the Magnuson Act, it really is the primary mechanism for ensuring best available science and preventing overfishing uh, and including uh, p- response to public input in, uh, in the Magnuson Act. There's also, as, as Mr. Anderson pointed out, uh, council turnover and having things in the FMP uh, provides consistency and uh, uh, as there is turnover and, and, and clarity in terms of how stocks are managed. Um, and, and also pointing out again, the ABC, uh, even with biennial specs, could be the same and would be the same ABC set every year uh, or every yeah and, and updated every other year unless the stock drops to those uh, uh, levels below 40%. Um, and then lastly, with respect to the need for an FMP amendment, um, we point out that the, the the currently scheduled FMP amendment to the CPS FMP for November uh, has a, a purpose and need to both eliminate the monitored category and clarify how each uh, CPS stock is managed. And so really the, the adopting of the management framework there uh, for this species does belong in this FMP. A management framework is, is where that an FMP, an FMP is where that belongs. We do believe the, to address some of the concerns raised and help get the council comfortable with that, that an FMP amendment doesn't have to be overly prescriptive and specify every single parameter. It can provide a general approach and framework, but those uh, parameters do not have to necessarily all be hardwired and could be referred to elsewhere and and changed in the future without uh, having to amend the FMP again, uh, particularly the use of the ATM survey uh, as as the uh, the primary basis does not have to be specified in the FMP, uh, we would be okay with something like just you know using the best available estimate as determined uh, through the council process and by NIFS. Um, so ultimately, this is an investment uh, to put in the FMP, but in the end, it will reduce workload, uh, keep flexibility, 
and uh, achieve the council's management goals in the long term and and ultimately i think resolve a uh, long-standing conflict that has been in front of the council and 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 move us toward a, a approach of broad agreement so thank you again and i'd be happy to take any questions thank you jeff questions for jeff on this testimony okay thanks jeff all right um well thank you uh, it's um it is almost noon, and uh, we're going to break, as I indicated we would earlier. I see um, Victor Leipzig is online now, and I'd ask that he would uh, return uh, at 1 o'clock when we return uh, uh, after lunch. So um, we will see. Um, uh, we'll take him up. Uh, we'll take Victor uh, first up, and then uh, we'll see everybody then. Okay, thank you. When I got out of high school, I jumped on dad's rig and it just gets in your blood. I didn't have a problem getting up and going to work every morning. I enjoyed being on the water. And when I found that the fishing regulations were so complicated, I was angry. It is really frustrating to not have a say in what is happening to you. It's not just will the fish live or die, it's will the fishermen live or die. Well, why is this happening, or why is this, or why is that, or they just want to shut it down, and... Am I going to be able to survive? It's hard. I first heard about MRAP from two fishermen. Got a hold of me and said, hey, I've got this great opportunity for you. It's a program that, that's by and for fishermen. I was very skeptical going into that meeting, and uh, very enlightened coming out. MRAP gives you the recipe. Where does the data come from? How do people use the data, the laws, and the steps that one goes through to translate into a regulation? I was afraid of the rulemaking process, but I think they listened to what everyone there had to say, including myself. MREP was really helpful in how I can be an active participant in the management of my fishery.
When I got out of high school, I jumped on dad's rig and it just gets in your blood. And I didn't have a problem getting up and going to work every morning. I enjoyed being on the water. And when I found that the fishing regulations were so complicated, I was angry. It is really frustrating to not have a say in what is happening to you. It's not just will the fish live or die, it's will the fishermen live or die. Well, why is this happening or why is this or why is that or they just want to shut it down and... Am I going to be able to survive? It's hard. I first heard about MRAP from two fishermen. Got a hold of me and said, hey, I've got this great opportunity for you. It's a program that, that's by and for fishermen. I was very skeptical going into that meeting and uh, very enlightened coming out. MREP gives you the recipe. Where does the data come from? How do people use the data, the laws, and the steps that one goes through to translate into a regulation? I was afraid of the rulemaking process, but I think they listened to what everyone there had to say, including myself. MREP was really helpful in how I can be an active participant in the management of my fishery. We'll start here just shortly. Okay, it's uh, one o'clock and uh, we're back from lunch uh, and um, we're in the middle of public comment. I believe uh, Victor Leipzig is, uh, is next up. Uh, Victor, are you there? Yes, uh, Mr. Pettinger, Mr. Chairman? Please, yes. I'm, oh, very good. I, I'm glad that, uh, that I'm getting through. Thank you very much, first of all, for circling back and picking me up. I apologize for my unfamiliarity with the technology of your meetings. Uh, and uh, I apologize for, uh, for any delay. Uh, my name is Vec Leipzig. I'm speaking on behalf of CN Sage Audubon Society. It's the Orange County chapter of the National Audubon Society. Uh, I can tell you that uh, my colleague, Scott Thomas, was also going to speak on, on our behalf, but will not be able to uh, now, in, now in the afternoon. Uh, my chapter has uh, 3,000 members here in, in Orange County, California. And, uh, and like our colleagues uh, at San Diego uh, Audubon, uh, we are, are uh, longtime uh, supporters of local turn nesting areas, uh, especially here in my city of Huntington Beach, uh, where we have the Bolsa Chica Ecological Reserve that has uh, a turn nesting reserve that uh, has the largest number of turn species uh, actually uh, nesting anywhere in the United States. And a very important, one of the oldest and uh, largest California least turn nesting areas at Huntington Beach State Beach that my chapter has spent many decades volunteering for and helping to support financially. So we understand the dependence of California least turn and our other nesting seabirds in Southern California on, uh, on pelagic birds and in particular uh, this, the set of species referred to as forage fish, including the anchovy. Uh, I'll, I'll try to be brief. I'll just say that, uh, uh, that the uh, population fluctuations that are characteristic of the northern anchovy are reasons for a, an even uh, more rigorously scientific-based uh, uh, management scheme than, than less. Uh, just because the populations have inherent population fluctuations, natural population fluctuations, doesn't mean that we don't have the poten potential as human beings to impact those. And uh, our uh, birds in this area are very much dependent upon forage fish. And some of those population fluctuations that we've seen in past years have reduced our local turn populations to foraging on much less nutritious species like pipefish. Uh, I am personally uh, uh, acutely aware of the significance of ocean health in general 
to our bird populations and uh, the importance to our human populations because I served as uh, formerly as a city councilman and a mayor for the city of Huntington Beach. And I'm very acute, uh, very much aware of how uh, recreational activities like recreational bird watching, recreational fishing, and even just the recreational use of our oceans depend upon uh, ocean health and how ocean health is an important part of the uh, of our economy and our municipal pride. So with those comments, I'll thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and thank you for the protection that you are affording to, to our fish populations. Thank you, Vic. Uh, questions for Vic on his testimony? Okay, seeing none. Thank you. Thank you again. Okay, uh, next up is uh, Christine Miller. Christine? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm Christine Miller. I am a member of the San Diego Audubon Society and a longtime volunteer with them, um, involved primarily with habitat restoration projects for the endangered California least terns. Um, as someone who cares very much about the survival of our wildlife, I believe we need to be more committed to protecting the many species of marine mammals as well as seabirds that rely on these forage fish such as the northern anchovies um, for their very survival. And these include um, shearwater species, auklets, muirs, the least terns of course, and the California brown pelicans who although removed from the endangered species list, are currently teetering on the edge of that due to serious foraging issues. Um, the northern anchovy is a critical foraging resource for many seabirds, and this group of birds has seen significant declines over the last 70 years. Um, they also face threats due to bycatch issues, climate change, marine litter, and in the case of the least terns, uh, severe habitat loss. Um, I'm not going to repeat everything that's already been said, so I'll just say that I support the elimination of the monitored versus active management categories, and I ask the council to continue to move forward by adopting the revised flowchart, um, calling for more frequent stock assessments to prevent overfishing, since this population of anchovy fluctuates so drastically. Um, also supporting the recommendations of the management team to reduce the short-term biomass assessments to no more than two years. Um, thank you very much for your time. And I'm hoping these important matters regarding our ecosystem health are taken into consideration by the council. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Uh, questions for Christine? Okay. Thanks again. Um, next up is um, Tom Schiff. Um, Tom, are you there? Okay, I don't see Tom's name unless someone sees different. And uh, we'll just come back to him uh, after uh, Teresa Labriola. Teresa? Um, yes, good afternoon, uh, Vice Chair Pettinger. I am Teresa Lariola. I represent Wild Oceans. Uh, Wild Oceans was founded nearly five decades ago by conservation-minded recreational fishermen who are dedicated to keeping our oceans wild and preserving fishing opportunities for the future. And we promote a broad ecosystem approach to fisheries management to reach this goal. Um, Ultimately, management should consider how forage populations, including anchovy, impact dependent predators, including our favorite sport fish, whales, and seabirds, such as the least tern and California brown pelican, which you have heard today are greatly dependent on abundant forage populations, um, including anchovy. And the, the importance of anchovy cannot be underestimated. Um, when you, we saw a decline in uh, anchovy, about a decade ago, uh, one of the first places we saw the rebound uh, at the council, I remember, was a presentation on the stomach contents of Pacific bluefin tuna. And when they're available, they're eaten. 
and it signaled the stomach content study signaled the return of this high energy food source to the ecosystem. Um, right now, the population is an outlier in our coastal pelagic species management. Um, the FMP establishes an indefinite fixed catch limit that's not responsive to changes in the stock or to its abundance. And from an ecosystem perspective, this strategy might work well when all sides are showing a healthy stock, but it doesn't work well when the stock shows signs of stress and the population can fluctuate quickly from one regime to another. So we agree that it's time to bring anchovy into the active management fold um, and into um, a new management regime. So um, I'll support the detailed comments of many of my colleagues who enthusiastically supported the flowchart um, developed by the management team and asked the council to initiate the scoping of an FMP amendment um, in November to consider adopting the flowchart. Um, you know, it's it's critically important to us that it's a it, that it's part of the fishery management plan, partly because um, that process provides the council and stakeholders with a transparent decision-making tool um, for making for managing anchovy, as well as an enduring tool that does not change with the makeup of the council. Um, we are encouraged that this framework takes advantage of newly avail available um, ATM biomass estimates for anchovy for biannual check-ins. Um, this is a, an improvement in science that gives the council the ability to adjust management as needed, but only as needed. Um, you've heard a lot about the flow chart parameters and to implement the flowchart, values for each of these parameters must be chosen. And um, while we agree with many of the parameters uh, preferred um, by the management team, we'd like to see uh, further analysis and, and uh, evaluation of the parameters, uh, such as, especially I should say, the short-term biomass and how the one, two or three year estimates would affect management when, steep, when a stock is in steep decline. Um, this evaluation, again, I would say is a, a very important part of the transparent public process in, in, um, in amending our current management process. Um, amending the FMP to include the updated framework ensures clarity and accountability and transport transparency for stakeholders and a critical opportunity for stakeholders to evaluate and participate in the transparent decision-making process um, based on um, based on, on scientific information. Um, the end result is we all have clarity about the council priorities and management responsibilities. Um, the framework is also, we see this as just an extension of the council's you know, long time work to protect the marine food chain, which you've uh, worked on for many years and incorporated into FMPs, including adoption of CBA-1, um, the ban on, on the commercial fishing for krill species many years ago, uh, the inclusion of a cutoff in the sardine control rule. Um, so this is very much in line with um, many of the values that the council has, has um, incorporated into its fishery management plans. Um, I'd like to support the development of a cutoff for anchovy as we have for sardine, as discussed by my colleague, Jeff Shuster. Um, ultimately, a healthy forage base yields economic and ecological gains. And you've heard uh, some specific examples from Victor with Sea and Sage Audubon about how his town is dependent upon uh, healthy forage populations for recreational birders, recreational fishing, um, coast, his, you know, the coastal economy. We all understand that forage are essential to the health and productivity of the ecosystem overall, as well as important to commercial and recreational fish that feed on these little fish. And that's why the council's precautionary management of anchovy is so important. Um, in addition, in the future, we're looking at increasing demands for fish meal resulting from um, mounting, which result in mounting fishing pressure on forage fish populations. 
and it's the time it is right to ensure we have our management in place in the face of this and other um, threats such as changing ocean conditions. So for this reason, we support adoption of, um, or, of, of the framework through an FMP amendment with rigorous consideration of the parameters outlined in the management team report. And thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, questions for uh, Teresa on her testimony? Brianna Brady. Brianna? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you, Teresa, for your testimony. Um, I am just thinking back to when you referenced um, please correct me if I don't have it straight, having more accountability um, being given by an amendment process. And I'm just wondering if you could ask what you mean by accountability. Oh, sure. Yes, thank you, Vice Chair Pettinger and Councilman uh, Braby. I, what I, um, in terms of accountability, um, I think that including the framework in the fishery management plan um, it has a, a definite response. Um, whereas including that in say uh, uh, the council operating procedure, um, we have some concern that that is um, not necessarily, would not necessarily trigger the same response in uh, or the same action in response to a change in um, ecosystem or anchovy levels in the ecosystem. Brianna? Okay. Further questions for Teresa? Okay. Thank you, Teresa. Um, next up is uh, Tom Schiff. Tom, are you there? How's that? Perfect. All right. Mr. Vice Chair and Council Members, I didn't catch all the presentation on the population of central anchovies, but at least conceptually, it seemed to me a proposed change to the model, one that I would say takes a second look at recent changes to the short-term biomass could have merit. I can't really offer an informed opinion on the suggested modeling change, but anything that helps the council and other members or other groups uh, receive the most recent information on a stock could be beneficial. In closing, I would add that from my review of models over the years, various models, any model is only as good as its data input. So in my opinion, using the different indices and surveys would yield the most credible information. Thank you for allowing my comment. Thank you, Tom. Uh, questions for Tom on his testimony? Okay. See none? Good to hear your voice, Tom. Okay. I think that takes us, we're doing a public comment, that takes us to council action. Um, just to consider the proposed management framework and flow chart, and two, to provide further guidance. Uh, with that, I'll open the floor to uh, discussion. Rihanna Brady. Rihanna? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying that overall, I'm, I'm very grateful to our advisory bodies, Andre Punt, uh, and members of the public for the many discussions we have all had for anchovy management. We left November 2019 with the draft flow chart to consider, and I have been hesitant about the flow chart, but after much discussion and review of the flow chart, I think that it has merits and is a, a way to move forward. Um, the flow chart addresses concerns that have been raised regarding the length of time between assessments and how the council has managed this important forage stock. By using the flow chart, we can better demonstrate our efforts to ensure the stock remains sustainable. And in that context, I'm, I'm supportive of the flow chart and the parameters that CPS management team has selected for use. 
I appreciate all the thought and the analysis that has gone into the development of the flow chart and the associated parameters. Also, um, we have we've heard comments that this flow chart or the components of the management cycle that it includes should be provided in the FMP as an amendment. And having not seen how well the flow chart process will work, and given that other CPS management cycles are provided in COP9, at this point, I would like to see the process included in the COP. I think, um, I think I'll be looking towards council staff and NIMS staff and the CPSMT to determine whether a modification of the CPS FMP is required as noted in management team report three. Um, so at this time, I think that the council should, should ask that the management team provide a revised COP nine that contains the concept of the flow chart so that the council may review and consider this process for implementation at the November 2021 council meeting. Thanks. Thank you, Brianna. Uh, Maggie Summer. Maggie. Thank you, Vice, Cha Vice Chair. Pardon me. <clears throat> I also want to um, really express much appreciation for all of the work that's been done to develop this framework and the flowchart, including the thoughtful written and verbal testimony that we've received at multiple meetings. Uh, I, I support the suggestion Brianna just made for uh, drafting revisions to COP9 to um, incorporate the concept of the flow chart. I want to touch on a couple specific things that have come up. The uh, management team recommended that we, uh, if the council goes forward with applying the flow chart management, that we first do so with their recommended parameter values. Uh, and I, I would, um, be in favor of doing that. There has been significant effort in the modeling evaluation and, and selection of those values uh, and a lot of good uh, rationale for using those. And then uh, on the issue of an FMP amendment, uh, we've heard issues of accountability and, and clarity and flexibility raised uh, with some, some good thoughts addressing those in the advisory subpanel report and in, in some of the public comment um, at this point, I am uh, supportive of the idea of uh, considering describing anchovy management in the uh, this framework for it in the FMP. I think it's the appropriate place for a general description of the council's approach uh, with some details left to the COP so that they can be uh, modified as appropriate in, in response to new information or changing circumstances. And I think that would be a good step forward in, in providing clarity in how we are managing the stock. Uh, although I do want to say I really don't uh, agree with the idea that there is no accountability inherent in what has been the council's approach to this point. Um, and I'll just close again by highlighting ODFW's interest in uh, anchovy management and in ensuring a healthy forage base in the California current ecosystem as we're heading into a future that we know will include climate and ocean change challenges, among others. Uh, and this is a, an important issue for us. So again, thank you to everyone for the work and discussion. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, Phil Anderson. Bill? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair, and uh, I echo any other remarks uh, made by my uh, colleagues up to this point. Um, and I, I, including the the words of uh, thanks and appreciation to all the work that's uh, gone into bringing this um, flowchart and framework forward for our consideration. Uh, lots of great input from our management team, our advisory panel, and, and members of the public to help us navigate um, what we do with the work that's been presented uh, and next steps. I do think that this re represents a, a, a significant step forward in how we uh, manage anchovy um, 
Uh, I've been a champion of for, of uh, forage fish conservation, uh, and I think, and and has been stated, anchovies are are a particularly important forage fish for a variety of um, both marine fish species as well as um, seabirds um, and other uh, critters. Uh, and I'll just speak briefly to this uh, question about you know, where as we move forward and if the council takes action uh, to incorporate uh, the framework and flow chart, where does it, where should it reside? Um, and I, um, I'm i in agreement with uh, uh, Maggie Summers' comments in that regard. Uh, when you look at our COPs, you know, they're, they're reflective of cycles, schedules, and very general uh, description of activities. Um, uh, I think we have seen where you, you uh, there are times when the council has deviated from COPs, not necessarily in this particular instance, but um, uh, it, I, so um, we have fishery management plans for, for a purpose. Uh, the content of those plans is um, clearly laid out in the Magnuson Act. Um, and I think um, having the, uh, the the general approach and framework of how we're going to manage uh, this pot, this uh, uh, species is important to have in our FMP. That doesn't mean that we it would be written in such a manner that uh, removes any flexibility to, to react to changes uh, in the science. Um, uh, or other uh, kinds of management considerations. But I think just in terms of where we're gonna, where we need to put how we are going to manage particular, our particular species within, it, uh, it should be in the framework plan. Um, uh, and so uh, I would, I would uh, first of all support um, what I think I understood from uh, Brianna's uh, recommendation in terms of moving forward in a in a fairly uh, uh, expeditious manner in terms of putting having um, being able to consider and put uh, what using the right terms language into our FMP incorporating this of uh, the schedule and the and the general description of the activity uh, into our COP COP I think COP nine is where that would would reside. And it would augment and, and in some cases replace the language um, that's in there, uh, perhaps relative to CPS uh, species. Um, and then um, subsequently have give some additional thought and serious consideration to uh, what portions of this new approach uh, would appropriately reside within uh, a future FMP amendment. Uh, so those, those are my comments, uh, Mr. Vice Chair and, and um, Council members, and I appreciate the opportunity to make them. Thank you, Phil. Further discussion? Corey Niles. Corey? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And um, yeah, it's uh, supportive of, of those that spoke uh, before. And I think, I think, too, I'm seeing eventually that the FMP would be the right place for at least aspects of this approach, but I, I think I do. I'm also agreeing COP would be a, a prudent first step. But I just want to take a step back and make um, some comments about about what would um, make this all work. And I'm I'm thinking back. I don't remember what year it was uh, now, and, and the, these years just fly by. And um, things you thought were a couple years ago were. 10, seven years ago, but I can remember the worry this council had over anchovy a few years ago and being in a collapsed state and having an analysis that showed the decreasing index, index of abundance, but we did not have uh, a biomass estimate um, to, to really guide us on what was going on. And I think that was one of the least favorite issues I've, I've been um, involved with here at the council. It was not, it was not a good place to not have the science. So. Um, yeah, again, appreciate all the work that's been done, but I think the message I'm hearing and we've heard this this today is that we hope the Science Center 
will have the resources and the staff to let's to support you know periodic assessment of, of anchovy and sardine mackerel and how we have staff resources and science resources i think is gonna like in ground fish has for for a long time and taking those explicit um discussions about priorities for research and assessment so yeah i'm uh really really uh pleased with the direction this is going and, and, and supportive of the comments heard so far thanks corey okay anyone else frank lockhart frank um i'll keep it short but agree with everyone that has uh, really appreciated all of the comments uh, from the advisory bodies as well as the public commenters. I thought they were all excellent, uh, both pointing out the importance of what we're doing and also making some really good suggestions about the direction to go. I think at this point in time, the agency has not come to a strong conclusion about whether the COP or the FMP is the proper vehicle, uh, or perhaps that the COP is appropriate for some parts of it, uh, and the FMP is appropriate for other parts of it. But I think um, the uh, Brianna's uh, suggestion that staff um, and the uh, advisory bodies uh, working with NIMS um, come forward with something at the November uh, meeting. I think that might be uh, that might be a way forward that we can further consider um, everything that we've heard today um, and uh, then be able to make that decision in November. So um, again, thanks, thanks to everyone. And I re really appreciate the comments uh, in the discussion we've had here today. Thanks, Frank. Okay, anyone else? And Frank, your hand is still up. All right. Well, not seeing any other hands, I heard someone might be making a motion, potentially. Or not. Rihanna. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I have a motion that I could put forward for discussion. Okay. Sandra, could you please post it? Um, I move that the CPSMT provide draft text in COP9 to the council in November 2021. In November 2021, that includes the proposed framework for the central subpopulation of northern anchovy from CPSMT report one and supplemental CPSMT report two. Thank you, Brianna. Uh, does the language, uh, language of the screen accurately reflect your motion? It does. Thank you. Okay. Looking for a second. Bob Dooley. Thank you, Bob. Okay, Brianna, uh, speak to your motion, please. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. In general, while current management for anchovy is already ensuring that overfishing is not occurring and that the stock is sustainable, I also agree, given the various comments we have received, that having additional clarity on frequency and the type of management actions that would occur for anchovy could be beneficial. And as stated in the CPS Management Team Report 3, the framework includes the frequency for assessments and changes to harvest specifications. The process outlined in the flowchart provides for regular stock assessments to update the overfishing limit. And the process also includes reviews of short-term stock status with defined triggers for when and how to adjust the acceptable biological catch. Additionally, the flowchart allows for evaluations of how much catch the fishery is landing relative to the ABC and provides for consideration of a stock assessment if needed before the next cycle starts. As noted by the management team report, consideration of anchovy management would be a regular council agenda item as specified by the flowchart. Thanks. 
Thanks, Brianna. Questions for uh, Brianna or the discussion on her motion? Louis M. Louis? Well, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And uh, thank you, Brianna, for this motion. I, I will be supporting it. I very much appreciate the California Department of Wildlife's long record of uh, uh, doing excellent science based on anchovies. And, uh, and I didn't get a chance earlier to do it, but I, I wanted to uh, uh, also express the commenters uh, from Audubon, the various Audubons up and down the coast. Uh, yesterday, um, I had the joy of, of watching pelicans Bothering into um, large anchovy schools, and then something I'd never hey, Louis? seen before. Louis? Um, am I here? Yeah, you're just uh, you're. Um, yeah. You, excuse me. Microphone. You're not very clear there. Thank you. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Huh. Okay, I'm gonna. Am I better now? Yes, you are. Thank you. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I think we got most of that, but it was it seemed to be getting worse. But you're good now. Can we try it now? You got it. Technology had the best to me. So I, I will be supporting this, and I do uh, really appreciate the department's uh, long record of, of proper management and science of anchovies. And I just wanted to say to the Audubon people that I'm a very enthusiastic birder and got to watch pelicans uh, uh, enjoying the amount of the large amount of anchovies off uh, the San Diego coast yesterday, and I got to see something I'd never seen before, and that was brown-footed boobies actually augering in and eating uh, in, eating squid. So it's a it's an ever-changing uh, environment we have out there. It's a very demanding one, and I agree we really do need to uh, to shepherd it well. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Louie. Um, Bob Dooley, Bob. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And thanks, Brianna, for a good motion. I appreciate it. Um, I do have a question. You know, we heard from the advisory subpanel the need for flexibility and in, in not using the, a, I'll get the acronym wrong, ACT, I think it was, or ATC. Uh, and I, just solely as the, as, and, and rather to use a, a suite of indices. And I've also heard from the SSC that their recommendation maybe to begin with to start this way. I like the fact that it's in the COP so that maybe it lends a little more flexibility, but I'm real concerned about getting the best available science. And we've heard for years that that is the, the path that uh, the industry has been wanting to take and the science center as well. But, getting verification on these other ways of uh, assessing the stocks is still being uh, developed. So do you see, I don't, I don't see you particularly uh, referencing the fact that the advisory subpanel had a different approach on that. Do you see this by including in the COP that it allows the flexibility on a, on a ongoing basis to be able to make those adjustments without a Herculean lift of uh, regulatory structure to guide it. Brianna? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Bob, for the question. Um, yeah, I think there have been some good points brought up about what science is best and the availability of it. And, um, you know, I, I think moving forward, it would be helpful to be able to use other sources of data especially if the ATM isn't available in a given year. So I, I don't see this motion specifying that specifically. Um, the flow chart itself does rely on the ATM. So perhaps that's something that needs to be considered in, in November. Thanks, Brianna. Thank you, Brianna. Uh, Corey Niles, Corey? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Brianna, for the motion. Um, apologies if I missed it, but we did hear Frank speak up and say that, they, that NIMS was not certain about COPs versus FMPs, but and would like the, the team to think about it more and with them. 
I'm not, I'm the way I'm seeing this is that those conversations will still happen if it gets written down in a COP first, the substance would be there and those conversations about, about the FMP would, would still be happening. Is that, is that consistent with your understanding? Mr. Vice Chair, Please. Thank, thank you, Corey, for the question. I would say absolutely. Okay. Um, further discussion on the motion? Okay, um, not seeing any hands, uh, we'll call for the question. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, motion passes unanimously. Okay, and I guess was there any further guidance here we want to do before we uh, if I turn this back over to uh, Carrie. I don't see any hands. Carrie, looking towards you. Yes, Mr. Vice Chair, um, your task was to um, consider the proposed management framework and flowchart and provide guidance, and you have done that. So the team um, will huddle up and uh, start working on um, putting together a, a proposed COP9 revision to reflect uh, this framework and flow chart. So I'd say your business for this agenda item has been completed. Thank you, Gary. And um, thanks for all the hard work uh, that went into making the decision. Uh, and with that, I would like to give the gavel back to our, our chairman, Mark. Thank you very much, Vice Chair Pettinger. Um, we will shift gears from coastal pelagic species to ground fish. Uh, and that takes us to agenda item G4, the Groundfish Endangered Species Work Group Report. And Todd Phillips is now in the staff seat. Todd? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Council. As noted, this is agenda item G4, which is the Endangered Species Work Group Report. <clears throat> the Groundfish Endangered Species Work Group was established in June 2013 to serve as an advisory body to the Council with the objective to support the ESA Section 7A2 compliance in the biological opinion for continued operation of the Pacific Coast groundfish fishery. Work group meetings are generally timed so that the recommendations that would need to be addressed by adoption or adjustment of management measures can be considered as part of the groundfish biennial harvest specifications and management measure process. This year, the work group met from April 26th through the 28th and reviewed reports detailing the most recent incidental take estimates for Eulicon, green sturgeon, humpback whales, leatherback sea turtles, and short-tailed albatross in the groundfish fishery. The work group, in part, considered whether the incidental take was exceeded and if new information revealed effects not previously considered in the biop. Under its terms of reference, the work group may recommend that the council consider new conservation and measures to minimize bycatch of the aforementioned ESA listed species. Um, as noted here, this next sentence, um, Brian Hooper has a uh, unexpected personal matter. So I will be presenting the work group's finding at his presentation. <clears throat> Back in the council then has the opportunity under the agenda item to address conservation concern raised in the reports and consider measures to minimize bycatch of the aforementioned species. The council may also recommend new analyses, reports, or changes to sampling protocols to improve bycatch estimates of these ESA listed species as well. New management measures that the council identifies at this meeting could be evaluated as part of the 2023 and 2024 harvest specifications and management measure process. The specific reports for these ESA listed species are noted above, are found as agenda items two through six, and a ground fish fishery effort report was also provided with an accompanying data file as reports seven and eight. Additionally, the Science Center developed an informational report that summarizes the findings of all reports, and that is agenda item uh, G4A, NIMS report one. Looking at your packet, in addition to the reports I just listed, you do have a gap report, as well as the Endangered Species Act work group report, and a presentation, which I can easily get. With that, I would turn to your action. 
It is to consider recommendations of the Ground Fish Endangered Species Work Group and identify measures to be considered in planning for the 2023 biennial management process or other actions as appropriate. And with that, Mr. Chair, I conclude my overview and can take any questions on that or I can move right into my presentation or Brian's presentation. Uh, thank you, Todd. Uh, any questions for Todd on the overview? All right, Todd, I guess you're gonna provide the uh, report here, the work group report, so carry on. Yes, sir, let me bring that up on the screen for you. Okay, to confirm you are seeing a blue slide that says ground fish endangered species work group report. I can confirm that. Thank you, sir. Okay, so, as noted, this is the GESW report. Um, this report, this uh, work group, as noted, was held in the last part of April. Uh, so what we're gonna do here today is just go through a basic overview of the findings of the work group and talk a little bit about what recommendations they had. Um, noting that I am giving this presentation for Brian, should any of the council members out there have questions on regulatory issues or uh, National Marine Fisheries Policy issues. Um, we do have Keeley Kent in the room here who can answer some of those questions that I most likely cannot. Okay. <clears throat> so this slide shows the overview of the work group's objectives. So the basic questions that we were asking these non-Salmonid biological opinions for the operation of the ground fish fishery was, of course, the first one, was the incidental take amount exceeded? Does new information reveal any new effects that were not previously um, considered in the biological opinions? And then um, the work group also makes recommendations for future reports that may improve bycatch estimates. And if necessary, the work group would pose conservation management measures to minimize bycatch of any listed species. So that basically is a very high level summary of what the terms of reference suggest. In general, what we found was that no incidental take amounts were exceeded in 20, uh, were exceeded, excuse me. And there was no new identif information identified that could help or reveal um, any effects not previously considered. There are, however, several recommendations um, for future reports, in, which include a, one uh, item would be a sensitivity analysis. There are uh, there was, excuse me, there was great support for a more permanent industry member position. Um, they noted that Mr. Bob Adder, who worked in with the group this last time, was of great assistance, and they recommend, they will recommend that uh, more, more representation by the industry would probably be a good thing. And then there was widespread support for a fixed gear logbook. Uh, the rationale there would, would be that it would reduce any uncertainty in bycatch estimates for protected species. So looking at the first, the fishing effort report, overall uh, the patterns, the effort patterns were similar in this report as have been in other reports. They did however notice that there's been an uptick in midwater rockfish trawl sector um, their landings have roughly doubled between 2017 and 2018. They also noted that um, there was somewhat of a fleet-wide pot use. The fleet, the pot gear was decreased in 2019, but yet did increase a bit in 2019. Um, and again, these changes, while interesting, were not notable in the sense that they didn't require a new... Uh, a new look at any of the biological opinions. So for our first species that we're looking at here with the humpback whales. So there have been two documented takes of humpback in the history of the ground fish fishery, at least since 2006. And that was in the limited entry sablefish pot fishery sector in 2014. And then one in the open access fixed gear pots fishery sector in 2016. Uh, the estimate for a five-year average of 2.16 whale per year. Um, of course, as the council recalls, that the 2020 biop just came out, and the council did do some work on that report or on that biological opinion in April. Um, 
That particular biological opinion assumes that approximately 90% of the sable fish pot fishing effort is off of California and Oregon, and roughly the remainder, 10%, is off Washington. Um, one thing that the work group did agree on is that future bycatch reports should include a check-in on sable fish pot fishing effort, um, especially the distribution, um, as this distinction can help inform take by each, uh, distinct population segments calculated in the opinion. And this slide, of course, shows a whale and probably her calf, along with the estimated take over the last uh, since 2016 of these whales, with the uncertainty bars being there and the uncertainty being highlighted in gray. So overall, there were no work group recommendations. Um, there was wide support for um, more workshops and robust <laughs> industry engagement. And this is something that the council supported back in April as well. Um, they did identify, however, several new conservation measures um, that, in addition to the ones presented in April, could help, um, I guess, develop um, or could uh, jumpstart the, the action that, the, that National Fisheries will be undertaking this year. And that is, of course, uh, as you see here, changes to the gear configuration regulations that would allow uh, vessels to voluntarily use one buoy line instead of two buoy lines. This is, of course, for pot here. Explore EM for the limited entry pot fishery to increase coverage and reduce uncertainty. And also to investigate the use of AIS beacons to get near real-time gear location information. And while not recommendations, they do, um, they do think that these are, are good avenues to explore. <laughs> short tail albatross. So between 2018 and 2019, there were no documented uh, short tail takes. Uh, there is a fleet-wide estimate of roughly 0.2 to 1.8 short tail per year. Um, based on the analyses presented in the bycatch report, the groundfish fishery did not exceed its threshold, its incidental take threshold, of an estimated five albatrosses in the two-year period or one albatross in a two-year period. What they did, uh, what the work group did talk a little bit about was the, was the cooperative research that's undergoing. Um, what certain findings are, or what findings are showing is that um, there is a, uh, a risk to stall regulated to trawl gear, but however, it's significantly less than what was thought before. Um, the National Fishery Service intends to convene a public meeting and workshop later on, hopefully this year to present the results. Um, based on US Fish and Wildlife recommendations, the NIPS is con concentrating its resources on issues that are greatest or greater conservation concerns. Specifically, uh, what NIPS is looking into is research into avoidance and or minimization measures to reduce interactions with floating longline gear. Um, this research on floating longline gear is funded for 2022 as being planned in a cooperative effort through NIPS, Oregon Sea Grant, and industry collaborators. Um, the research is really hoping to recommend an operationally feasible solution to protect um, floated long lines from seabirds. So they also discussed telemetry and observer data. Um, because short tail albatross are likely to continue to expand in larger numbers into its former range as the species uh, recovers, the council directed the work group to report out on any new telemetry or observer data south of 36 north latitude. Uh, this request was made for purposes of possibly reconsidering the exemption from streamer, require, streamer line requirement for long line vessels operating south of 36. As of the work group's report, there still have been no short tail albatross sighting south of 36 degrees latitude since 2011. And there are no new observations or tele telemetry data south of 36. Um, one thing to note is that this, uh, these observations would have come from observer data and observer coverage, as well as fishing effort in that particular area, which is south of 36, is, um, is low. Um, I do believe there will be a public comment coming up here a little bit later that will discuss uh, this particular uh, sighting issue further. So 
What the uh, work group also discussed is they would like some guidance from the council on if the work group should continue to review and summarize uh, short tail albatross telemetry and observer data south of 36 degrees north in future reports. So we did have some recommendations for the council to consider. Um, the first one is the council, or excuse me, the work group recommends the council support efforts to improve streamer lines or gear configurations for the purpose of mitigating seabird interactions. And it also recommended council encourage industry participation and cooperative research to test these new mitigation measures for floated longline gear that are designed specifically to reduce bycatch of seabirds. Ulicon. So, Ulicon overall, um, at least on the grounds, what we've seen is an increase in Ulicon bycatch in 2018 and 2019. However, the important thing to note here is that those increases also reflect increases in adult abundance in estimates. Um, Ulicon bycatch was still well under the precautionary and reinitiation thresholds. So, in 2019, Ulicon bycatch was 30% the precautionary threshold and roughly 15% of the reinitiation threshold. Um, one thing to note is the work group does um, think that the Columbia River um, Ulicon spawning stock biomass survey is very important to their work, um, as well as uh, the work of the Endangered Species Act uh, investigations. It's a fundamental monitoring program for this population, it forms a basis, in this case, for the work group's estimates of abundance. And it, it is the, it's these impacts of the ground fish fishery are measured against per the opinion. The survey is conducted by the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and is supported in part by fundings from NIMPS West Coast Region Protected Species Resources Division. And this funding is made available through a yearly proposal process conducted by the West Coast Region. Um, available funding does vary from year to year and is not guaranteed. So the recommendation that the council has, excuse me, the recommendation that the work group has for the council is to express support for the continued funding of the survey. And this shows, this uh, particular chart shows the, the estimated take from 2002 through 2018. Green sturgeon. So on the West Coast, there are two distinct population segments for green sturgeon. Um, only the southern distinct population segment is listed under the ESA. Uh, the estimated number of southern DPS encountered in the federally managed ground fish sectors for 2015 to 2019 range from 0 to 12 per year. And this is based on individual genetic stock identification assignments and area-wide proportions. So as you can see in this chart here on uh, the left-hand side of your screen is that the yellow bars, the estimated southern DPS bycatch has not exceeded the incidental take statement amount of 28 per year um, in the entire, since 2002. Um, the overall, the work group did not have any recommendations for the groundfish fishery regarding green sturgeon. Um, one thing to note, though, for council uh, information is that the bycatch report does include a section on the observed bycatch of green sturgeon in the directed Pacific halibut fishery. Uh, one green sturgeon was observed off California in 2019. Uh, this halibut vessel, or this, excuse me, this vessel retained ground fish under an open access trip limits on the same trip. And so since the primary purpose of this particular trip was established as a Pacific halibut trip uh, during the debriefing, uh, the work group agreed that the bycatch would be best assigned to the Pacific halibut fishery. Okay. Leatherback sea turtle. So since 2006, there's only been one observed leatherback sea turtle caught in West Coast ground fishing gear, and this occurred in 2008 with an open access vessel using pot gear. Uh, the biological opinion limit is an average of 0.38 leatherbacks per year for the most recent five-year period or up to one turtle in a single year. And since 20, between 2015 and 2019, there were no observed bycatch. Therefore, the limit uh, was not exceeded. 
Noting this particular issue for Leatherback sea turtle is uh, global. The work group is concerned that with the declining trend of the sea turtle, this, this species of sea turtle um, is primarily related to the international fisheries and observer coverage office issues. So the work group recommends that the council explore uh, ways to support leatherback sea turtle recovery through re the regional fisheries management organizations, or RFNOs. And with that, I'll close my rather disjointed presentation. Uh, I would like to thank, uh, obviously, all the members of the work group who gave presentations and attended the meeting. Like always, it's been a webinar, so it's a difficult meeting for it to, to process. We'd also like to um, thank, especially Ms. Dr. Kate Richardson for putting together the snapshot brochure that's included in your briefing book. Um, that was hopefully has been well received and we would love to hear some council feedback on that. Um, another thing is that the work group uh, does work well together and it continually and successfully fosters effective communication between listed species experts and fisheries managers. Um, so we would like to, in closing, thank everyone who attended and I'll open it up to uh, what questions I can answer at this time. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, uh, Todd, for pitch hitting there. Um, hopefully, if there is a question you can't answer, maybe you can phone a friend. Uh, Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Todd, thanks a lot uh, for the pitch hitting on this report. I appreciate it. And uh, I did have the pleasure of sitting in on a lot of the endangered species work group and hearing that. And I want to comment that the participation by Bob Etter on, as industry was, was really valuable. And I, I thought I, he did a really good job. So I just wanted to say that. I had a question for you. You made mention in a couple spots of an electronic log or a log book and the potential for a check-in on the, uh, you know, in, in the log book, mandatory log book and a potential for a check-in somewhere. And I'm aware of the log book that's being developed that is was purported to be a electronic log book for seabird, uh, seabird, I believe, mitigation. But is this going to, do you know if this will be like a Swiss Army knife that will can check the box on the, the log book you're noting for this, uh, this, this fleet as well and supporting the fixed gear log book? And I, you know, it seems to me it wouldn't, wouldn't run a development of a new log book. And it, if the more utility, the better, the more we can get out of it, the better and not, not have a bunch of disparate log books, but maybe something that can do multifunction. So question is that is, is, is that part of this log book? And is that what you're referring to? Through the chair. Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Dooley. Um, I think I might have to phone a friend on this, but I believe it would be my understanding that they, the, that the fixed gear logbook that's being developed would also include, um, I guess, fields for this type of information. However, um, perhaps Ms. Kent could better supply an answer as she is more intimate with that particular process uh, on the NIMP side of things at the moment. Sure, thanks, Todd. Uh, just a quick mic check. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Um, hi, yes, yeah, so I can talk to the, the fixed gear question. Thanks, Mr. Dooley. Um, so for the logbook, uh, we are intending that it is a comprehensive uh, logbook for all fixed gear for the ground fish fisheries. Um, so it would cover all the different sectors that use fixed gear. Um, and you know, attempt to be as comprehensive as possible, not just to fulfill the term and condition related to the seabird biop, but also provide information, for example, for the humpback biop. Um, and then certainly uh, there's a lot of other utility in a logbook um, for other council purposes beyond just ESA um, species. So we do intend to be comprehensive and efficient about that data collection and, and provide that um, for many management uses. Thank you, Todd, and thank you, Keeley, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for letting me uh, weigh in. I, that that's great. I, I I really see the utility in a in a field that maybe has a check in and a check out, and being able to to actually get a lot more data out of that by understanding when when and where people are or when they're engaging. Okay. So thank you. 
All right, Bob, thanks for the question. Uh, further questions on the work group report? Uh, I have one, if you can answer it, um, Todd. Um, in, a, in a public comment, a written public comment, there was a suggestion to require or to explore the use of ropeless gear in the fixed gear fishery. Was that, was that discussed? Uh, and if it was, uh, was and I don't, didn't see that on the recommendations. Um, you know, wh what did the work group, I mean, did it discuss it? And if so, what, what was said? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for the question. As I recall, it was discussed. Um, I believe there were still concerns regarding the uh, I, regarding the technology at this at this point. Um, so I, they didn't really go in any recommendations, um, but they did note that you know that this particular technology is being considered in California for the crab, the Dungeons crab fishery is also being considered on the East Coast, I believe for lobster fishery and their right whale concerns there. However, um, that we discussed it, but we didn't go much further than that other than noting the, uh, the basic concerns of the technology at this point. Um, yes, yeah, that's how I would answer that, Mr. Chair. All right. Thanks, Todd. Uh, any further questions on the work group report? Well, thanks, Todd. You did a did a great job there. Um, we now have a gap report. Dan Waldeck, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Having to move some screens around there. Um, good afternoon, Dan Waldeck with the Grandfish Advisory Subpanel. I'll be reading agenda item G4A, supplemental gap report on the groundfish endangered species work group. The gap received a presentation from Mr. Brian Hooper. National Fisheries Service, West Coast Region. Mr. Hooper's presentation summarized the work group report provided in the advanced briefing book. The GAP appreciates the comprehensive report and notes the work group's findings support our previous recommendations about the positive mutual benefits that can be derived from collaborations among fishery participants, managers, and scientists. For example, long line fishery mitigation measures for seabirds, cooperative research about trawl albatross interactions, and direct participation by fishery participants in the work group. On this last point, the GAP is pleased that our April 2021 recommendation for Mr. Bob Etter to serve on the work group produced the positive outcomes that we envisioned. The GAP continues to recommend that a fishery representative seat be formally added to the work group. We will comment further on this topic under agenda item C9, membership appointments and council operating procedures. Specific to two of the conservation measures related to humpback whales outlined on page five of the workgroup report, the GAP provides the following comments. Related to bullet number one, the GAP supports this potential regulatory change to allow for use of one buoy line as a voluntary rather than mandatory measure because there may be positive benefits from the use of two buoy lines. For example, if one buoy line is lost, then the gear can be retrieved because of the presence of the second buoy and may reduce the likelihood that gear will be lost and become ghost gear. Therefore, the GAP supports the measure as described in the work group report, but notes that it would need further exploration and fishery participant input were it to be evaluated as a mandatory requirement, especially in considering the trade-offs between the reduced potential for whale entanglement and the increased potential for lost ghost gear. Related to bullet number three, the GAP agrees with the, group, with the work group recommendation. However, the GAP stresses that a regulatory requirement mandating the use of AIS for gear marking, gear marking be avoided because this could impose a significant financial burden on fishery participants. For example, requiring AIS could be a major problem for the Dungeness crab fishery because of the need for AIS units on each pot and the associated cost. In contrast, AIS is generally seen as a cost-effective tool for longline and pot sablefish fisheries. Therefore, the GAP recommends voluntary use of AIS rather than creating a regulatory mandate. Moreover, in considering the use of AIS for gear marking, it is important to recognize that federal law currently prohibits use of AIS for gear marking. The FCC is currently considering this issue and taking comments. The North Pacific Fishery Management Council provided a letter to the FCC in April 2021, 
recommending, among other things, we submit that the regulatory provisions that allow AIS to serve as private aids to navigation should be extended to AIS fishing gear marking buoys. Therefore, consistent with the work group's suggestion to investigate the use of AIS beacons to get near real, real to get near real time gear location information, and to facilitate the current and future use of AIS for gear marking, the GAP recommends the council engage with the FCC about the issue, like the North Pacific Council. That ends the GAP report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. Are there questions on the GAP report? Thank you, Dan. Uh, that completes the reports that I have and will take us to public comment. We have two uh, speakers. We'll first hear from Anna Weinstein. Got to get that right. Hi, thanks, Chair Garalnik and council members. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, um, thanks for the opportunity to comment. Um, yeah, so we submitted a letter on behalf of National Audubon, Portland Audubon in Oregon, uh, American Bird Conservancy and the Center for Biological Diversity um, speaking on behalf of those organizations today. Um, and the Pacific Seabird Group of uh, Marine Ornithologists has weighed in on this in the past and they're here in spirit. Um, and we're engaged because we care deeply um, about our three species of North Pacific albatrosses, um, which use the whole Pacific Ocean and uh, deserve a chance to thrive into the future. Um, it's the incredible dedication of, of so many people over the decades uh, to bring these birds back from uh, severe depletion or in the case of short-tailed albatross near extinction, um, that there are now hundreds of thousands of black-footed albatrosses, over a million lace and albatrosses, and um, several thousand short-tailed albatrosses. And fishermen and agency managers are part of that story, um, putting in place streamer lines and other measures to reduce incidental bycatch. Um, which brings us here today. We, we thank NEMS, um, and specifically um, Tom Good and Jason Janot uh, and others, and Sea Grant staff like Amanda Gladix, um, for good communication um, with us over these past few years about um, activities and progress on implementing the, the um, biological opinions, terms and conditions for short-tailed albatross. And we really appreciate the work group meeting discussion and report. And so while incidental bycatch levels have not been exceeded, and that's to be commended, um, council attention and, and action today is warranted um, to address um, past council direction related to terms and conditions, and also the request for guidance from the ESA work group itself, which our letter notes. Um, so in 2019, the council directed managers to develop, um, quote, enforceable floated mainline gear configurations that can sink within the streamer line zone to reduce seabird interactions. Um, also in 2019, the GMT similarly recommended the development of these enforceable approaches for the floated um, gear, which extend beyond the extent of streamer lines and have much, much higher levels of attack of, on, from albatrosses on those lines, putting these uh, birds and also the fleet at risk. Um, and then in June, in this June ESA work group, the work group says, quote, the work group recommends the council encourage industry participation and cooperative research to test alternative mitigation measures for floated longline gear that are designed to further reduce bycatch of seabirds. And this is really important considering, um, um, so two short-tailed albatrosses were caught in, um, in late 2020 in the Alaska demersal longline fishery. Um, and I don't actually know, I should, but I don't know what the incidental catch um, provisions are for, um, for that fleet, but two in a short period is bad and suggests a threat to the fishery. We want to avoid this here, um, as um, was mentioned before, short-tailed albatrosses are increasingly um, being um, tracked in southern California, in south of 36 degrees north. Um, so the, combining those two things, um, I, I have suggested um, two things for you to do today um, to take in consideration um, that um, you request that NIMS next year provides um, 
its work plan and timeline for developing enforceable floated mainline gear. And this could just be simply a description of what it's doing. I just, I don't have a good understanding of what it's doing. And it just seems super important. This seems like the biggest gap in, in the um, incidental bycatch reduction activities. And then in March 20, so also in next year, NIMS reports back on, um, does, prepares a report on the occurrence of short-tailed albatrosses south of 36 degrees. Um, and, you know, including observer data, but also survey data and telemetry coming from academic institutions and others. Um, and this, I would like to also note, this could help with um, understanding offshore wind uh, impacts on these species on short-tailed albatross um, to have that, that uh, to add that as a data layer for, for BOEM um, as it moves forward, I guess. Um, so, and also just to the last thing is the ESA work group is looking for council guidance on that specifically on the south of 36 degrees. Um, so that concludes my comment. I'd be happy to take any questions and um, thanks uh, everyone for your hard work. Thank you, Anna, for your comment. Um, any questions of Anna? Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, we'll next hear from Bob Alverson. Bob? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Wait, can you pick hold me on up? a second. Can you, Bob, can I pause you for a second? Yep. I just saw Phil's hand. Phil, did you have a question for Anna? Yes, Mr. Chair, and I apologize for my late hand raising. Not at um, all. My, it was my fault. Um, Anna, can you, uh, on, on the recommendation, um, that's relative to logbook requirements. Um, could you could you expand on that a little bit for me, to, so I understand what that recommendation is all about, and whether or not there's has this been has this been embedded uh, in the work group uh, discussion. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Anderson. Um, so the logbook requirement is actually one of the terms and conditions. Um, so it's term and condition number two for reasonable and prudent measure number four. And so, so in the, um, you may remember that earlier there was a, um, uh, I think it was the April meeting there, or maybe the March meeting, there was a um, NIMS prepared a report on uh, specifically on short-tailed albatross. Um, and the performance of the, um, or the, the, uh, the, the, the an, an, an analysis of the incidental catch uh, requirements and how the fleet has done and that it hasn't exceeded those requirements. So NIMS reported in that report that it's, quote, currently developing an electronic fixed gear logbook with the goal of completing the rulemaking in 2022 so the logbook can be in place for the 2023 fishery. Um, so our concern is that there's low observer coverage in some areas of the fishery and that um, this, is, this action has been um, going on or this, this activity to finish the logbook has been going on for a while. And um, so we thought it'd be good in, in our letter, and I didn't mention it just now, but our letter suggests the council requests NIMS to commit to the schedule kind of more formally. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does, Arnold. Thank you. And thanks, Mr. Chairman. Certainly. All right, if there are no further questions of Anna, we'll go back to Bob. Welcome, Bob. Uh, you're muted, Bob. There you go. Am I coming through okay now? Yeah, got you now. Okay, good. Um, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the, the time here from the council on agenda item, uh, uh, this agenda item on um, uh, over, overfish species, uh, endangered species. The, the element that I'd like to testify to is the gear marking. Um, as indicated in the gap report, the FCC has given an opportunity for public comment. It began on June 16th and it goes for 30 days, so uh, July 16th, I think, is the cutoff. Um, for, and they're allow, the, the in, intention is to, to uh, 
they may change the regulations to allow fixed gear people to use uh, AIS systems to mark the ends of their gear. Uh, the ends of our gear are marked uh, such that uh, if you have an AIS system, you can see where our gear is so you don't set each other down as, as fixed gear uh, participants or a trawler won't go through the middle of a long line or pot gear and get that in their trawl gear. We also work with uh, the tug and barge and uh, the cruise ship industry with the setting of our, of our gear with these AIS systems. So we're encouraging the council to send a letter similar to the North Pacific Council uh, during this uh, public comment period that the FCC, FCC has set up. And that's my request from the association members, Mr. Chair. So that ends my comments. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, we have a couple of questions here. Louis Zinn followed by Phil Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, welcome, Bob. I remember when I was on the GAP, uh, we talked uh, a lot about uh, floated long lines, floating long lines, why they exist. Can, can you tell us real quickly why these quote unquote floating long lines exist and, and, and clear it up to what they actually are? Because uh, I have a lot of confusion in that. And, and I know that my fellow bird enthusiasts listening would probably like to know more about it real quick, if you could. Uh, through the chair, um, yeah, Mr. Zim, uh, my organization doesn't use a lot of that gear. Uh, it is generally used south of the Columbia River, though it has been used uh, further north. And it, it's used uh, further south of the Columbia River because of uh, slime meal problems. Uh, if uh, you're hard on bottom with your long line gear uh, and the, the fish happen to die on the gear, when they get hooked, uh, they are susceptible to the slime eels and they're just extremely plentiful and uh, you can lose your, your set if you don't timely haul your gear. And so if they're up off the bottom and, and so they can use buoyant uh, ground line um, or sometimes they put fl floats on the, on the ground line um and to keep them up off uh, off off the the sediment does that answer the question mr zim yes it does i was particularly wondering uh you know the difference between a floated ground line and and the floats actually on the hooks and and that that cleared it up it could be both thank you uh phil anderson yeah thanks again mr chair and uh thanks bob for your testimony on the issue of uh Utilize an AIS to mark um, the ends of the gear. Um, <laughs> it, is it my understanding that that is currently not allowed? Uh, through the chair, uh, Mr. Anderson, that's correct. Uh, during the last year and a half, there's been sort of a handshake agreement uh, that uh, law enforcement wouldn't. Uh, um, enforce this uh, until uh, the FCC, FCC made a decision uh, earlier this year, or, or actually last fall, the, the St. John Second out of Seattle was boarded off a Newport when fishing Black Cod, and uh, he had AIS units on the boat, and he was reported to a California FCC out of uh, Southern Southern California somewhere, and he got a warning uh, just about a month ago. It came to him that uh, threatened like nineteen thousand dollars a day violations and those type of things that we see in Magnus and Act law. So um, he has been told he cannot use it in off the coast, uh, the lower coast or the northern coast. I suspect there's a, a great deal of boats still using them in off off of Alaska. Uh, but uh, that is going to come to an end if the uh, FCC does not act affirmatively on this. Okay, thanks, Bob. And, and um, in terms of the, I don't want to get into the weeds here, but uh, in terms of how the, what shows up on your AIS in terms of identifying that in fact that is a 
a piece of, of a relative to fishing gear as opposed to a vessel? Are there specific, would there be specific requirements as to how they are represented um, so that all of the, for all the reasons you identified, uh, people that see them know what they are as opposed, you know, a vessel a rel in, in being able to dis distinguish them from the end of uh, fishing gear versus a vessel? Uh, through the chair, um, most of the FVOA fleet, there's a variety of AIS systems available. And the one that uh, uh, most of the FVOA fleet are using, uh, when they put them on the end of the gear, it says boy one, boy two. So it, it doesn't say fishing vessel. The biggest complaint we have heard is when boats go into harbor and fail to turn these things off, and let's say there's six of them on the boat, if you're coming in and have your AIS system on, all of a sudden it looks like you got six uh, buoys right in front of you. So there probably is going to be a need a requirement that these things can't be turned on when you go into port. Um, but uh, there are different um, radio signals, or if, I don't know if that's the right term, uh, that we're going to have to work with the FCC on to to get this requirement through. I think. Okay, Bob. Yeah, the, the ones that I've seen up here off our coast have had that buoy one verse two three four type marking. I just and it certainly makes sense. You'd want them turned off when they weren't uh, being used in uh, fishing activities. So, all right, thanks, Bob, appreciate it. Uh, Bob Dooley and then Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thanks, Bob, for coming forward today to appreciate this conversation. I, I uh, the little I know about it, and I've been following it relatively closely, is that the FCC is thinking about uh, shipping this AIS technology for buoys and, and in markings into a completely different frequency that would not be available, would not be visible to other AIS units, to like its own independent system for a, a person to see it on his own, maybe other other fishermen. And I, it, I could see that being problematic because, I mean, I think a, a large part of the utility of this is, um, you know, people that have AIS would be able to see them and avoid it or actually even see if there was an entanglement and you have a, a buoy going up the coast at five knots, it might alert someone that there's something wrong there. So I, I I was wondering what your input would be on that about, and do you know about these, that alternate channel or frequency they're talking about that wouldn't be visible? And have you had any interactions? And perhaps is that something that if the council weighs in on that should mention? Uh, through the chair, Mr. Dooley, uh, thanks for bringing that up. That's uh, that co that uh, is in a paragraph in their uh, public uh, disclosure for comment, and I don't know if it is just to try to get uh, public comment to see what if there's support for something like that, uh, uh, reach out by the FCC or not. But it would not be functional uh, if the other boats, the tug and barge, the cruise ship, or or a trawler or another pot boat could not read um, the buoys out there. Uh, that's what they're for. That's what this whole system's for is to avoid, avoid uh, uh, gear conflict. Um, and so, yeah, we, that should be commented on in any letter. And that's being organized through a number of people in Alaska and down off the coast here to comment on that specifically as well, Mr. Dooley. Thank you, Bob. I know that I've seen those in the Marine Traffic app and you can see the the gear around a vessel that's working, and it's it's very informative. And I could see how that would be particularly useful, particularly at night when you know that you don't quite see the buoys and the bad weather and such. It would be a, a real useful thing. So I, I thank you for coming forward. Yeah, they're important in the fog too. All right, thanks, Bob, for the question. Bob, for the answer. Uh, Marcy Yaremko. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Bob, for your testimony here. Um, I'm a little unclear on exactly what you're looking for with regard to a letter from the council, or are you asking for folks to consider signing on to a letter that's being prepared elsewhere? 
Um, also wondering, you know, if you're asking the council to draft and um, and send a letter, like where where would the council find the content? And um, just noting that you know, we haven't, I think, heard from the EC on this topic. So maybe you can elaborate on what the letter writing effort is that, that you're asking for. Uh, through the chair, uh, Marcy, uh, I believe in the uh, gap statement, we linked the North Pacific Council letter. And um, I think something along the lines uh, with a paragraph addressing the issue that Mr. Dooley brought up would be all that's needed. Um, and we can forward you the, uh, the notice that the FCC sent out on the 16th uh for, you know for purpose of they have an email to send it send a send comments in or an address so we're looking for a letter from the the the, North, uh, the pacific fishery management council marcy follow up if i may please thank you um so i i guess i'm just wanting to hear that did the ec um, receive any briefing on this or how, were they part of the discussion with the gap on this issue? If that's a question to me, I don't recall uh, the uh, executive director being involved. Okay, thank you. Any further questions for Bob? Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you. Oh wait, Phil Anderson. Go ahead, Phil. So I think there is a little mix up in the ED versus EC from Bob's response to Marcy's question. So were the any of the enforcement consultants engaged in this conversation with the GAP, Bob? Uh, no, they were not. And uh, the FCC has been uh, relying on the Coast Guard, at least uh, in out of Juneau and off of Washington for, for enforcement out of this. I don't know which uh, district uh, enforced the one on the St. John out of, out of Newport, Oregon. So uh, I would think the Coast Guard be the one enforcement agency that uh, the council might want to talk to. Okay, thanks, Bob. All right, well that, uh, let's see, Scott McGrew. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Just. Just to comment, um, Mr. Alverson, did you, um, if, you, if you weren't there at the beginning of the council meeting, I did raise this point um, and put the word out. I know you and I have talked a bunch about, about this issue and uh, I, I think we view this as, as a positive um, to get what is um, going on uh, to get some resolution on it. Because we, we, while we aren't going out of our way to go find buoys um, when 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 we happen across that we are relaying that information um, on, on occasions it has been relayed to the FCC when there's something that happens right in front of us. Um, so I, I I did mention in open comment uh, management bodies at the beginning of the meeting um, that this was this was uh, uh, notice proposed rulemaking a request for public comment was out there from the FCC. And I just wasn't sure if you heard that on the first day. Yeah, I don't think I picked that up. I'm sorry. Oh, that's, we're, yeah, just wanted you to know we are, we're tracking. Yep. All right. Any further questions? Thank you, Bob. Yeah. You're relieved. Um, so that concludes uh, public comment uh, on this agenda item. Um, as a reminder, we had written public comment as well and takes us to our council action. And one is to consider recommendations that are in the report to identify measures to be evaluated with specs and um, re-identify any other actions. So uh, let's see who wants to get us started. Maggie Summer. Thanks, Chair Grelnick. Uh, if I may maybe just ask uh, Steph whether the uh, GM, Grand Fish Management team 
reviewed the ESA Working Group report. Is that for Todd? Yes, please, thank you. Mr. Chair, Ms. Summer, yes, thank you for the reminder. I, I apologize for, for being remiss and forgetting that. The GMT uh, received a briefing from Mr. Cooper on their June 10th uh, webinar that he went through the presentation. They had a discussion regarding the, uh, the work group report, um, noting, of course, that Caroline McKnight and Lynn Mattis uh, on the GMT are both members of that work group. Um, the GMT found that the recommendations contained within the work group report, um, they agreed with them. They, um, and they just felt that writing a statement, a single sentence statement was probably um, lower on their priority list given the, the heavy items that are coming up here in the, uh, um, the council session. So short way of saying that is the GMT agrees with the findings and the recommendations held within the work report. Thank you. Maggie? Thank you, Chair, and thanks very much, Todd. Um, I, I agree that a, a report doesn't sound necessary, but appreciate knowing that the GMT reviewed it and concurred with the recommendations. Uh, Mr. Chair, while I've got an open mic, I have uh, two other brief comments, if I may. Absolutely. Thanks. First is to uh, thank Mr. Bob Etter for participating in the work group meeting, uh, as I recall, on relatively short notice. Um, and I, I will be uh, supportive of adding an industry seat to the work group, although I think that's something uh, we may take up under C9 COPs instead of today. Uh, and second, uh, when Todd gave his uh, overview and, and presentation at the beginning of this agenda item, I caught that he mentioned that uh, NIMS is interested in feedback on uh, what Todd called the snapshot report describing effort in groundfish fisheries from 2002 to 19. And uh, I just offer that I found it very helpful, both in considering this agenda item, but also uh, of much broader interest. There are many times during our work that an understanding of groundfish fishery history is needed, and this is a great resource. Uh, so I suggest we all um, keep that in, in mind for our own use, and it's certainly something I, I'll be pointing others toward when there's interest. Uh, look forward to future updates from NIMPS as appropriate. And just a, a big thank you to Dr. Kate Richardson and her co-authors, as well as uh, a whole lot of observers and data analysts whose work over the years uh, made a summary like that possible. Thanks. Thank you, Maggie. Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just kind of wanted to circle what I, the concerns I had about this um, issue that Bob Alverson had brought up about AIS and buoy markings and the FCC and all of those things. And reflecting on Marcy's comments about not making it, you know, not making it mandatory for Dungeness crab and and, and, and those issues. And, I, I'm, and others said the same. And I think we got to keep that in mind because although it works, I think, just fine for uh, some uh, fixed geared people. And, and I think it, it looks like it demonstrates a lot of utility in there, but I think it would be absolutely, and I think you said the same thing, the wrong tool for Dungeness Crab to impose. So I wouldn't necessarily prohibit it, but I, would, I wouldn't I would necessarily make it mandatory either. So I think it's important that it is a, an option. And I think we'll, you know, as time goes on, it may become better and may have a different idea of it. But I, at this time, I think it's important if we write a letter that it, we don't, we're not looking to make this mandatory. And if it's to the FCC, we're looking to have something that all vessels can see. So I just wanted to kind of put a bow on that with my thoughts. So thank you. Sure, Bob. Uh, Bush Smith. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would, um, I do support uh, what Councilman Dooley said on the uh, crab industry. I, I mean, if they want to do it, that's they can do it on their own cord, but. Um, certainly not a requirement on the crab and industry with all the individual pots they have so it'd be impractical and probably a heck of a lot of money added to their industry so anyway i just wanted to support bob's uh comments thank you mr chairman 
Sure, uh, Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, well, one of the issues that was brought to us both in public comment as well as the work group had to do with short-tailed albatross telemetry and observer data South 36 um, and whether or not um, the data that comes from south of that latitude should be included in future reports. And I'm a strong supporter um, of saying yes to that question. Um, you know, we have, as we all are well aware, we have uh, lots of changes going on in the oceans associated with, particularly associated with climate change, ocean warming, acidification, how that's affecting uh, the lower end of the food web, all those kinds of things. And we have incredible migration um, both patterns and distances that are covered by certain seabirds. I mean, we have bullers, shearwater that show up here in the late summer and early fall that have come nest in New Zealand, South Polar skuas that are, that are coming from uh, Antarctica and that, that uh, come up here in the, in the summer. We've got city shearwaters uh, making um, essentially circle the uh, Pacific uh, coming out of nests in places like Chile and our albatrosses, which, um, you know, black, black foot albatross, lace ant albatross, short tailed albatross that, and, and with respect to that particular species coming from a, on a, a single island, essentially south of Japan. And uh, so we don't, we don't have a good understanding of how these migration patterns might be affected with all of the changes that are occurring. Short-tailed albatross, as we heard in public testimony, is by far and away uh, the least uh, abundant of the three, um, with numbers, I mean, they were they nearly suffered extinction as a result of a volcano on the island, on the only island where they nested at that time. They've slowly coming back and they're now I think there's about 2,000 uh, breeding pairs, as I, if my memory serves me correct. But so it's going to be extremely important in my mind for us to to track uh, any uh, interactions that occur uh, with uh, gears that are authorized through the Pacific Council's actions. And so for those reasons, I would um, voice strong support that. Uh, we continue to get that information summarized in future reports from that area of south of 36. Marcy? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, following uh, Phil's remarks, uh, I have a motion to offer the council. Sandra, if I may. Thank you. I move the council request NIMS make the following new information available for review and consideration by the Groundfish Endangered Species Work Group at its 2023 meeting. One, any new short-tailed albatross, to, albatross telemetry and observer data south of 36 degrees for purposes of considering whether the current exemption from the streamer requirement in this area remains appropriate. Number two, updates on fulfilling the terms and conditions of the incidental take statement for humpback whales. Number three, updates on research into avoidance or minimization measures to reduce bycatch from floating longline gear. Specifically, funded research in FY 2022 currently being planned by NIMS, Oregon Sea Grant, and industry collaborators. Additionally, the council recommends that NIMS continue its financial support of the Eulicon spawning stock biomass survey conducted annually by WDFW. Thank you, Marcy. Is the language there accurate and complete? Yes, it is. Thank you. I will look for a second. Wow, Maggie Summer. 
right. So we have a we have a motion and a second. Uh, Marcy, please speak to your motion. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I felt that it was particularly important for us to memorialize our request in a written motion. Um, while guidance might have sufficed, and I really appreciate the rationale <laughs> offered by Phil, um, I'm actually a little surprised that there was any question as to whether or not the council wanted the work group to receive this information and consider it um, at its biennial meetings. So I think it's very important that we specify this and make it clear that we are very interested in new telemetry and observer data uh, south of 36. Um, the um, decision that the council made to recommend um, excluding the area south of 36 from the streamer line requirement, um, we all remember that discussion. Um, I think we're all very excited about uh, the prospect of recovery uh, for this ESA uh, listed stock. Um, recent events in Southern California uh, that uh, Anna Weinstein brought to our attention um, are, uh, I think, very, not only exciting, but um, give us um, a lot of encouragement that, in fact, this uh, species is, in fact, um, reoccupying uh, its historic range. And I think um, we have an obligation to continue uh, to consider whether or not uh, this recommendation um, should stand to provide the exemption from the streamer line requirement. So, um, that is why I felt it was important that we get it uh, down in writing. Um, also appreciate uh, the updates that NIMS has continued to provide us on fulfilling the terms and conditions of the ITS uh, relative to humpback whales. Um, just wanted to uh, echo um, Todd's remarks at the beginning uh, in that uh, the ESA workgroup really is a great forum um, that has shown again um, how effective it is to coordinate activities um, that originate out of PRD um, with our council and with the assistance uh, of Sustainable Fisheries Division um, and NIMFS. Um, it's not lost on me <laughs> what an effort this is to pull uh, the right people and information together. Um, but I think that the framework we've established with the group, um, again, has shown uh, how effective it can be. Um, <clears throat> so look forward to um, continuing um, the work group's uh, oversight um, and input on this. And I think, um, you know, it's it's the right venue, and we we do appreciate um, the ongoing um, information that we're getting from NIMS on this topic. Uh, number two, um, on the issue of minimization measures to reduce by reduce bycatch from floating longline gear, um, it is very exciting that the research scheduled for 2022 is funded and the planning uh, is underway. I think we all. Um, recall the discussions and the uncertainty around the effectiveness of the streamer gear, uh, depending on the distance back from the boat that the floating long line um, would extend and if the streamers would effectively uh, deter um, birds from the floating long line gear. So I think um, we're all interested in uh, following the the latest with the research. Um, we also really appreciate the industry's uh, collaborations on this work and um, look forward to um, reviewing the recommendations that come out of this work. I, I think that the venue of the ESA work group is the right one and the timeline um, to hear more in two years looks right. Um, so appreciate that. Um, also, there was a, a recommendation um, in the work group's report uh, that the council encouraged NIMS to continue its financial support of the Eulicon spawning stock biomass survey that's conducted annually by WDFW. Um, it's uh, when we first heard about the Eulicon work oh, a number of years ago from Kevin Duffy. 
um, and how um, effective it was in helping us evaluate uh, the status of, of this, how this, how important the survey was to evaluating the status of the stock. I think we were all um, very convinced that this um, course of action to, to effectively monitor um, the species annually was was a really good one and appreciate the efforts of WDFW to uh, actually undertake the work. So um, I think this is something that we um, should uh, continue to support um, NIMS um, providing funding um, annually. Um, there are a few other work group recommendations that uh, we received today um, in the overview presentation that um, aren't part of the language of the motion. Um, for example, um, on the uh, short trail, short, um, short trail albatross um, council supporting efforts to explore ways to improve streamer lines or gear configurations for purposes of mitigating sea uh, Absolutely, I think we certainly support efforts to improve streamer lines and that's kind of spoken to um, in item three, um, but I don't think there was anything specific um, that we can do to encourage uh, the explorations beyond um, the work that's underway. Um, Certainly, again, um, agree with the recommendation from the work group that we encourage industry participation in the research. Um, and I think, you know, we are very interested in the outcome and application. So um, anyway, really appreciate the, the effort and the work um, and especially um, NIMF's uh, efforts to coordinate internally um, on so many different issues of importance uh, in our ground fish fishery. Um, and thanks. Thank you, Marcy, for the motion. Uh, let's see if there are any questions. Uh, Phil Anderson. I don't, well, I guess maybe I have a question, but more of a comment, I guess. Um, first of all, thank you, Marcy, for the motion. It's all the, it's all the points. And uh, also appreciate um, your perspective in ensuring that we get this written down. So thank you. Um, one of the things that was in um, one of the public comments on this public comment was a recommendation to um, provide a scope, a schedule and a scope for the work group to locate new potentially new information on like short-tailed albatross telemetry. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that an amendment is needed to the motion. Uh, but I, and I did look over the current membership of the work group and I do see a couple of people there on there that likely have some expertise in, in uh, seabirds. Um, but there is an incredible uh, wealth of information that comes from the um, bird community, um, I'll call it citizen science, uh, and um, their their communication linkages are incredible, um, and how they um, report sightings and those types of activities. So I would just, uh, um, uh, and, and I think that was, saw a little bit of that in some of the email uh, back and forth about what had gone on south of 36, just as it relates to the short-tailed albatross. But I would just, as part of number one there, uh, would want to uh, um, encourage uh, the work group to, to reach out to that, to the um, a bird community, I'll call them. Um, and because there are, um, there, there may be, uh, data out there that the work group members aren't aware of, um, and that group of citizen scientists can uh, really be valuable. So uh, that's all I have, Mr. Chairman, and thanks again, Marcy, for the motion. Thanks, Phil, for those comments. So further discussion on the motion? To 
Shell. Your hand, oh, there we go. So any further discussion on the motion? Uh, not seeing any hands, uh, I will call the question. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Uh, Marcy, thank you for the motion. So that takes care of some of the business we have on this agenda item, but I'm not sure that takes care of all of it. Um, are there any uh, recommendations not incorporated in Marcy's motion that we want to specifically address? Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a follow-up uh, for, I believe, council staff. I, I concur with Maggie's uh, earlier remark about considering uh, permanent membership uh, from a GAP representative on the EA, or on the work group. And I'm just um, assuming, like Maggie stated, that we'll take that discussion up um, in membership appointments uh, later in the week, but I didn't know how, um, I just wanted to make sure we capture that and just wondering if we need more discussion on that here in this item. Thanks, Marcy. Well, let me see if the, if the council has any other business on this agenda item, Phil Anderson. Um, uh, in, in my, um, attention to the other parts of the council action associated with this agenda item, I wasn't sure where we ended up with the potential letter, uh, regarding, uh, automatic identification systems, AIS, and the use of those on fishing gear in particular. Uh, fishing uh, buoys and poles that mark the end of long lines. So I, I may have missed something along the way. Well, I don't know that you missed it, anything. Uh, it was requested and <clears throat> Bob Alverson uh, discussed it. Um, you know, and there is a reference in the GAP report to the North Pacific letter, as Dan mentioned. Um, Heather Hall, thanks. Well, thank you, Chair. I I don't have a an answer to um, to Phil's question. It was on my list of things to follow up on, and I I did just raise my hand because I had a couple of other things too. But I I appreciate Phil's bringing up the the letter and this recommendation in the gap. Um, report and and from Bob's testimony and I'm unsure uh, what to do with it and I I worry I don't want to miss an opportunity um, to address something uh, that would be helpful um, but understand you know not making a recommendation for it um, I had a couple of things on halibut that I wanted to bring up too but I can wait until we have some resolution on what we're going to do about this letter if anything. Okay, yeah, let's 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 resolve the AIS letter issue and then we'll come back to you, Heather, for uh, for on halibut. So we've got the request. Um, I don't know that the council itself has had an opportunity to consider the North Pacific letter. I think we're, we're caught a little bit flat footed here, at least speaking for myself on this. Um, and, and when it comes to actually uh, the, the council actually taking uh, a position here on this issue. I don't know if executive director Tracy can offer any guidance here as to what, um, what we can ask staff to do or what's appropriate to do here. Chuck and then yeah. Phil. 
Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, um, you're so you're right. I don't think the council's you know reviewed the North Pacific letter or you know uh, had an opportunity to explore this in in detail. Um, so I guess uh, uh, you know depending on the urgency of this, I guess I would uh, encourage some more council discussion about whether they want to um, you know request this come back before the council in September or uh, uh, if, it, if they wanted, you know, I mean, I we could take a stab at it, uh, you know, and uh, based on the North Pacific letter, but, uh, but I guess, uh, again, I'm not sure that's uh, the best way to do business um, uh, without the council and its advisory bodies having, you know, specifically weighed in on issues, but, um, but, uh, you know, depending on how the council feels about it, uh, it's something we could consider. Um, and I suppose <clears throat> perhaps, uh, you know, if there was, um, some direction under workload planning for us to follow up on some of this, that might give the council an opportunity to uh, take a look at some of this over the next, uh, day or so to, uh, provide further direction to staff to carry out their wishes. But, um, and, and, I, and I guess, you know, I, I you know, as, as usual, you know, uh, um, scheduling something for uh, uh, September, uh, I guess, I'd, I guess I'd have to take a close look here and see, I, I, you know, I can't think of anything off the top of my head um, where this might fit under ground fish business. Um, but uh, well, I also think there's an issue with timeliness where there's a there's a comment period and I, I don't remember now exactly what the deadline is but yeah. I just, well, it looks like there's plenty of people ready to weigh in on this so I'll step aside all right so let's let's go to uh, Phil Anderson uh, and then I'll work down the list Phil yeah thanks Mr. Chair um, well I'm looking at the proposed rulemaking notice released June 16th says reply comment date is 60 days after date of publication. So I suspect it's somewhere in the middle of August. Um, and I, I mean, for those of us that spend a lot of time on the ocean, uh, we're very familiar with the AIS tool. It's relatively new. I mean, at least when you're old, like me, it's relatively new. Um, tool and it's being uh, widely used um, by the fishing industry. Um, people turn them on when they want to make sure people know where they, when they want others to know where they are. They turn them off when they don't, um, <laughs> generally. But uh, in terms of uh, safety at sea, um, the advent of AIS and particularly with the class B, there's a, there's a class A and a class B. The class B puts out, I think, five watts power and the class A, 25 watts power. So if the class B is more, it's less expensive. Um, but uh, I've seen it used um, and I see it virtually every time I go out, uh, used by not only the, the our long line fleet or uh, what the Potter long line, but I, they're also using it in our uh, spot prawn fishery um, out around Grays Canyon, where there's lots of vessel traffic, lots of ship traffic, tug and barge traffic, lots of so lots of opportunity. And and of course, there's uh, boat bottom trawl, there's midwater trawl, there's the whiting fishery, there's all kinds of stuff going on out there. And so the ability for fishermen to mark their gear uh, and, and thereby provide, uh, uh, I think, a, a, a significant um, increase in its um, safety, if you will, safety as in not getting run over um, by other types of activities that are going on out there is a really valuable tool to our, to our longline fishery. Certainly support the remarks associated with crab fishery would never in a million years 
suggest that every plot have AIS on it. But uh, a lot of our long line operations are out in the shipping lanes and out in, in where there's a lot of traffic uh, that can damage their gear. So I just think it's it's an opportunity for us to weigh in and, and show support. Um, I don't think it has to be a long, complicated letter. Uh, I suspect that the, I haven't had a chance to look at the North Pacific letter, but I suspect it hits the pertinent points. And if there are some in there that aren't particularly um, applicable to our situation, we can we can uh, deal with those. But um, I just think that this is an important issue and can be an important tool for our fleet. And if we have an opportunity to provide our comment on it, I think we should. Okay, thank you, Phil. Next screen just expanded, so now I can't see hands. There we go. Brad Pettinger followed by Louis Zim. Uh, thank you, Chair Grovick. Um, I, I agree with Phil. I think it's. Um, I think we should write a letter. Um, I think that the, my time being on some cable ships um, operating around. Um, uh, fixed gear that's been uh, utilizing a AIS, uh, like it's been described, has been extremely valuable uh, for those folks. They really appreciate it um, in the maritime industry. Um, if we're worried about you know, minimizing lost gear, um, that will certainly uh, help in that. If we want to go to a one or would, would like to see people use a one buoy configuration to minimize uh, impacts to marine mammals, um, I would say fishermen would be a lot more um, app to go to one buoy if they had AIS on it. And so um, I think that we have time here to uh, uh, get that, uh, share the letter with the council and uh, at least to see what it entails. And I think it's a big ask and I think we have to support our industry and uh, uh, for the um, economic and uh, conservation uh, reasons that have been discussed. Thank you. All right, thanks for that, Brad. Louis? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, do you pick me up? Uh, I've got you. I see you on AIS. Okay, good. I'm <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, I should have shut it off when I came into port then. Um, as someone that uh, hit a, uh, a prawn buoy gear with my research ship in a shipping lane, and we were definitely endangered by this. Uh, it was it was very, very tough. And of course, I didn't even think about how tough it must have been to the fisherman that lost all his gear and my eight foot high props. Um, I, I really agree with both Brad and, and Phil on this. And I have taken a, a quick look at the Alaska letter and, uh, and it seems very reasonable if, uh, if anybody wants to look at the last uh, chapter um, furthering the wise use of nation's fish resources while improving safety at sea should be our common objective. And I might note uh, one of the Magnuson Stevens requirements. So um, I would favor doing some action on this. Thank you. All right, um, I'm gonna to go to Marcy and I note that Brad's hand is still up. So I'll come back to you after Marcy. Is that okay, Brad? Marcy, why don't you go ahead? All righty. Um, just a question for council staff. Um, the council action we have on the screen, uh, item three, identify other appropriate actions to be evaluated as appropriate. Um, I think we're hearing a lot of support for the concept of a letter. I think uh, we heard Scott McGrew tee this up for us early in the week. Um, I'm a little concerned about um, whether we are in bounds. Uh, action-wise, to be able to task or direct development of a letter uh, here in this agenda item, it seems a little uh, afield from the topic of the Ground Fish Endangered Species Work Group report. So just asking for um, confirmation that, um, in fact, we're on the right track. All right, so we'll go to Todd or Chuck for that. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll take it, I guess. Um, well, uh, yeah, so um, I guess the, you know, this issue came up in the uh, Endangered Species Work Group report. It's come up in the GAP report. Um, 
number three is maybe not you know specifically worded to uh, address something like this but i think it is a little bit of a catch-all in terms of other appropriate actions <clears throat> and uh, to be evaluated as appropriate so i guess the evaluation is you know do we support this and the action would be to submit comments so i think i think we're probably on uh, safe enough ground here Louis, and then I'm going to suggest a conclusion. Go ahead, oh, Louis' hands down. So here's what I'm, oh, Heather Hall. Uh, wait, now we're, we're just talking about this AIS issue right now. So Phil Anderson? Uh, if, after you make whatever remarks you were needed to make there, Mr. Chairman, I do have a, I'm going to create a motion for the council consideration. Okay, well, um, uh, go ahead, please, with your motion. Sandra, will you, can you bear with me? And this will be short. Um, I move that the council write a letter to the Federal Communication Commission encouraging them to reconsider its prohibition of the use of AIS, Automatic Identification System is what that is, AIS, to mark fishing gear. So uh, Phil, uh, is that right? Should it be reconsider their prohibition on the use of AIS? Oh, I thought it said of the use of AIS, but yeah, use um, should be in there somewhere. Yeah, I, I thought I had it in there. I apologize if I okay. didn't. So that's that's the motion, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. Uh, and the language is accurate and complete. Yes. And looking for a second. Seconded by Heather Hall. So please speak to your motion as you deem necessary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, we, I think we've had a fair discussion on it. I, the language in the motion is is what is bolded in the final paragraph of the letter from the North Pacific to the FCC. Um, I would uh, rely on uh, the executive director and the council staff that craft the letter that is uh, utilizes the pertinent points uh, from this discussion as well as pertinent points that are made uh, in the North Pacific letter to um, indicate to the FCC what the Pacific Council's position is on this matter or indicate the rationale behind our request in this manner. Um, and I think the balance of the rationale has already been spoken to. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you for that, Phil. Is there, are there any questions of the maker of the motion or any discussion on the motion? Uh, then I will call the question. What? Uh, Chuck, you have your hand up, and then Brad. Yes, thanks, Mr. Chair. Just real quick, so just uh, just on the process, just the approval process, is this uh, something delegated to staff, or is this a quick response process? Well, uh, it's not in the motion, but I would think that wouldn't we typically at least uh, have a quick response on letters from the council. Uh, it's um, been done either way. So okay. We'll looking for your guidance. I will defer to the pleasure of the council on that, whether uh, the council wants to review the letter before it goes or, some, or feel this direction is clear enough that no further review is required. Um, Brad, then Phil, then Louie. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Rolnick. Um, 
not a big deal, but I mean, this is a national issue. I think the letter should basically address the uh, fisheries that pertain to the West Coast. I know, I know it's, um, we should ask for people to do it everywhere. Uh, and I'm, I assume that's probably going to be in, t in the way we're going to treat this. But uh, just to make sure we refer just to, to, we're asking for the West Coast only and not, um, not for anyone else. Thank you. All right, Phil, and then Louie. Well, I, I, if others, if anyone objects, I'm fine with going through the quick response uh, procedure. I think this issue is, and from my perspective at least, is fairly straightforward. We have the North Pacific letter, and I understand we've not everybody's had a chance to look at it. I've just looked through it. I think it hits the pertinent points that pertain to the Pacific Council area fisheries and the uh, fisheries that are under our purview. So, and I agree with Brad that we are only speaking about um, fishing gear that's associated with um, operations in under under Pacific Council's purview. So. Uh, I am totally comfortable with letting, uh, with having Chuck and the staff um, craft this letter and send it off. But I am also, if anyone objects to that, I'll certainly be happy to support the quick response procedure if people need that to have comfort. Okay, well, well uh, let's get this motion passed. If, if, if it does pass, then we'll address that issue. So are there any other questions on the motion? Discussion on the motion? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Kelly Ames abstains. Who was that? Kelly? Kelly for NIMS. thank okay. you. Yeah. Thanks, Kelly. All right, so the motion passes with one abstention. Now, I'm going to ask for a show of hands for those who want us to use the quick response procedure. And I'm not seeing any hands, so we will not use the quick response procedure. And we will um, defer to staff on this, with staff being aware of the comment deadline on this. Um, we've been going for two hours and 15 minutes. Uh, I know we have further discussion on this agenda item. I need to go back to Heather uh, on an issue related to halibut. But since we've been at this for two hours and 15 minutes, uh, we're going to take a 10 minute break here, then wrap up this agenda item and go to our last agenda item of the day. So we'll be back at 325.
All right, we will get started shortly here. Okay, welcome back. We, uh, we're we still on agenda item G4, and we're in council discussion and action. And I think we just wrapped up um, the issue with a motion by Phil on uh, a letter to the FCC. And so now I'd like to go to Heather, because I know Heather uh, had a halibut issue, I think, if I remember correctly. So Heather? Thank you, Chair Grelnick. Um, thank you for remembering that. I, I appreciate it. Um, and apologies if I could have brought this up sooner. I don't have a, a motion or anything like that. I just did want to flag a couple of things from the one from the work group report, and that's you know relative to the green sturgeon, um, you know bycatch in the directed halibut fishery, and. Um, I just wanted to flag that for something that I think we should keep on our radar, um, particularly as um, we move the idea or the concept forward, um, slow as it might be of uh, transitioning to management of the directed halibut fishery. And and so I just, you know, wanted to comment on that. I, 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 I think the work group discussed it and can really understand how it might be uh, a bit awkward to know how to address that and relative to what's in the terms of reference and and all of that. So, uh, but I, I didn't want it to go without any um, notice. And then uh, the other issue relative to halibut and the directed halibut fishery specifically is that I think um, streamer lines are not required required in the directed halibut fishery. And um, it, it might be an opportunity to um, minimize uh, interactions with seabirds if, if, that, if we were able to put that requirement in place. And I'm not sure what the mechanism for that is. I, um, this Kelly might be able to help with this if this is something that we could um, put in the catch sharing plan um, and then into federal regulation if that's a, a way to do that or or if maybe this is just something that needs to wait until we're um, we have the management of the directed halibut fishery under the council but um, also wanted to just bring those items up and I guess that is a I will before I finish just maybe pose that question to Kelly um, Okay, uh, Kelly, you. do you have a recommended route for that? Thank you, Chair Veronik. Thank you, Ms. Hall, for the question. So just to, to make sure everyone is um, all aware, um, halib the Pacific halibut fishery does have its own seabird biological opinion with no required mitigation measures. And that was primarily due to its limited duration and lack of seabird bycatch at the time of the, the biop development. Around half of the directed halibut fishery also retains groundfish. And when they do, they are required to use the streamer lines. Um, so as, as I mentioned, when the opinion was developed, um, there was a lack of information on seabird bycatch, but the fishery is now observed. And so there is some indication of seabird bycatch, but no streamer line, or sorry, no short-tailed albatross bycatch. And so certainly under the halibut agenda items, as you're developing the regulations for that fishery, you could consider uh, whether to to expand streamer line requirements to the halibut fishery. Uh, Heather, does that uh, answer your question? Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, it does. Thanks very much, Kelly. That's really helpful. I appreciate it. 
All right. Thank you for that, Heather. And um, what further action do we have on this vis-a-vis um, -vis what we see on the screen there? with regard to either any of the work group recommendations, uh, anything we want to deal with in specs or the most miscellaneous item three. I don't want to cut this short, but I, we do need to move on to the next agenda item. So if I'm not going to see, not seeing any other hands, I'm going to assume that the council has concluded uh, it's action here, and I'm going to go to Todd to confirm that we've done what we need to do here. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I believe that you have uh, covered this agenda item appropriately. You have a motion that deals with the uh, ground fish endangered species work group recommendations. The council did not make any um, or did not identify any measures that were needed to be evaluated as part of the upcoming harvest specifications and management measures process. And the council did how did note that the letter needs to be written regarding AIS, and that would be the uh, held under the identify other appropriate actions to be evaluated as appropriate. So in my concluding remarks, I believe that the council has done their job and it, the issue is uh, been addressed, has been addressed. All right, thanks very much, Todd, and thanks everyone for their work on this agenda item. Uh, we'll now go to agenda item G5, which is our last for the day, but promises to be uh, a significant agenda item to adopt stock assessments. And John DeVore is in the staff seat. So, John. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Council members, can you hear me fine? Loud and clear. Okay, great. Um, so this agenda item, agenda item G5, concerns the adoption of ground fish stock assessments that have been endorsed by the SSC. And um, to that end, we have uh, 11 stock assessments for your consideration. Uh, there's uh, two full assessments, one for Dover sole and one for spiny dogfish, which were, review were reviewed at a May star panel with a subsequent SSC review at this meeting. And then we had uh, uh, we have a sablefish update assessment um, that was reviewed at this meeting, um, and uh, then there are eight um, data moderate assep assessments uh, under consideration. There are four uh, air, uh, assessments for copper rockfish, two in California, um, uh, north and south of Point Conception, uh, respectively. Um, one for Oregon and one for Washington of particular um, uh, concern is that the uh, Southern California assessment south of Point Conception, uh, the results indicate the stock is below the minimum stock size threshold. We have three assessments for Quillback rockfish by state um, of concern. There is a um, the California quillback assessment indicates that stock is below its minimum stock size threshold. And then uh, one assessment for square spot rockfish in California, um, they really do not occur. This species does not occur um, in waters north of California and are rare or non-existent north of uh, Cape Mendocino. Um, so you, uh, one thing I want to point out, though, uh, going back just one step, is that the quillback rockfish assessment in Washington uh, was slightly revised. There was a, 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 a typo in the original assessment, so that one is supplemental revised attachment 12. And um, just to make sure that uh, everybody is on the same page. Um, in addition to those stock assessments and review uh, panel reports for Dover and Spiny uh, Dogfish, we have supplemental reports from uh, two of them from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, for you to consider. And then we have supplemental reports from uh, the SSC, the GMT, and the GAP. Um, in the interest of saving time and letting you hear from your advisors on this, I will just uh, stop now and just ask if there are any questions on my general overview. 
that I can answer. All right, thanks for that. John, are there any questions of John on his overview before we start to get into uh, our materials here? Uh, Marcy Remco. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, John, for the overview. Um, you mentioned the reports that we will be receiving. I was just wondering, um, I don't think I heard a report from uh, the Science Center or from um, anyone providing us uh, any sort of um, presentation on the actual assessments themselves or an opportunity to query um, the authors directly. Can you elaborate on that? Um, I did not see um, a, a Science Center report, but let me uh, let me refresh my screen and see if it came in here since I opened it. If you're seeing one, then... Um, no, I do not see one from the science centers. All right, any other questions of John before we get started? Um, all right, so we, we're going to start with uh, management entities, and we have two reports from California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So I'm not sure who is providing those, but maybe Marcy can point me in the right direction. Uh, yes, thank you very much, um, Chair Gorelnik. Uh, we do have two CDFW reports. Um, I know that Tracy Lorento is on tap to give the second one. I believe the first one um, I see Mel Mandrup and John Budrick both in the queue, and I will admit that I am not sure which of them is actually reading the report into the record. Well, hopefully one of them will speak up. They were reading, read uh, report one, or they'll arm wrestle for it. Oh, we joked about rock, paper, scissors earlier, and um, I, I guess I lost um <laughs> one moment let me pull that up okay um uh, i am mel mandrip with uh oh caroline is here she said she was she really wants to read this report i i apologize for the the confusion and delay here. All right. Um, was Caroline going to read the report? I don't see her on the participants list. Oh, there she is. Hi, Caroline. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, good. Sorry, I was having some technical challenges there. Um, are you still having technical? It looks like you've disappeared from the, oh, there you are. Um, Am, am I still muted? Well, you're not now. So once you okay. start with report one. <laughs> thank you. Sorry about that. Um, let me get back to my report one. Um, thank you, council members. Uh, my name is Caroline McKnight. I will be reading today from agenda item G5, uh, supplemental CDF and report one, which is the California Department of Fish and Wildlife report on 2021 ground fish stock assessments. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife would like to acknowledge the months of work by stock assessment teams to complete both the full and new length based stock assessments prioritized by the council and offers the following comments. In 2020, the council undertook a deliberative and public process to recommend and prioritize which stock assessments should be conducted for 2021 from among more than 90 ground fish species managed under the Pacific Coast Ground Fish Fishery Management Plan. 
Considerations included data availability and the date of the last assessment, as well as NIMPS and other capacity for assessment and review. Both copper and quillback rockfish were considered for full stock assessments in these discussions, given the significant available availability of data. With limited staff available to conduct assessments and review capacity for no more than three stock assessment review panels or star panels, the council prioritized Dover Sole, Lincod, Vermilion Sunset Rockfish for full stock assessments reviewed at star panels. While copper rockfish and quillback rockfish were considered for prioritization as full assessments for the next biennium in 2023, the high productivity and susceptibility analysis scores and recent catch overages motivated pursuit of length based data moderate assessments to provide a better understanding of stock abundance before the next assessment cycle in 2023. Following the GMT's recommendation, the council, and that was in June 2020, the council recommended copper rockfish, quillback rockfish, and square spot rockfish for data moderate length based assessments, in addition to the full up assessments, update assessments, and catch only projections recommended for other priority stocks. While ambitious, the stock assessment plans for 2021 were aimed to maximize the use of available staff capacity by utilizing the newly developed length based method to assess a greater number of stocks across their range. While the method would increase the number of assessments produced by reducing the workload, documentation, and review requirements per the terms of reference, the scope of data that could be included in the length-based methods is confined to catch, lengths, and fishery independent indices of abundance produced with standardized methods. The 2021 length-based assessments were intended to better inform stock status today, superseding outcomes of the data-poor depletion-based stock reduction analysis, or DBSRA, for quillback rockfish conducted in 2011, and the 2013 index-based data moderate assessments for copper rockfish south of Point Conception. Though the length-based methods utilize length, do, length data do not include, excuse me, Though the length-based method methods utilize length data not included in DBSRA, additional data sources in table one below are available that could be incorporated in full benchmark or other data moderate quillback rockfish, uh, copper rockfish, and square spot rockfish assessments. The length-based assessments for quillback rockfish and copper rockfish south of point conception indicate that the stocks are below the minimum stock size threshold of 25%. The SSC statement notes the fishery length composition for copper rockfish are the primary data source for the stock, yet these fish are collected only from habitat open to fishing. CDF and W recognizes they need to include the length composition of the stock in closed areas as well, and that's um, a process uh, that's referenced in Appendix A. CDF and W remotely operated survey work is nearing completion in 2021, which includes length data inside and outside of marine protected areas. The ROV methods have been reviewed and approved by the SSC to inform management in the context of a full assessment in 2023. Though the results of the length-based method suggest that quillback rockfish is below the minimum stock size, this is the first indication of stock status as the 2011 data poor DBSRA method did not provide any estimates. The 2013 data modern index based assessment for copper rock for south of Point Conception, Conception suggested a very healthy stock status of 76% of unfished spawning stock biomass compared to 18% in the current assessment, which is contradictory. Although conducted eight years ago, the dramatic change in stock status between the two data moderate assessment methods for copper rockfish south of Point Conception brings into question whether the newly approved length-based method is more reliable and or better data moderate assessment for the stock than the index-based method. This is a critical question, especially in light of the inconsistency in copper rockfish trends from the assessment when compared to recent trends and status of other rockfishes off of California as noted by the SSC. CDF and W acknowledges there's widespread confidence that the assessments followed the guidelines outlined in the TOR, but that isn't the only consideration when determining whether to approve these assessments. While the stat had good reason to limit analyses to the catch and length data from long-term sport and commercial fishery monitoring programs, there were additional data sources within the scope of the TOR available for analysis as noted in Table 2 of the SSC statement. 
In the interest of examining of all available data sources allowed by the TOR, CDF and W request that the stat conduct a sensitivity analysis for each of the California length based assessments to evaluate the effects of including the data noted in table one below. One option for review is for the groundfish subcommittee at their August meeting or at the mop up meeting if additional time is needed. CDF and W would like would also like to highlight that Analysis of the length-based data moderate methods was not completed during last year's methodology review, and a number of outstanding issues are slated for review by the Graphic Subcommittee in winter of 2021. This effort should offer the scientific community, the council, and the public some useful information about the reliability of these methods and status determination, um, a recommendation with which the SSC convert, con concurred. In addition, the initial methodology review of the length based data moderate methods indicated that they are predisposed to providing estimates of status that were systematically biased, low compared to full assessments. As many have remarked in discussions this week, implementing the allowable biological catches derived from the new length based assessments would have dire and significant consequences to California sport and commercial fisheries and would likely require management measures to and virtually all groundfish fishery opportunities in nearshore waters. An overfish determination on copper rockfish south of Point Conception and quillback rockfish throughout California would also require the development of rebuilding plans for these stocks, adding significant new and unplanned work obligations for the stat teams. Moreover, because the TOR requires only a very abbreviated assessment review process for length-based assessments by the groundfish subcommittee and SSC, the Council and NIMS would need to proceed with developing these rebuilding plans in the absence of star panel reviews, which offer a week long process for evaluating uncertainties, ensuring adequate model review and providing a comprehensive list of research and data needs. As these assessments were not never slated for a star star panel, it also means they have proceeded without evaluation and input from reviewers from the Center of Independent Experts. The new length based assessments for these stocks withstood the scrutiny of the SSC and the groundfish subcommittee. It is, unknow it is unknown if the method can effectively determine status compared to a full assessment or how the significant amount of unused available data will affect the outcome of stock status, OFL, and ABC in a full benchmark assessment. As the 2021 stock assessment review process continues and looking toward the specifications and management measures, CDF and W believes that as a matter of public policy, the science behind the decisions to make major course adjustments in management should be comprehensive, compelling, and thoroughly vetted in more than just a brief SSC review and a single council agenda item slated for one hour to cover seven assessments. Um, and I'll just briefly cover that table one um, as outlined above is the additional data sources um, that could be used for Quillback, Copper North, Copper South, and Square Spot. And um, following that, um, the Appendix One, um, I, I, won't, I won't read the entire document, just hit the highlights so that this is the um, percent of habitat area closed to fishing for groundfish inside closed areas, which includes the rockfish conservation areas, cowcod conservation areas, and marine protected areas in California um, between 2001 and 2021. And the very end tables um, shows those percent of um, protection in each of those respective MPAs or RCAs versus those that are open. Um, and with that, I will conclude and um, pause for questions. All right, thank you very much, Caroline. Let's see what questions we have on the first report under this agenda item. Uh, I, such a great report, there are no questions. Thank you very much, Caroline. Thank you very much. And there is a second report by CDFW. That's correct. Um, Chairman, this is Tracy Lorento, or Vice Chair, excuse me. This is Tracy Lorento with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I will be reading from Supplemental CDFW Report 2 entitled California Department of Fish and Wildlife Report on California Catch Used for 2021 Data Moderate Groundfish Stock Assessments. The 
California Department of Fish and Wildlife reviewed the draft assessment documents in the briefing book for quillback rockfish and copper rockfish and have the following comments regarding data inputs. CDFW suggests there is a lot more that can be done within bounds of a data limited assessment where catch streams are a primary source of input data. CDFW suggests catch information could be incorporated in more than just a single way, for example, combined total state removals for all sectors. Of California, the minor nearshore complex is managed consistently with itself, other than black rockfish, which has its own specifications. Nearshore stocks have been managed together for 20 years, such that evaluating the comparative catch contributions to the nearshore complex over time should largely negate any effects of the management changes. For example, changes in season lengths, depths, or bag or trip limits over time. These management changes have certainly affected the total volume of catch of these stocks over time. And in recent years, the relaxation of management measures has probably contributed significantly to recent increases in catch. Considering the proportion of catch relative to total catch of minor nearshore stocks over time is one very easy way to evaluate if contributions of a particular catch have changed over time, producing a different index of catch beyond just total removals. Quillback rockfish. The output model indicates the stock is at 14% of MSST with a resulting OFL of 2.67 metric tons and an ABC of 0 0.83 metric tons in 2023 for California state coastwide. As these length-based models are not inclusive of all data available used in full benchmark assessments, the resulting output scale of this OFL slash ABC does not logically comport with recent increasing take of quillback rockfish seen in both the sport and commercial sectors. It could be expected to see the opposite trend where there is no fish in the catch or severely declining catch given the depletion levels suggested in this assessment. CDFW recommends additional review of data inputs be conducted to understand this contrasting observation. What follows is a series of graphs um, showing the proportion of quillback rockfish to other nearshore rockfish in the recreational fishery from the um, California Oregon border to Point Arena for 25, 2005 to 2020, um, and shows a slight increasing um, proportion of quillback in the total nearshore in the um, proportion of quillback rockfish in the total mortality of the recreational nearshore catch um, during that time frame. The second graphic shows the proportion of quillback rockfish to other nearshore rockfish between Point Arena and Point Conception for the same time frame, 2005 through 2020. And this is the recreational catch. And, um, these proportions are much smaller and um, don't show quite the increasing trend. It's more um, about the same over time, um, the proportion of quillback um, total mortality to, other, to all the near shore rockfish. There's also table one, which is a recreational total mortality in metric tons for quillback rockfish versus other near shore rockfish um, in California from the same 2005 to 2020 time period with the data from RECFIN. We did not include the recreational catch south of Point Conception because it's minimal. Um, so that the, the first table shows that information. Then there's two more graphs for the commercial landings of quillback rockfish. The first is north of um, from the California Oregon border to 4010 from 2010 to 2020. And this definitely shows an increasing trend in the proportion of quillback rockfish landings compared to the rest of the um, other nearshore rockfish. Um, these graphs 
do not include discard, discard mortality, which is estimated at less than 0.1 metric ton for quailback rockfish. The fourth graph shows the proportion, proportion of commercial landings for quillback rockfish versus other nearshore rockfish um, between 4010 and point conception for 2010 to 2020. Again, the data don't include discard mortality and they are from PACFIN. This shows a much smaller proportion of quillback rockfish caught um, in that area between 4010 and point conception, but also shows a slight increase in the proportion of quillback rockfish during that time period. What follows is a, another table with the commercial landings of metric tons for quillback versus other nearshore rockfish split between the border and 4010 and then from 4010 to point conception. Again, these are um, just landings um, and do not include mortality estimates. Um, and the catch south of quillback south of point conception is minimal and not included. After that, um, the commercial data inputted into the model using PACFIN landings based on CALCOM expansions were unusually high in 1991 at 57.17 metric tons. Noting the extremely low values in preceding years, a singular data point, which is approximately 50 times higher than all the other values, is cause for additional review of the expansion process. What follows is a, is a copy of the graph taken from the draft's um, quillback stock assessment, showing that very high data point in 1991 um, compared to um, other years. Copper rockfish. Similarly, the output model for copper rockfish in Northern California indicates that the stock is at an MMST of 39% with an OFL of 91.55 metric tons and an ABC of 78.6 metric tons. And Southern California, the area south of Point Conception, at 18% MSST with an OFL of 21.83 metric tons and an ABC of 8.79 metric tons for 2023. The resulting output scale of the these OFL slash ABCs do not reasonably align with a recent increasing proportion of copper rockfish seen in both sectors across these regional areas north and south of Point Conception. And what follows that is some more graphics. The first one shows um, the total mortality of copper rockfish vers versus other nearshore rockfish in the recreational fishery north of Point Conception from 2005 to 2020 and shows a, a, an increasing trend in the proportion of copper rockfish during that time period. The next graph shows the proportion of recreational total mortality for copper rockfish and other nearshore rockfish south of Point Conception from 2005 to 2020. And um, the data for both of these graphs come from Ruckfin. And as with the other graphs, other nearshore rockfish includes the other nearshore species except for black. Again, this graph shows an increasing proportion of copper rockfish compared to the other nearshore rockfish during that 2005 to 2020 time period. Table three is the recreational total mortality in metric tons for copper rockfish and other nearshore rockfish, except black rockfish in California, during that same time period broken out from um, north of Point Conception and south of Point Conception. The next um, two graphs are the proportion of commercial nearshore landings for copper rockfish and other nearshore rockfish, except black rockfish in California, from the Oregon-California border to point conception from 2010 to 2020. As with the per previous commercial graphs and, and data, they're from PACFIN and it does not include discard mortality. For the area north of point conception, copper rockfish, Discard mortality is estimated about at less than 0.98 metric tons. Uh, 
This graph again shows an increasing proportion of copper rockfish to other nearshore rockfish for that area north of Point Conception in the commercial fishery. The final graph is a proportion of commercial rockfish commercial landings for copper rockfish versus other nearshore south of Point Conception for 2010 to 2020. Again, the data are from PACFIN because this is commercial. It does not include discard mortality, but in this area south of Point Conception, it's less than made it at less than 0.5 metric tons for copper rockfish. And as with the other graphs, you can see an increasing trend in the proportion of copper rockfish um, to the other near shore rockfish in the commercial landing south of Point Conception. And the final bit of information for you is Table 4, which shows the commercial landings and metric tons for copper rockfish and other near shore rockfish for the same 2010 to 2020 time period. Again, the data are from PACFIN and does not include just current mortality, but that's estimated less than 0.5 for south of Point Conception and less than point. 0.98 metric tons north um, and with that I'll t that completes the report and I'll take any questions thank you very much Tracy for that information let's see if there are any questions for Tracy on report number two uh, I'm not seeing any hands thank you very much Tracy thank you so we'll move on now to uh, further reports. We'll hear from the Science and Statistical Committee. And I think that uh, John Budrick may have the lead on that, um, but others with a team of folks behind him. John? Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. Uh, that's correct. We have a few folks waiting in the ring, uh, the wings for any difficult uh, questions we might have or might be on my scope of knowledge. Uh, but uh, thanks again, uh, Chair Gorelnik, and uh, good afternoon, uh, Council members. Uh, for the record, my name is Dr. John Budrick. I am the California Department of Fish and Wildlife representative to the Scientific and Statistical Committee and the chair of the Ground Fish Subcommittee. I'll be reading to you from the Supplemental SSC Report 1, the Scientific and Statistical Committee Report on Adopt Stock Assessments. The Scientific and Statistical Committee received a report from Dr. Kristen Marshall of Northwest Fisheries Science Center on the results of the Groundfish Subcommittee meeting held June 21st, 22nd, to review the 2021 benchmark stock assessments for Pacific Spiny Dogfish in Dover Sole a stock assessment update for sablefish, and length-based data moderate stock assessments for copper rockfish, quillback rockfish, and square spot rockfish. The subcommittee report is appended to this statement, and Table 1 summarizes the assessments, associated category levels, and future assessment recommendations. The SSC commends the assessment authors and stock assessment review star panel reviewers for their extensive and thorough work. Regarding Dover Sole, the benchmark stock assessment for Dover Sole models a single coastwide stock in the U.S. West Coast waters using data sources that include landings data and discard estimates, survey indices of abundance, length and or age composition data for each fishery or survey, information on weight at length, maturity at length, and fecundity at length, information on natural mortality and steepness of the beverton holt stock recruitment relationship, and estimates of aging error. Model estimates show that the scale of the biomass, spawning biomass is uncertain, <clears throat> and the stock size is well above the target reference point and has been above the target reference point throughout the duration of the fishery. The scale of the estimates of stock size are lower than from the 2011 assessment, driven by improved parameterization of survey selectivity, which is double normal and sex specific. Results from this assessment are consistent with those from the 2011 assessment. The new assessment estimates a depletion of 79% at the start of 2021, there are several sources of uncertainty in the model, including the level of recruitment variability, sensitivity to treatment of natural mortality, 
uh, and sensitivity to alternative selectivity parameterizations. Finally, the SSC notes that using the sigma for category one stocks when specifying the states of nature in the decision table was an appropriate approach for capturing the range of uncertainty for the stock. The SSC supports the modeling approach, agrees that the model fits the data adequately, and agrees with the conclusion of the 2021 Dover Soul stock assessment. This model estimates depletion well although there is uncertainty in scale. The SSC endorses the 2021 full assessment of Dover Soul as providing the best scientific information available and suitable for informing management decisions. The SSC recommends the stock be assigned to category one and that the next Dover Soul assessment be an update assessment unless new data sources become available. Regarding spiny dogfish, the SSC benchmark stock assessment for spiny dogfish included improvements from the 2021 assessment, including updated fisheries and survey related data, abundance indices estimated using the vector autoregressive spatial temporal modeling approach known as VAST, a revised historical discard estimates, updated selectivity assumptions from asymptotic to dome shaped with sex specific offset, updated biological parameters and updated tuning for age data. The magnitude of the historical discards remains one of the main concerns in this in assessment data. Age determination is another unresolved issue for female dogfish, which has impacts on the growth parameters and the assumed natural mortality rate. Results indicate that the stock is in the precautionary zone. 34% of unfished spawning stock biomass, whereas the last assessment indicated the stock was 63% of unfished spawning stock biomass. The estimated spawning output in 2021 under the new assessment decreased from 18,354,000 pups projected in the previous assessment to 6,703,000 6, pups. Bridging analyses added and updating data indicated that the scale of the assessment had changed as a result of one, the revised estimates of catchability, referred to as Q, for the Northwest Fisheries Science Center West Coast Bottom Trawl Survey, changing from 0.27 to 0.586. Number two, new uh, West Coast Bottom Trawl Survey composition data and three, the new research indicating a gestation period of two years rather than one, reducing fecundity estimates to half that assumed previously contributing to the change to the perception of the stock status and harvest levels. The West Coast ground fish survey Q was fixed at 0.586 in the base model though it is subject to considerable uncertainty due to the lack of contrast in the data included in the assessment and an inability to quali qualify seasonal migrations of up to 600 kilometers during the summer relative to timing of the West Coast Bottom Trawl Survey that operates from April through October that likely affects availability. Number two, uh, the potential net avoidance given strong swimming abilities Number three, the distribution of a portion of the stock shoreward of the West Coast Bottom Trawl Survey area. And four, availability to the net itself given the, their semi-pelagic habits. These considerations provide an indication that a Q value uh, lower than 0 0.586 may be more realistic. The SSC supports further research to better understand seasonal availability of spiny dogfish to the survey because the stock assessment and the published literature suggest a fairly strong seasonal migration of spiny dogfish in which the animals generally are distributed uh, further north during the summer and further south in the winter. The relatively flat likelihood uh, profile for Q implies that the data are in inform in an uninformative about the parameter, even though it is influential on the scale and depletion in the assessment. 
Catchability is listed as a major axis of uncertainty in decision tables, and the best estimate determines the lower and upper bounds. The uncertainty in Q is problematic since it affects the estimates of key parameters, including natural mortality, referred to as M, and growth, uh, creating tension in the model between these variables. There is a trade off between natural mortality and catchability, and the model fit improved when uh, natural mortality was lower than catchability. Oh, when natural mortality was lower and catchability was higher. The estimate of steepness for spiny dogfish is among the lowest values reported for marine stocks, marine fish stocks. The FMSY of 0 0.003 per year. Uh, corresponds to a spawning potential ratio of 90%, while an SPR of 88.3% corresponds to a, an SB40 given the value for steepness. The current SPR 50% harvest policy appears inconsistent with the biology if these results are correct. The SSC highlights that the SPR proxy is significantly higher than the SPR estimated to correspond to maximum sustainable yield. And the stock is predicted to collapse if it is fished at, the, at an SPR of 50%. While a spawning recruitment relationship meta-analysis might help inform more ideal harvest control rules, such an analysis is unlikely to be possible given the limited number of species with this life history. The stock assessment team can create a harvest policy that would allow rebuilding to the target uh, for the GMT to consider. The SSC endorses the 2021 assessment of spiny dogfish as providing the best scientific information available and suitable for informing management decisions. The SSC recommends the stock be assigned to category two since the recruitment deviations are not estimated and data do not inform scale well. The SSC recommends that the next assessment of spiny dogfish be a full assessment due to the technical issues discussed in the assessment and star panel report. Regarding sable fish, the current stock assessment update for sablefish is the first update of the 2019 benchmark assessment. The updated data and time series included an additional year of West Coast bottom trawl survey data with index lengths and ages for 2019. Uh, there was no 2020 survey um, due to COVID. Uh, West Coast Groundfish Observer Program discard rates and average weights and the sea level index of recruitment. Uh, additionally, West Coast Groundfish Observer Program discard lengths, length compositions were added into the model to allow the model to fit a recent increase in trawl discard rates, likely due to the large 2016 year class. In the absence of the 2020 West Coast bottom trawl survey and length composition data. The SSC agreed with the decision to include the discard length data in the assessment and to re-estimate the retention curve. These changes were necessary because the updated model produced implausible and inconsistent model results regarding recent 2019 recruitment and the fit to the 2019 West Coast Bottom Trawl Survey degraded. Although the trends in spawning output and recruitment were consistent with the 2019 benchmark, the update assessment increases the scale of spawning biomass. Historically, sablefish assessment has large estimates of uncertainty in scale, resulting in variation in estimates of spawning biomass among assessments. Estimates of the 2019 unfish biomass, spawning biomass, and depletion increased. The uncertainty in the update assessment includes stock depletion levels both above and within the precautionary zone, with the point estimate suggesting that the stock has remained above the target level of 40% of the unfished spawning output, while the 2019 assessment indicated the stock was in the precautionary zone from 2011 to 2019. The update assessment indicates the 2021 depletion is 57.9% of the unfished level. 
catch projections indicate catch attainment consistent with current harvest policies would result in a stock declining uh, from 57.9% of the unfished level in 2021 to approximately 50% of the unfished level in 2031. The basis for uncertainty in the decision table was the asymptotic standard deviation for the 2021 spawning biomass from the base model, consistent with the 2019 benchmark assessment, and alternative values of P star for calculating of ACLs. The SSC endorses the 2021 update assessment of sablefish as providing the best scientific information available and a suitable and suitable for informing management decisions. The SSC assigned this stock to category one. The SSC recommends that the next sablefish assessment be a full assessment due to the technical issues discussed in the 2019 star panel. Regarding copper rockfish, New data moderate assessments were reviewed for copper rockfish south of Point Conception, north of Point Conception in California, Oregon, and Washington. While the 2021 assessments provided justification for the modeled areas, there is considerable uncertainty in stock structure. All models relied primarily on length composition data, most of which came from the recreational fleets. There were retrospective patterns and the fit to the Northwest Fishery Science Center hook and line survey index in Southern California assessment, in the Southern California assessment was poor, possibly indicating model misspecification. The results of the 2013 index-based data moderate assessment for California South of Point Conception resulted in an estimated depletion of 76% in 2013, which is in contrast with the current result of 28% for the current length-based data moderate assessment in 2013. All four assessments had reduced data availability from 2020 due to the COVID-19 impacts on data collection agencies. The SSC was generally supportive of the modeling approach and satisfied with the model's fits to data and resulting conclusions. Other issues discussed by the SSC were the model for Northern California estimated a pattern of high recruitment during the 1960s and lower recruitment during the 1970s, which is not consistent with the trends in recruitment for other rockfishes during that time. Concerns were raised regarding the declining trend in the recent time period of the Southern California model, which is inconsistent with the population trends from other Southern California stocks for which data are available, including Boccaccio and Calcod most of which have seen signs of strong recruitment over the, la the past decade. Age length estimates and hence growth curve for, the Northern for Northern California may not be representative because they rely on data from Oregon and Washington where water temperatures are different and growth may differ as a result. The stock, the fit of the hook and line survey in the Southern California assessment was poor. This likely reflects differences in the composition from the fishery disproportionately reflecting areas open to fishing closer to port as compared to the more spatially balanced sampling of the survey, more equally representing habitat offshore and in the Calcutta conservation areas and in the rockfish conservation areas. California Department of Fish and Wildlife quantified the percent of habitat in marine protected areas, Calcutta conservation areas, and rockfish conservation areas, along with the charts for further consideration to make clear the amount of data that is not represented in recent years. Data from the recreational fishery only represents areas open to fishing, potentially making the stock appear more depleted than it is as a whole. Two area models Estimates of biomass from recently reviewed CDFW remotely operated vehicle surveys and inclusion of the collab California Collaborative Fisheries Research Program that sample in MPAs can be incorporated in future assessments to help reflect differences in composition and fishing mortality in open and closed areas. Additional data to represent the composition in closed areas would be beneficial. There were fishery-dependent 
indices of abundance and several additional length data sets that were potentially available to inform future assessments in table two, uh, including recreational catch per unit effort and ROV data. But the former were not included in the base model because of restrictions imposed by the data moderate assessment terms of reference. The SSC concluded that the base model represents the best assessments available. The data moderate copper rockfish assessments estimate 2020 depletions of 18.1%, 39.3%, 73.6%, and 42% for the stocks in California South of Point Conception, California North of Point Conception, Oregon, and Washington, respectively. The SSC notes the stock size estimated South of Point Conception is below the minimum stock size threshold. The, ass the assessments suggest different estimates of stock size relative to unfished in Northern and Southern California, but there is limited evidence that those are, are distinct, are actually distinct stocks. The SSC endorses the 2021 data moderate assessments of copper rockfish as providing the best scientific information available and being suitable for informing management decisions. All the copper rockfish stocks are assigned to category two, given these are data moderate assessments. The SSC recommends that the next copper rockfish assessments be full assessments to allow for full evaluation of all available data and improved understanding of the current stock status and scale. Regarding coolback rockfish, Light based data moderate stock assessments were revised for quillback rockfish in California, Oregon, and Washington. Sorry, were reviewed for quillback rockfish in California, Oregon, and Washington. All three assessments included two fleets a recreational fleet and a commercial fleet. Externally estimated biological relationships, including length, weight, length, and age. Uh, natural mortality, fecundity, and maturity. Double normal selectivity and the stock recruitment relationship was Beverton-Holt with a steepness of 0.72. Recruitment deviations were estimated for California and Oregon and the model for Washington assumed deterministic recruitment. There was substantial uncertainty in, ca in the California model given sensitivity to assumed growth and mortality parameters. For the Oregon model, the key sensitivities were whether the annual recruitment deviation should be estimated, which is an effect of the model scale in 2021, and assuming asymptotic recreational selectivity, which reduces the fraction of unfished spawning biomass. In the Washington model, there was more variability in model estimates and sensitivity to estimating parameters, including natural mortality, the coefficient of variation of larger individuals, and uh, the length uh, at infinity, uh, as, as well as sensitivities around recruitment and estimation of recruitment deviations. The use of growth from fish sampled in Oregon and Washington applied to California assessments uh, presents an unresolved uncertainty since California is subject to higher water temperatures that can affect growth rates, making them potentially unrepresentative. There are additional data sets available to potentially inform future assessments that, are, that were not included in the base model because of restrictions imposed by the data moderate assessment terms of reference. The SSC concluded that the base model base models represent the best assessments available. The data moderate coolback rockfish assessments estimate 2020 depletions of 14%, 47%, and 39% for stocks in California, Oregon, and Washington, respectively. respectively. The SSC notes the estimated stock size of California coolback rockfish is below the minimum stock size threshold. The SSC endorses the 2021 data moderate assessments of coolback rockfish as providing the best scientific information available and suitable for in informing management decisions. The SSC recommends that the Oregon and California coolback assessments be assigned to category two and Washington be assigned to category three due to the greater data limitations. 
This SSC recommends that the next Coolback Rockfish assessment be a full assessment to better understand the current depletion and scale of the stock. Regarding square spot rockfish, a link based data moderate stock assessment was conducted for square spot rockfish in California. There are no prior assessments for the species, and since 2010, the depletion Depletion, depletion corrected average catch method was used to set annual catch limits based on assuming a relative depletion of 40%. This species is treated as one stock as there is no evidence of population structure. Due to its small size, square spot rockfish are not targeted by recreational or commercial fisheries. Catches mostly consist of large females, thus the fishery mainly affects spawning biomass. The assessment model did not fit the Northwest Fisheries Science Center hook and line survey index and associated link compositions. During the meeting, some additional exploration of the California Cooperative Fisheries Investigation Cal Coffee index was conducted, but did not lead either the stat or the panel to recommend changes to the base model. The data moderate square spot rockfish assessment estimates the 2021 depletion of 37% below the, the management target of 40%. The SSC endorses the 2021 data moderate assessment of square spot rockfish as providing the best scientific information available and suitable for informing management decisions. The SSC recommends the square spot rockfish stock be assigned to category two, the default for data moderate assessments. The SSC recommends that the next square spot rockfish assessment be data moderate, a data moderate assessment. Regarding general comments on data moderate assessments. This was the first review of assessments based on stock synthesis with catch and lengths and stock synthesis with catch lengths and index. The SSC provides the following observations for considerations when stock assessment terms of reference, revisions, and a work plan for off-year is developed. More detail is provided in the appended Groundfish Subcommittee report. The uh, stock synthesis with catch and length and stock synthesis with catch length and index methods are suitable for status determination for SSC endorsed assessments. Treatment of recruitment the workshop led, uh, that led to the approval of the sto stock synthesis catch and length and stock synthesis catch length and index did not consider guidelines for when recruitment deviations should be estimated. Further guidance could be provided. Fishery dependent indices. The current TOR restricts the indices that can be used in data moderate assessments. Fishery dependent indices cannot be used. The SSC should consider whether or not to expand the data moderate terms of reference to allow consideration of such indices. Regarding review, it should be recognized that the stock synthesis catch in length and comparable data moderate assessments are based on age structured modeling frameworks and thus have considerable opportunity for complexity and a broad range of options for parameterization comparable in many cases to that of full assessments. Thus, a longer review should be considered. Potential data sources. The assessments should document the data sources that were potentially available to, but not included in the assessments, as well as a list of those that could be, that could not be included in the assessment given the data moderate terms of reference, but could be considered in a full assessment. That, that should be no, uh, sorry, there should be no uh, requirement for analysis of these data and or use of these data uh, for data moderate assessments. All data should be provided in a usable form and with an adequate description by the data deadlines so that they can be considered for inclusion in the data moderate assessments, although they may be excluded following consideration. Ensemble modeling. 
The length-based data moderate approaches can be highly constrained by fixing biological parameters and not estimating recruitment, which leads to the concerns of model misspecification. Guidelines on how best to conduct an ensemble modeling approach should be considered, discussed, and included in the terms of reference. The SSC should review how best to assess nearshore species, particularly with large recreational fisheries that have strong spatial management, for example, those with MPAs and marine protected areas and rockfish closures, and, and a pattern of high, higher effort near shore. This can lead to divergence in data between fishery dependent data and fishery independent data depending on the biology of the species movement in particular, particularly if handling of the latter is not informed by spatial gradients in fishing effort. We provide a, a table summarizing the outcomes of the SSC review of stock assessments, as well as a table of additional potential data sources that could be explored for length-based uh, data moderate stock assessments. And that concludes the SSC uh, statement on adopt stock assessments. And with that, I'll take any questions you might have. All right, thank you very much, John. Long report. Uh, let's see if there are any questions. I imagine there may be. Uh, Maggie Summer. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. I'll, I'll start us off. Um, thanks, John, for the uh, marathon report. I have a question on spiny dogfish. Um, I see, you know, looking at the discussion of the significant uncertainty around the bottom trawl survey catchability value uh, and the SSE support for further research to better understand seasonal availability of dogfish to the survey. And then uh, the, the note that the data used in the assessment are uninformative about the Q parameter, but the um, subcommittee report appended at the end did um, report that the, there was some discussion of the potential for West Coast Ground Fish Observer Program data or uh, at Sea Hake Observer Program data to provide some information. Um, so I'm just, I guess I'm, I'm I, noting the SSE's recommendation to adopt this assessment um, rather than a recommendation to um, move it to mop up and, and do some further analysis, I'm looking for some input on the SSE's decision on that recommendation and, and your thoughts on the availability of, or the, the potential for short-term um, analysis of the, the catchability issues over the summer. While I could provide, um, sorry, thank you, um, Ms. Summer um, and uh, Chair Grelnick. Uh, I um, would defer to Dr. Owen Hamel of the Northwest Fisheries Science Center, whose staff would be involved in further analyses to examine uncertainties so he can better inform you of the potential uh, for such analyses and how much of the considerations can be addressed in such analyses. Uh, thank you, John. Welcome. Uh, and thank you, council, council members. Um, so, you know, there are a number of factors outlined in the report that can affect uh, our estimation of Q or trying to develop a prior for Q. Um, the discussion of looking at observer data for that, um, we certainly could look at that and that would provide you know, one dimension of uh, trying to estimate Q in terms of the movement or apparent movement, certainly the availability of uh, spiny dogfish um, at different times of the year. Uh, so we certainly should be able to look at that data and, and get something for that. Um, other questions of movement um, or availability in general, uh, to the fishery, um, those questions, uh, you know, given the amount of time and other duties, how well we could address those, uh, you know, certainly by August, um, 
Uh, I'm not sure, but but dealing with the uh, and looking at the observer data would certainly be doable. Thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, Kelly Ames. Thank you, Chair Verelnik, and thank you, John, for your report um, from the SSC. Could you summarize the discussion and range of opinions on the area stratifications that were used in the data moderate assessments for quillback and copper? Yes, um, thank you, Ms. Ames. Um, Regarding copper rockfish, um, there have been a number of genetic studies that have been conducted, um, and some which are contradictory to one another. Um, there has been some work by uh, Sivasunder and Plumby 2010 with microsatellites and mitochondrial DNA um, that showed that there was some uh, moderate tweak population structure with the mitochondrial DNA, um, but no. Um, no population structure was observed in the nuclear DNA that the microsatellites um, are used to uh, analyze. And so uh, not very strong population structure observed there. There are um, different color morphs that are observed on the, along the coast. There was once a species called Sebastes vexillaris that was a white belly rockfish, um, had a little bit different coloration than your typical uh, copper that caused people to think it was a different species. Um, there's also an apricot colored variety that is in the Channel Islands, but you know, whether these are just color morphs resulting from environmental conditions or whether these are representative of genetic, um, you know, differences, the work hasn't been done to focus on that. Um, that said, there's also the consideration of, um, you know, differences in regulations and historical exploitation across space. Um, that's uh, another consideration and why we typically um, set these up to be uh, consistent with state boundaries um, for that reason. Uh, within California, there was no population structure north and south of Point, Con uh, Point Conception other than the mitochondrial, weak mitochondrial DNA signal of structure there. Um, but, you know, there are slight differences in the historical exploitation patterns north and south of Point Conception and development of those fisheries. But um, that said, um, there is the, still the, pop, the possibility of gene flow and um, demographic connectivity between regions, uh, north and south of Point Conception, uh, since, you know, much of the uh, results were either confounded, uh, genetically speaking, or um, just honestly, the sample sizes were so paltry uh, that, you know, it's questionable as to whether those can be you know, used to reach of a sound conclusion given there, I think it was 18 individuals uh, in Monterey area and then nine in Santa Barbara by genetic standards, that's very low. Um, usually want at least say 50 individuals per area, um, at least for mitochondrial work. Um, in any event, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty in those for copper rockfish, for quillback rockfish, there, um, while there's some signs of population structure between inside and outside of uh, Puget Sound. There's really not, um, uh, there hasn't been a lot of work done um, on the open coast. So there's relative, relatively limited information there. Um, so, you know, uh, apart from the fact that these stocks tend into, and I mean the nearshore stocks in general, tend to have some form of isolation by distance pattern as a result of um, just their kind of sedentary behavior and limited larval dispersal between regions, uh, you know, on, on relatively small scales, they, they regard these as, as typically having, you know, some degree of variation with distance. Um, indicative of, of separation, although across generations, you can have contributions of um, gene flow that make their way down the coast um, and maintaining a single population, genetically speaking. So um, that said, there, there are a number of different considerations relative to the fishing history, the genetics, and the potential demographic connectivity um, that uh, can be used to inform these types of decisions, um, but there was really weren't very strong indications of population structure for either species. Nothing definitive, no genetic breaks where there's a wall um, between the two. 
So hopefully that helps. Um, Kelly, did that answer your question? Kelly? Yes, thank you for the uh, detailed information, John. How did the lack of inconclusive information weigh into the final SSC determination to recommend these assessments with the specific area stratifications? I th Thank you, Ms. Ames. I think there is somewhat of a matter of uh, inertia from the previous assessment for copper rockfish, where we had stratified at point conception um, in the 2013 index-based assessment. So um, that having set the stage may have made that more of an acceptable principle um, and perhaps more than it deserved. So in a, in a coast-wide assessment, or sorry, in a full stock assessment, oftentimes we'll do a comparison of statewide um, to area kind of assessments when there are considerations such as these to compare the differences. But given the limitations um, here in terms of, of time and competing priorities with full assessments, et cetera, and the amount of time that could be dedicated to these, I think there were some, some limitations relative to what we might have done in a full assessment. Um, so I think that's um, the SSC taking into account what was put before them. They were judging, you know, what they had available for review uh, rather than the full gamut of potential model configurations in a spatial sense. Uh, Louis Zim. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and thank you, Dr. Budrick. Um, it's always fascinating talking to you. Uh, you know my passion for uh, rockfish science. But I, I'm a little unclear about the mechanics of larval dispersal of, say, specifically copper rockfish along the California coast. Does it have anything to do with the California current? Or is it countercurrents? Or, or is there any analysis of this in the scientific literature? Hmm. Um, thank you, Mr. Sim. That was... That was not discussed within the SSC in any any detail. Um, just from my own research in, on genetics of subgenus Rosacola, including vermilion rockfish, um, these are things that I've pondered. Um, and the uh, California current um, can move these uh, larvae along the coast for fairly long periods of time before they settle. I think in uh, reading uh, a paper by Bonacorsi uh, regarding copper rockfish, the average uh, migration distance uh, between a parent offspring um, approx was approximated, I think, at, at 13 kilometers. Um, so they're, they're, they don't move huge distances per se because the near shore is considered what they call sticky water, uh, where the seafloor um, kind of prevents the movement uh, at, at the maximum rates of the current. Um, uh, I guess compared to offshore, um, you tend to have more gene flow um, and due to the currents offshore. But without getting into too much detail, um, there, there are some considerations there. There's also the California current dumping into the Southern California bite at the islands and in offshore, and then a circulation pattern in Southern California that kind of uh, goes in a, a circle on the inside of the uh, Channel Islands. Um, so some differences there in terms of water temperature, et cetera, that can have effects on some stocks. But there's nothing, as I said before, there's no evidence for these stocks per se. And then as noted previously, the inside and outside of Puget Sound is another potential break that has been observed in a number of species and I believe is contributing to some of their uh, ESA considerations, et cetera, there. Um, so that's that's kind of a, a broad view. Um, and, you know, some of it depends on the timing of uh, spawn, spawning, the time of larval release uh, relative to the currents that can also affect things. So it's a mixed bag and, you know, there's not really generalities that can be drawn per se. Additional, in, uh, additional inferences would be beneficial for these two stocks. Thank you. Fascinating subject. Thank you. All right, uh, Marcy Uremko, and then we'll go back to Kelly Ames. Mr. Chair, uh, thank you, John. Um, I just had a follow-up 
on the discussion um, that you just offered in response to Ms. Ames' question on stock differentiation. Um, you mentioned that you thought that in the case of copper rockfish and the division at Point Conception that that was possibly inertia uh, carried over from the 2013 um, assessment. Um, I was wondering if the SSC uh, even uh, questioned about this um, in or, or discussed it uh, in any detail. Um, and I'm wondering also with regard to Quillback, um, uh, the same inertia didn't appear to uh, carry over. Um, I believe the last Quillback assessment was a full and was, or I'm sorry, was a coastwide assessment. Um, and so I'm just wondering what, how much the SSC dug into the question of stock differentiation and the decisions made by each of those stat teams uh, with regard to the lines that they drew. Thank you, Mr. Remco. Um, I'll take uh, Quillback first. Um, yeah, the previous assessment uh, being a DBSRA assessment, there were um, that would be uh, assessed uh, coastwide and then broken at uh, 40 degrees, 10 minutes north latitude off Cape Mendocino uh, to fit the um, minor nearshore rockfish uh, complex boundaries um, to which that stock is ascribed north and south. Um, and so that's how it was handled previously. Uh, it doesn't uh, really occur in any numbers, uh, very low abundance uh, to the south of point conception. Um, so the point conception potential break there doesn't really come into account for Quillback rockfish. Um, but uh, there is a matter of, um, you know, we there was the decision to analyze uh, assessments at the state boundaries. Um, usually that has been done as a result of our historical discussions of the uh, differences in, in exploitation history or regulations between areas that the states have presented concern about. It doesn't necessarily mean that there are differences um, in abundance per se, but um, you know, there's the potential and that's why we've stratified them such. Um, regarding uh, copper rockfish, uh, there was definitely discussion in the SSC statement as well as the ground fish subcommittee statement that there, um, that the uh, evidence of population structure in copper rockfish was relatively weak um, and that uh, an alternative uh, statewide uh, assessment is something to be contemplated. Um, and uh, as I said previously, usually in the time and kind of intensity of an assessment that's a full assessment that is often pursued, such as has been the case, I believe, for blue rockfish and other stocks, um, near shore stocks, uh, where um, there was an examination of both the north and south as well as statewide. And I believe that one ended up going to statewide. Um, so uh, in a broader kind of uh, analytical um, Attempt, uh, I believe. Um, I believe a, a statewide uh, assessment for this stock would be worth considering. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, John. Um, I do have another question, but I uh, want to allow other folks that are interested in the topic of stock differentiation to get in the queue. So um, I'll just note that I have a, a question on a different topic. All right, well, I'm gonna, uh, Kelly and Corey, and then I'll come back to you, Marcy, okay? Yep, thank you. All right, Kelly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. A follow-up question for you, John. Were the area modifications considered for copper and quillback discussed during the pre-assessment workshop? And then was that taken into account when deciding the type of review that these data moderate assessments should go through? Or was the 
process for review set before the area modifications were known. Thank you, Ms. Ames. Uh, I will attempt to answer that as thoroughly as I can. Um, the uh, pre-assessment review did discuss the stratifications um, that were proposed. Um, I cannot recall if there was feedback indicative of the need to evaluate a statewide kind of assessment. Um, and the SSC itself in further considerations did indicate that examination of something statewide would be worthwhile. Um, and so that did provide some indication as to um, the potential benefit um, of doing so uh, to get a better feel for the statewide abundance. I don't know, if, did you have additional aspects of your question that I didn't answer sufficiently? That's good, thank you, John. All right, uh, Corey and then Marcy. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and, and hello, John. Um, yeah, I um, haven't followed these, these assessments as closely as in the past, but um, and I'm, I, when I'm hearing you answer some of these questions about stock definition, it, it, I'm, I just, my impression over the years is that the answer is never clear cut on what, what a stock boundary should be for the purposes of, of assessments. Um, it seems to me, and I'm not an expert in the literature and even having it heard many times, it still doesn't sink in, but it, it seems that there's trade-offs between, if, if, uh, between dividing too finely or lumping too much. And so it seems with our, with our evidence that we have, um, you know, that it, we've had to push in recent years or even four cycles maybe now of especially for near shocks, near shore, near shore stocks moving to more to smaller areas and matching up with state boundaries, even though that might not be ideal biologically, it's, it's, it's close enough in many cases. And of course, we also ignore Mexico and Canada, uh, unfortunately, given the realities of international boundaries. But just looking for a response here, John, I think, I think, I don't think, I think the Magnuson Act has flexibility where, where the stock doesn't Definition doesn't have to be based on genetics. Genetics is a long-term, you know, evolutionary time question where, where fish, you know, a few movements here or there are enough to, to make some of these stocks look closely genetically related where in ecological time, decades, years, uh, you know, a, a population of, of quillback off of Northern Washington is probably not too closely connected to Southern California so am I just looking for reaction here? I mean, it's, these boundaries are never clear cut. The evidence, like money, this stuff is, is not black and white. And it seems the assessment community is, you know, one area of investigation has been what, what, what are the pros and cons of, you know, erring on one side or the other? Uh, am I off here on my understanding? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Niles. I, I think you, you hit upon an impo important point here. Uh, regarding the amount of data in any one area, um, when you start to stratify, um, you end up cutting your data in half in terms of what you have on either side of the line or some other proportion given where the line is relative to the distribution of the biomass as a whole. So, um, you know, that being the case, you can render some of your assessment areas relatively data poor -er than they already are. Um, and for these stocks, given that we're using a relatively limited suite of data, um, that becomes somewhat of a consideration. Um, you know, the, this, uh, um, the data, especially in the early part of the time series, was relatively limited because MRFs and SERFs did relatively limited sampling. And so that's a consideration, as is, uh, as are the, the stratifications we impose at a state level um, as well. Um, you know, there's something to be said for um, when the data is very limited, um, you know, larger areas to incorporate more data to reduce the uncertainty from low sample size can be beneficial. Okay, Corey. Yeah, thanks, but I, but but it it really depends on the situation, you know. And there's still not a perfect. There's no 
recipe for making the perfect delineation and it might be reasonable to do in some situations to do it one way or the other and, and never ideal but in situations you're describing it would tend to uh, lean towards pooling the data rather than splitting i hear that but it, these things never seem easy and i don't hear you disagreeing with that Thank you, Mr. Nas. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you were to have a perfect world where you had as much data as you'd ever want, perhaps there would be some benefit from looking at, you know, uh, kind of regional aspects of things. But with the limited data that we do have, especially with these limited scope data moderate assessments, there that is a consideration that comes to mind, even more so than when you have all of the potential data sources uh, brought to bear in a full assessment. Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, John. Um, just want to talk for a minute about the hook and line survey. Uh, the SSC identifies that the fit to the hook and line survey and the Southern California copper assessment was poor, um, but uh, and also that it possibly indicates model misspecification. Um, I'm hoping you can tell me what exactly that means. And then secondly, um, there is a statement about the hook and line survey in the square spot section of the report, which says the assessment model did not fit the hook and line survey index and associated length compositions. So um, I'm hoping you can uh, clarify the use of this index uh, in the Copper South assessment. I'm also hoping you can tell us a little bit more about the actual survey and the stations that it uh, intercepts both Copper and Square Spot as I had some understanding that the survey was primarily aimed at uh, shelf areas uh, and not nearshore. Um, copper is a nearshore stock and square spot is a shelf stock. So I'm hoping you can tell us about the application of this index uh, in both of these assessments. Thank you. Okay, all right. Thank you, Mr. Remco. Um, the, uh, I think the SSC had, as you noted, had a, a fair bit of discussion regarding the lack of fit in both cases to the uh, Northwest Fishery Science Center hook and line survey, also known as the HARMS survey, since um, John HARMS has, has put a lot of work and time and effort into developing this survey to get a better um, spatial representation of uh, the uh, composition, uh, link composition um, uh, in the Southern California bite, as well as um, this data is useful for uh, an index of abundance as well. But unfortunately, that, uh, you know, that's um, not being fit terribly well by the model um, as a result of the uh, much larger time, longer time series, as well as the contribution of, of, of uh, link composition from the fisheries themselves. Uh, the problem being that the fisheries represent areas that are open to fishing, whereas the uh, hook and line survey is more representative of the region as a whole, given that it's a spatially balanced survey. So um, the uh, recreational fisheries surveys are robust and well-developed for their purpose, which is estimating mortality in our fisheries, uh, not for scientific purposes for stock assessments per se. This is somewhat of an ad hoc use. Um, so it's not the ideal survey. Um, you did note, um, which is correct, that the uh, survey does uh, focus on, on uh, a little bit deeper water. It was initially designed to be more of a shelf survey. And um, that being the case, it, it may sample a little bit deeper as well. Um, and that being the case, um, it represents um, the uh, copper rockfish less well than perhaps the square spot, although they both, um, as shelf rockfish go, square spot are not terribly deep distributed species. You know, that's probably, uh, you know, 
uh, 100 fathoms is where they pretty much max out versus um, about, you know, 60 fathoms uh, for the primary depth distribution of copper rockfish. Um, so that said, you know, they, um, they each, the survey may sample each of these um, a little bit differently, but in the context of the assessment itself, when the model is weighing these different data sources, it was very difficult to get the model to fit to the hook and line survey in part because of um, the, the disparate trends that it showed compared to um, the uh, fisheries data and that disparity um, made it difficult to fit. Um, but uh, the reason we think that might be the case is, as I said, that uh, one is more spatially balanced and sampling in a little deeper water, and the other is uh, focused on uh, what the fishery provides for data. Uh, did, were there other aspects of your question that I didn't answer, or is that sufficient? If I may, Mr. Chair. Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just looking for an explicit statement describing why. Um, I believe the um, decision was not to fit the hook and line survey index in square spot. Do I have that correct? I do not believe, sorry, Mr. Remco, that I don't believe that to be the case. I believe it was still included in the assessment. Okay. But it just wasn't fit very well. Um, and as noted in the SSC report, um, you know, this lack of fit was indicated to potentially be representative of um, model misspecification as a potential cause. As, as I noted, there's some potential logistical reasons why those may not represent the same grounds. Um, uh, but also there's just the matter of the model itself, um, you know, reconciling that input as well as other aspects of those data sources individually um, that, that may have led to some of that lack of fit and potential misspecification, which is, was a cause for concern for the SSC. Thank you. Further questions of the SSC report? Maggie Summer. Thanks, Chair Veronik. I have one on sablefish. Uh, the SSC report noted that um, the results of this estimate indicated that it's always been above the 40% uh, target, while the 2019 assessment indicated it was in the precautionary zone from 2011 through 2019. Um, and I guess I'm just look. Are we to assume that the current estimate is is better? And if so, why is uh, is really my question. So if the SSC had any more discussion that you can offer some insight to us there, that would be helpful. Thanks. Hmm. Thank you, Miss Summer. This is this is one I think is best answered by. Uh, Owen Hamel of the Northwest Fisheries Science Center, given his greater familiarity with the intricacies of the model, given that it's his staff that have conducted the assessment. Sure. Uh, thanks, John. Thanks, council members. Uh, so there are a number of differences between um, the uh, uh, abundance-based or index-based uh, assessments and these, um, and oh, yeah, is, I'm, I'm not sorry. I was distracted a bit. No, it's you okay. The question. Yeah. You want me to answer, John? If if you if you will, Andre. It's Andre Punt of University of Washington, director of the SAFS program. Yep. Um, so this is a. Uh, while it's sort of disconcerting that the estimate has changed like this, uh, this is sort of to be expected given the level of uncertainty we have in these assessments. Uh, the update obviously has more data, um, not a huge amount of more data, uh, but enough data that it can shift the biomass trajectory uh, by a, 
uh, what in this case is is a sort of qualitatively uh, substantial amount, but it could have been an equal amount uh, at a higher or lower biomass. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons we have those sigma parameters which attempt to quantify the amount by which we would expect uh, assessments to, to vary from one assessment to another. Uh, this amount of, uns uh, of change is actually well within uh, what we've seen for other stocks when we've uh, added more data or, or changed the assumptions of the model. So although it, it is a difference, uh, there, is, there is more data. Um, our perception is that more data is, is, is better, uh, and generally that would be the case. Uh, but um, it should not be expected that when we do the next assessment that uh, a change of the same magnitude could in, could in fact occur, um, just simply because of adding more information um, uh, and given that these models uh, are, are obviously approximations of reality. Thank you very much. Corey? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And um, yeah, I don't know if Andre or Owen or John would be the answer, but I'm kind of, I, I was able to attend part of the ground fish subcommittee uh, meeting. I asked a question similar to Maggie's. And I think what a, a few folks pointed out was, um, don't forget that 2020 was a pandemic and we had no survey. And, and this is one, one of the stocks where the survey is is is, is very important for, but yeah. I don't know if if, if anyone had um, thoughts there on on what are the consequences of, of missing that survey year. And I thought I heard, you know, maybe this 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 change for sable fish that was one factor that might be um, looked at as as a as a reason for that big change. And that we've been worrying forever that the stock has been in the precautionary zone. Now this one says it's never been there. Yeah, so again, what, any, any thoughts on that effect of that in the 2020 survey? Uh, thanks, Corey. This is, this is Owen. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, while that's true, the, you know, if you look at the uncertainty envelope, you know, both the previous one, the previous one, it was possible, as Andre said, it could have been never overfished or never, sorry, never below the target, never in the precautionary zone. And the current model, while it says it was above it, it could have been in the precautionary zone, right? So there's that uncertainty. Um, and certainly not having the 2020 survey, you know, which is, um, you know, very important for informing the trajectory of the stock, did affect uh, the uncertainty at the end. Um, and also, um, you know, if we had had that information, that might have provided uh, more information on recruitment and what was going on there with um, the discarding. Um, and so the change we had to make uh, would maybe partly influenced by the fact that we didn't have the 2020 survey. Uh, Marcy? Mr. Chair, uh, I have one more if I may on copper rockfish. Um, just a question about, um, the very last bullet point on page seven under general comments on data moderate assessment. Uh, the statement is the SSC should review how best to assess nearshore species, particularly with large recreational fisheries that have strong spatial management and a pattern of pattern of higher effort near shore. Um, yet uh, the SSC concluded that the base models for copper represent the best assessments available. And I guess I I'm looking for um, a little more explanation. Um, in light of the 2013 index-based method used for copper and uh, how the SSC concluded that the base model represents the best assessment available when, as I understand it, um, you have yet to really evaluate what the best method is of assessing 
um, nearshore rockfish and whether or not the index based method might in fact be better than the new length based assessment method. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uremko. I'll, I'll take part of this um, question. And then uh, if we have John Field of the Southwest Fishery Science Center on the phone, I'll let him take the second part. But um, the first part of this regarding um, the statement in the last bullet versus the acceptance of the assessments, um, you know, it has recently, it recently came to light for the SSC, the the magnitude of the area that is closed to fishing in California um, and likely elsewhere, um, given that we now have uh, seafloor mapping data for California that allows us to evaluate the proportion of the area that's closed to fishing um, and, and in various closures versus open to fishing. And that kind of provided a little bit, I think, of a revelation as to the potential or the magnitude of the area that we're talking about here. It's always been in somewhat vague terms, but given that now we have more of an explicit accounting for that, that uh, magnitude of the habitat for these species near shore in particular, um, that have you know, been in marine protected areas, et cetera, um, in, in the last couple decades, that now uh, presents a, a conundrum as to how you uh, create a two area model to account for that, perhaps by having composition data that's representative of the closed areas. And then you have data that's representative of the open areas. And then you're able to do some estimates. Also helping to inform that potentially is ROV data that the California Department of Fish and Wildlife has been collecting. Um, that provides information on uh, the um, composition of the stock inside and out, as well as potentially providing absolute estimates of abundance to better guide with a proportion of the biomass at various points in time when the survey has been conducted that are um, inside and outside. Um, that's a newly acquired capability and those methods have been reviewed and approved for use and management by the SSC. Um, we're we, we have survey data from 2013 to 15. We're, we've got data from 2019 to 2021 coming in. And now we're starting to get a time series as well for a potential index. So this is, this is um, important data as well as the California Collaborative um, Fisheries Research Program, which uh, does sampling along the coast now coastwide the last few years collecting data inside and outside of MPAs. So these new data sources are opening doors to evaluation of alternative model uh, st structures and frameworks um, that we just didn't have previously. Um, and so that being the case, um, there's the want to further explore those while recognizing that um, you know, as, as little as a couple of years from now, we'll have the ability to do that, but it just wasn't within the confines of the terms of reference. Within the confines of the terms of reference, I think the SSC perceived this, um, these models as being, as meeting the terms of reference and providing results that they felt were sufficient to use in management. That's not to say that there aren't large advancements that could be made given some of the new data that's coming available. Um, but as it is, given the other uh, priorities this year, we couldn't do a full and thus we couldn't incorporate that ROV data, et cetera. So that presented a limitation relative to your second question, which I believe was uh, regarding the comparison of the index based uh, assessment conducted in 2013 for copper rockfish south and its results of a depletion level of uh, you know, 76, it's, it's currently, it's, it was estimated to be at 76% of its historical spawning stock biomass um, back in 2013. Now we look at the new results from this link-based assessment and we see a very contradictory result of 18%. Um, this is something that I, I think, you know, definitely raise some attention in the SSC and a little bit of cognitive dissonance as to which of these you should put more weight on. Um, uh, you know, some of the reviews that were done on those index-based methods indicated that they weren't very good at predicting, um, you know, the, the stock status. We still have outstanding analyses on these new methods. 
to evaluate um, you know, their ability to um, estimate stock status as well. They do provide estimates by the nature of their uh, the framework and, and the data that goes in and what comes out does provide a, an estimate of uh, stock status, but neither are utilizing all of the data. So, I mean, you know, you don't have the bar for comparison, which is a full assessment for either. Um, so it's difficult to say which one is really more representative of reality. And this is the somewhat of the litmus test that's been used in the panel reviews for um, these methods is evaluation relative to a stripped down model, a uh, full stock assessment that's been stripped down. Um, and those that has borne out that with the length based methods, there is um, a propensity to uh, have a biased low estimate of status relative to the full stock assessments that were stripped down. Um, you know, this is slightly disconcerting. I don't know that it accounts for the full magnitude of the differences between the index based methods and the length based methods. For that, I would turn to uh, John Field, Dr. John Field of Southwest Fishery Science Center, if he's available. Uh, John Field is not available, but Andre Clint is available to answer um, those questions. Okay, great. I, he's a Dr. Punt is a, a, a great asset, and uh, I will turn to him for a response. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, this is, uh, I, I think, first, the word best needs to be written in the context of both the SSC statement and the previous review. Um, th this is at a research level. Um, John referred to two area models, but in fact, the software to do that uh, would not capture the, the kind of situation we've got in, in California where the amount of area enclosure has changed over time. Um, so that the, the, the type of approach that John referred to uh, would have to be developed. So it was not a method that, the, you know, you, you, we should all criticize the stat team for not applying it because it hasn't yet been really developed. Uh, Multi-area models do exist, uh, but not where you've got changes in areas closed over time, uh, at least not within the platforms that we've approved. So the, the best here is, is really asking the research question about how we deal with these nearshore fishes. Um, this has been a, a long-term problem, uh, not just in, in for data moderates, but also for, for full assessments. Um, and, and I think that was the context of this. Obviously, as John says, the... Um, uh, additional uh, complexities of, of, of how much area is in closure, closure highlights the importance of this as a, as a, research, a research topic. Um, in terms of uh, uh, comparing index-based methods and length-based methods, that needs to be done quite carefully, uh, in particular because the last assessment, the index-based assessment used a different index than the one that went into these assessments and also because of the underlying population model that the index-based method was based on. It, was, it, was, it didn't take into account age structure and sex structure, for example. Um, and that, that was um, you know, the best available at the time, but it should be recognized that it, it, there's a certain amount of apples and oranges here. Um, in addition, uh, the index that was used in the 2013 assessments were fishery-dependent indices, um, and as... Um, John and the, and, and the CDFW comments make uh, the, the point pretty clearly that the area fished is changing. So um, that would affect both the index-based methods and these length-based length, length -based methods. So um, I, I think it's very premature to draw any uh, uh, clear distinctions between um, what's driving this and, and what would have happened if we had been able to assess it using uh, a totally different methods. That said, uh, the preliminary analyses that put in the in the fishery dependent index data were more optimistic, um, although subject to the same concerns about area open and closed. And, and then finally, uh, a point that was made in discussion it didn't appear end up in the statement is that uh, when we compared China rockfish assessments between index based and full assessments, there were some pretty dramatic differences there too. So. Um, I think it's fair to say that all of these data moderate assessments, uh, by their very nature, um, are, are going to be more uncertain than uh, full assessments, uh, which we hope, of course, are, are, are less in error. I would also like to comment on the uh, negative bias. Um, unfortunately, we didn't include any figures or, or the like 
in our discussions on, on that. Uh, there is negative bias, um, which means that um, on average, uh, the assessment is below the true value. It doesn't mean in any one case it will be. Um, and the extent of bias, um, you know, for all for, for all intents and purposes, wouldn't explain the difference we're seeing uh, between the index-based and the and the length-based methods based on the the work that was done at the um, the data moderate um, review where we looked at um, I can't remember it was about eight to ten stocks where comparisons were made. It was definitely negatively biased, uh, but one needs to look at the the magnitude and 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 what's what what's being compared. So I hope that helps. Um. This is this is Owen. If I can just put in a word about that last point, uh, so there were it was ten um, species and seven were found to be um, negatively biased, which you know seven out of ten, at least from a binomial perspective, isn't really significant. So while there seemed to be some indication of some negative bias, it wasn't. It certainly wasn't overwhelming. And I'll just add to that, John Budrick, um, just to say the degree to which that wasn't completely overwhelming is the part of the reason why these pass muster for use in, in management. So um, had they been so extremely biased, perhaps our conclusion would have been different, such as was the case with the index-based uh, review, which led to some discussions as to how to use those. All right, uh, Marcy and then Corey. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I think I am still looking for uh, the answer as to how the SSC concluded that the base models for copper represent the best assessments available when the SSC has yet to evaluate whether the length-based method or the index-based methods are more um, uh, robust for evaluating nearshore stocks. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uremko. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult question. Um, and uh, I don't know that um, the results that we have and the comparability of those bear out, which would be, um, you know, more representative. One is more recent um, than the other by a few years. There still are a couple of years of projections left uh, from that 2013 assessment that we could have run on, but we decided we wanted to uh, a, as a council, the decision was made to pursue uh, analysis of these stocks with the length-based methods in order to uh, evaluate some of the concerns mentioned in the SSC report and the uh, CDFW report as well regarding uh, PSA scores and um, the recent catch overages. So um, I think we wanted a, a, an updated perspective on this um, and the perspective we, we got was contradictory to the perspective we had. Um, and I, I understand that creates some cognitive dissonance, but um, as to which is best or more representative, I think it's a difficult question. And I don't know that uh, perhaps Andre uh, might want a, a second crack at the answer. Well, yeah, I mean, we, we, we have certainly not done that comparison. Um, that would certainly be a research topic. Um, the, uh, the sort of axiom of stock assessments is the more data you have, the more likely you are to, to get an unbiased and, and accurate estimate. Um, I, I think we should be aware that for at least the Southern California cases, um, the there was an attempt to use the available indices, at least some of the available indices. Um, so, um, you know, one would expect the more index data you bring in, the better. But as as is clear from our reports, we didn't bring in the recreational indices, um, and that you know that could change it. Um, although, in the case of recreational fisheries, recreational indices may themselves be biased. So, um, I, I don't think there is a clear answer right now. And uh, at a generic level, 
Um, I, I think we would have to do quite considerable research to, to, to really come up with a definitive answer. Um, and, and that's true of almost every assessment uh, situation. You, you have to look at what's available and, and select the method. Um, usually, um, we, 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 we tailor the method to the data, which uh, to some extent has been done here. Corey? Thanks, Mr. Chair. And I did not know Andre or Owen were, were there in the wings as well. Um, and I know what time is, is getting late here, but it seems like a topic of we'll be getting into this cycle is you know the right area, the right the way, how to define a management unit in terms of, of areas and stock structure. And so I was wanted to see if I know Andre, you could teach a whole course on this. And I know you've done a lot of papers on the trade-offs of, of spatial assessments. But um, if you have a, if you were interested in having a, you know, a, a brief response on, you know, what are the trade-offs, for example, of, of assessing a nearshore rock fish like quillback on a coast-wide basis from Southern California to Northern California versus chopping up more finely? I can try. Um, th there has been a fair amount of research on, on this topic of what to do when there is uncertainty about um, stock structure. And, and it's fair to say that, as is the case for these stocks, that's pretty common. Um, genetics is a great tool, but it's actually a fairly weak tool. You usually, um, uh, the, the, it's often the case that you can have different populations that are demographic, demographically different, but not genetically different, simply because of uh, dispersal. Um, and uh, that's sort of well known in, in the field. So uh, genetics is 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 helpful, uh, but um, often you know, in 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 the cases I've looked at, often often will be the will not detect stock structure when it's there. Um, that said, um, the trade-off that you're dealing with when you pool spatially versus assess uh, locally are, is as identified by John, which is. Uh, as you chop up the area, you get fewer and fewer data uh, locally. Um, and obviously, as you pool, uh, you, you increase the data set. Um, that leads to the perception uh, that an aggregated assessment is more precise. Uh, it has narrower confidence intervals. Uh, but we also know that it's biased. Um, so um, if you have two areas that have different trends, um, in simple terms, one area is going up, the other area is going down, and you pull those data, you end up with uh, an assessment that actually uh, it represents neither area. So um, uh, one, the, the sort of general trend in the literature is to move towards spatial assessments, uh, recognizing that that does increase precision, uh, decrease precision. Um, one of the dangers of aggregated assessments that's fairly well known now is if you've got an area that's poorly sampled, uh, you're essentially assuming that the trend in that area is whatever the trend in the other areas is. Um, and of course, you know, that's subject to uncertainty. Um, so it's, it, it's certainly true that there is um, a fair amount of uncertainty about the best approach, but the trend is, is certainly, as is the case in, in this council, to look at um, moving to sort of finer spatial resolution simply to detect uh, local local trends, which can be masked uh, when, you, when you aggregate data spatially. And I can give you many examples of where it goes wrong. Northern cod probably being the, the sort of poster child of be careful of aggregating data spatially. Thank you, Andre. That was, that was very helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Corey, John, and Andre. Um, further questions on the SSC report? Okay, well, I'm going to ask my question now, um, John. Um, there were some cautions in the SSC report about, you know, where data didn't fit or were, were somewhat contradictory. And we have the CDFW report two, which points out for some stocks that the growth and or stability of harvests is sort of contraindicates um, a serious drop in in abundance. So I guess my question to you is, 
um, let me make, let me phrase this well. Um, uh, qualifications and the terms of reference aside, how confident are you that the depletion levels in these stock assessments are reliable and accurate? Hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair Gorelnik. Um, the CDFW report did reference some concerns regarding uh, patterns and trends in harvests uh, relative to other stocks, as well as um, some concerns about the degree of representativeness of the assessments regarding um, open areas versus closed areas. And I think, uh, you know, some of the considerations relative to the open versus closed question um, still linger um, and, uh, you know, are, are definitely uh, things that we have on the horizon for future advances. But, um, you know, given, given the nature of those and the competing results or, or kind of contradictory results that we see between assessments as well as, um, you know, between data sources in terms of the, the harm survey, the hook and line survey and some of the California versus the recreational data, it, it does point to conflicts um, that that uh, were noted as uncertainties in, in the SSC report. Um, uh, relative to the nature of these assessments, TOR was abided by and the results um, you know, were informed by an analytical framework that has in management. Uh, the, I believe the perception of the SSC was that these um, passed that bar. Um, the question of whether they are definitive, I, I think is reflected in the admission that there is additional data left on the table uh, that could be examined both within the context of a length-based assessment as well as a full assessment that might provide a more definitive answer. And, um, you know, the terms of reference for these assessments does identify the potential for having either a longer review uh, to allow um, more time for evaluation of uncertainties beyond a couple of hours that we had with the ground for subcommittee. And then again, uh, in aggregate, uh, a couple of hours for the link based assessments um, as they were. Um, given all of the other uh, considerations and stocks, et cetera, these California stocks, um, you know, received as much time as we had available under the circumstances. But more uh, more to the point, there's also a matter of the terms of reference pointing to uh, a potential process that we could adhere to in the future, which might resolve some of our concerns about the uh, time for review, which is to have a check-in um, via webinar for a couple of hours to review these stock assessments and then have a uh, actual review, um, final review by the ground fish subcommittee. In this instance, we kind of um, ended up doing the former uh, by default because of COVID-19, et cetera, meeting um, apart as, you know, um, the, being the case. Um, that, that being, um, you know, somewhat of a, a limitation that we kind of were uh, doing what the tour had potentially recommended and doing a check-in of sorts. But, um, you know, that that would just allow for more uh, kind of uh, scrutiny of the methods, et cetera. And so um, that two meeting kind of process, uh, process in addition to having a, a pre-assessment workshop, having a check-in on the results and then having further analysis might be something to consider for the future. Um, to allow for, you know, more analysis and examination of uncertainties, uh, given the limitations in review without star panels or CIA reviewers, et cetera. Um, you know, these are things that could be done to provide opportunities for further review. Uh, 